Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a fantastic parable about the dehumanization of human beings. In the negative utopia described in my story, man has been subordinated to his own inventions. Science, technology, social organization, these things have ceased to serve man. They have become his masters. A quarter of a century has passed since the book was published. In that time, our world has taken so many steps in the wrong direction that if I were writing today, I would date my story not 600 years in the future, but at the most 200. The price of liberty and even of common humanity is eternal vigilance. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations, present the premier broadcast of the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, part one of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels, Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. We are proud to have Mr. Huxley as narrator for these broadcasts. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley, and these are the sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitute. The year is AF 632, 632 years after Ford. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and this is the fertilising room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. And here comes the director of hatcheries and conditioning in person, bringing with him a group Tomorrow, of young students. Tomorrow you will be settling down to serious work. Today I just want to give you a general idea of things. Uh, these are the incubators, and here is the weak supply of ova, kept at blood heat. Uh, come along, boys. Now here, we immerse the eggs into a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa. Immersion continues until the eggs are all fertilised. Ah, and over here, here is where we bottle the alphas and betas. In short, gentlemen, the perfect process for manufacturing healthy babies. Are there any questions? Uh, uh, sir, uh, will you explain the uh, Bakanovsky process? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, students, take this down. <laughs> Bakanovsky's process. Where in olden times, one egg made one embryo which made one baby. Today, we've improved on all that. Now the egg will bud, will divide, from eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo and every embryo into a mature baby, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. But uh, what advantage is it, sir? Uh, I mean... uh... Oh, my good boy, can't you see? Where in olden times nature allowed us only to have twins or perhaps triplets or so, today we can create scores, yes, scores of identical individuals. We can manufacture men and women in uniform batches. Think of it. An entire factory staffed with the product of one single egg. 96 identical individuals working 96 identical machines. At last, society really knows where it stands. Remember, it was our Ford who gave us the concept of the assembly line when he was on Earth many centuries ago. And now, boys... We will go up to the bottling room where we shall see how we create each class of society. Alphas, betas, deltas, etc. Come with me. Where, Danina? Oh, director. Oh, charming, charming. Ah, What are you injecting into our embryos today, my dear? Typhoid antitoxins? Yes, sir. 
Are you uh, busy this afternoon? Oh, not after five, sir. Good. Suppose we get together then on the roof. That would be fine. I've admired you for some time, then, Nina. I'm looking forward to a closer acquaintance. Thank you, sir. And now, boys, we're off to the bottling room. You are a lucky girl. The director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, hello, Fanny. Oh, you can trust the director to be the perfect gentleman. I saw him pat you. He wants me. You see? That shows what he stands for. The strictest conventionality. And it's about time you started belonging to someone else, my dear. But I like Henry Foster. We've only been with each other four months. Four months? Well, what would the district world controller say? You know how he disapproves anything intense or long-drawn. And it isn't as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about being with one or two other men besides Henry. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. You're quite right, Fanny, as usual. Good girl. Uh, Fanny, do you know Bernard Marx? <gasps> Bernard Marx? Well, why not? Bernard's an alpha plus. Besides, he asked me to go to New Mexico, to the Savage Reservation with him. But his reputation. They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. Oh, they say, they say. And that he spends most of his time by himself alone. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle. Thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood substitute. That's why he's so stunted. Oh, what nonsense. Oh, very well, Lenina. It's your life, my dear. But I think you're heading for trouble. And here we have the bottling room. Little embryos carefully bottled being rocked gently to and fro as they did in olden days when carried by their mothers. <gasps> now, boys, you must learn to distinguish between smut and science. I am going to use that word again. As scientists of tomorrow, you must learn to cope with it. Mother. Oh. <coughs> there, that's better. As a matter of fact, there is an area in our world where humans are still viviparous, still give birth to their children. The Savage Reservation in New Mexico. I uh, visited there once myself many years ago. Dreadful, filthy place. Naturally, civilization has improved on all that. Ah, it is here we control the embryo's growth, each batch carefully regulated to produce the exact class of citizen we desire. And here is our Mr. Henry Foster in charge of bottling. Oh, Henry. Uh, yes, sir. Please explain the process to the students. Oh, delighted, sir. By the way, Henry, before you begin, I made a date with Lenina Crown this afternoon. Oh, really? I'm delighted, sir. I'm sure you'll enjoy belonging to her. Good. Very pneumatic girl. Now, please proceed. This way, gentlemen. Here, we advance the process. One by one, the eggs are transferred from their test tubes into these larger decanters and moved along to the labelers. Carefully labeled as to heredity, date of fertilization, sex, name, serial number. Gentlemen, there are 88 cubic feet of card index in this room. Now, here is where we actually predestine and condition. Nothing is so unstabilizing to society as unhappy people. We avoid all that by preconditioning our embryos. And now we are entering the heat conditioning room. Hot tunnels alternating with cool tunnels. Exposure to cold is accompanied by exposure to x-rays. By the time these babies are decanted, they have a perfect horror of cold. Thus, they are perfectly prepared to emigrate to the tropics to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. And that... That is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you have got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. Oh, ten to three, boys. Time to visit the nurseries. And so the director continued on his tour. Meanwhile, in his rooms high above the city, Bernard Marx nervously paced the floor. I'm taking Lenina Crown in New Mexico with me, Helmholtz, to the Savage Reservation. Well, it's about time. What do you mean by that? I'll be frank, Bernard. There's been a lot of talk about your behavior at the College of Emotional Engineering. Of course, I've been defending you. But I'm but... supposed to be grateful? 
Because you're a successful Feelys writer, because you're tall, well-built, have all the girls you want? Oh, Bernard. Now, you know how I feel. I want to write. I mean, seriously, not slogans of Feelys. I, I want to write something important. Uh -huh. now, lately, I've been cutting out my committees and my girls. The director called me in just the other day. Are you in trouble, too? There's a poem I wrote, too emotional, he said. Mm. He gave me the lecture about being an alpha plus, about remembering to behave even as a little infant. I know. I tried to explain to Lenina, but she doesn't understand, or won't understand. All those other men she belongs to, Henry Foster, Benito Hoover, they treat her like, like a side of beef. It's disgusting. It's socially proper. We share and we share alike, remember? But I want her for myself, alone. Bernard... You're my closest friend. Now, you listen to me. You can't win this way. Follow the rules. Play the game. Be happy. The nursery was on the fifth floor. The sign over the door said, Neo-Pavlovian Conditioning Room. It was a large, bare room, very bright and sunny. Half a dozen nurses, trousered and jacketed in the regulation white viscose linen uniform, were engaged in setting out bowls of roses in a long row across the floor. The nurses stiffened to attention as the director of hatcheries and conditioning came in, followed by his students. Set out the books. In silence, the nurses obeyed his command. Between the rose bowls, the books were duly set out. Now bring in the children. They hurried out of the room and returned in a moment, each pushing a kind of tall, dumb waiter, laden on all its four wire-netted shelves with eight-month-old babies, all exactly alike, a Bokanovsky group, and all, since their cast was Delta, dressed in khaki diapers. Put them down on the floor. Now turn them so they can see the flowers and books. Turned, the babies at once fell silent, then began to crawl towards those clusters of sleek colours, those shapes so gay and brilliant. From the ranks of the babies came little squeals of excitement, gurgles and twitterings of pleasure. The swiftest crawlers were already at their goal. Small hands reached out uncertainly, touched, grasped, unpetaling the roses, crumpling the illuminated pages of the books. Watch carefully, students. All right, nurses, pull the lever. <laughs> and now we proceed to rub in the lesson with a mild electric shock. That's enough. All right, take them away, nurses. Observe. Henceforth, books and flowers will be associated in their minds with loud, unpleasant noises and electric shock. And after 200 repetitions of the same or a similar lesson, will be wedded forever. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. But, sir... Since these are lower caste children anyway and will never read, why bother to condition them against flowers? Simple economics. If gammas, deltas, or even epsilons like flowers in nature, soon you'd see them wasting their time visiting the countryside. And of what economic use is that? A love of nature keeps no factories busy. <laughs> it was decided to abolish it, at least among the lower classes. Uh, any further questions? Uh, sir, uh, would you tell us about sleep teaching? I'm glad you asked that. The most ingenious development of all, sleep teaching, is given to all our children as they grow to maturity. A little voice murmurs slogans in their ear all the night long while they sleep. Of course, it's useless for teaching, but as a method for giving post-hypnotic suggestions, it is invaluable. It's what conditions our minds to love our future role in life. Now, boys, uh, tell me some of the lessons we've all learned through sleep teaching. A gram is better than a dam. A good example. We have learned to take a gram of soma whenever we feel out of sorts. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. 
It transports our minds into a beautiful sleep filled with wonderful images. It gives a, a soma holiday thus preventing unnecessary impulses such as anger, jealousy, envy, anxiety. Uh, next. Uh, ending is better than mending. Good. Yes, right. It's better to throw away something than to repair it. New clothing, new possessions keep our factories humming and make us happier. Next. I'm glad I'm not a gamma. Uh -huh. Ah, yes. We're all taught in our sleep to enjoy our own caste, whatever it may be. Gammas are taught to think I'm glad I'm not an Epsilon. Betas learn to be glad they're not Deltas or Gammas. And glad they're not Alphas, because we Alphas sometimes have to use our minds, and that's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good, very good indeed. Well, students, I think our tour is over for today. I'm sure most of you have dates with pneumatic young ladies. Some, of course, will be wanting to get in a game of obstacle golf. But, uh... Before we finish, I'd like to add a few footnotes to the things you've seen today. Today, we have a controlled society, a happy society. We have stability. Ah, there was a time when these things did not exist. Didn't people grow old and feeble in those days, sir? Indeed, they did. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, take to religion, spend their time reading, thinking, thinking. Oh. Now, such is progress... At 60, we have the taste and the powers of a 17-year-old. Why, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure. Not a moment to sit down and think. They're much too busy scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl. Fortunate boys, no pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy, to preserve you as far as possible from having emotions at all. Fords in his flivver, all's well with the world. Lords of his flipper, all's well with the world. And solemnly and devoutly they made the sign of the tea and hurried off to join their fellow citizens at play. In spite of Fanny's dire warnings, Danina Crown made a date that evening with the eccentric Mr. Marx, partly to show Fanny her courage and partly because she was curious. When they were safely in their helicopter and climbing above the city, she turned to him. Shall we play escalator squash or go to the Feelies? Escalator squash is a waste of time. But what else is time for? All right, then, let's go to the Feelies. You know, they're showing love on a bearskin rug, and everyone says it's terribly exciting. You can Lenina, actually Lenina, please, feel... couldn't we just go for a walk and be alone together? But, Bernard, we'll be alone all night. Well, I... I, I meant alone for talking. Talking? Well, what about? Oh, you're beginning to feel nasty, I can tell. Take a soma, Bernard. I'd rather be myself, myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. A gammon nine saves nine. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet. Bernard. Lenita, don't you ever want to be just you? Not enslaved by your own conditioning to be free? But I am free. I'm free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in your own way and not somebody else's? I simply don't understand you. Bernard, do you really like me? Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic. Eventually, Bernard took Lenina to the Westminster Abbey Cabaret, where Calvin Stopes and his 16 saxophonists were playing. Also featured was London's finest scent and colour organ and all the latest synthetic music. With the aid of four Soma tablets, Bernard managed to spend a successful evening with the girl, and the next morning he agreed to apply at once for a permit to visit the Savage Reservation. He was quite nervous as he stood before the large desk of the Director of Hatcheries and Conditioning. Ah, oh, going to take Lenina Crown, I see. Yes, sir. Very pneumatic. Uh, uh, yes, sir. New Mexico Reservation. How long ago was it? Let me see, 20, 25 years... Hmm. I must have been your age then. Uh, sir? I had the same idea as you. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With my girl of the moment. 
She was a beta minus, I think. Oh, yes. She had yellow hair and was especially pneumatic. Well, it was terrible. We rode about on horses and all that, and, and the last day of our stay, she got lost. Somewhere in those horrid mountains. Lost. We never did find her, poor girl. Must have fallen in some crevice. Yes, we searched for days, but no luck. Ugh. Miserable trip. Oh, you must have had a terrible shock. What? Oh, don't imagine there was anything unethical about it. Nothing emotional or long-drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. I'm sure it was, sir. What's that? Oh. Mr. Marks, I should like to take this opportunity of saying I'm not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behavior outside working hours. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behavior, but... That is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. And so, Mr. Marx, I give you fair warning. Uh, yes, sir. If ever I again hear of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, I shall ask for your transference to a sub-center, preferably to Iceland. Good morning. The journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas, but was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule. Lenina and Bernard slept that night at Santa Fe, and Lenina was very happy. Imagine 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel and obstacle and electromagnetic golf, too. Oh, Bernard, it's simply too lovely. Uh, there will be no scent organs, television, or even hot water once we get out on the reservation. I can stand it. You'll see. Only progress is lovely, isn't it? <laughs> They took a rocket ship into the interior, and from there they traveled on horseback. And all Bernard could think about was Iceland, and how cold and barren it would be. The director's warning had made him even quieter and more sullen than usual. And then, that evening, they reached their destination. Before them was the village of Malpais, situated on a mesa. Adobe hovels growing out of the stony ground, dust and squalor, and the smell of wood smoke. What an awful place. I don't like it. Who's that man coming toward us? He used to be our guide. I I'm frightened, Bernard. Quiet. We shouldn't have come. Oh, good morrow. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from outside, from the other place? My name is Bernard Marx. This is Lenina Crown. Hmm. My name is John. Come with me. He speaks English. That's strange. Probably trained as a guide. Where is he leading us? To that hut, I believe. Uh, there seems to be some sort of activity over there. Orgy! Orgy! Why, it's like our lower caste community sing. Only look, now they're beating themselves with whips. Oh, no, Bernard! It's got something to do with their religion. What a wonderful intensity of feeling it must generate. I often think one may have missed something in not having passions like that. Nonsense. Bernard, what's wrong with that man? Where? Oh, he's just old, that's all. Old? But, but we don't look like that when we're old. He's so wrinkled, so... Oh, it's horrible. That's because we age all at once. We stay 17 until we're 60 or so, and, and then... And then we die, and they burn our bodies and recover the phosphorus for the good of the world state, just as it should be. But this... <gasps> what is it? That... That woman! Oh, Bernard, no! Take me away! Take me away! She's only nursing her baby, Lenina. That's her child. She's the mother. Bernard, how can you be so vulgar? Oh, I think I'll be sick. Please, Bernard, anywhere. Anywhere. Is something wrong? I think we'd better take Lenina uh, inside. Over here. Follow me. My Soma. I'm out of Soma. Bernard! I'm sorry, Lenina. I didn't bring him. Oh. Here. Inside. This is my home. This is my home. You are welcome to remain here. John? John? Yes, Mother. Mother? These are people from the outside, Mother. They have come to see the reservation. From the other place? You're from the other place. Don't come near me. But don't you see, I'm from there, too. I'm civilized. I don't belong here. 
It's, it's all a terrible mistake. This is my mother, Linda. Uh, were you born here? No. No, I tell you, I was decanted like normal people. Oh, thank Ford, someone has come. At last, thank Ford. Bernard, Bernard, please keep her away. Could you tell us about yourself, please? Well, I came here 25 years ago with a man. His name was Thomas. We went riding together on, on horses. There was a terrible storm. I got lost, lost in this horrible place. It was the last day of our stay. He left me here, alone. Well, Anina. Yes? Uh, you will be interested to know that our director of hatcheries and conditioning is named Thomas, oh. and that he came here 25 no. years ago. Oh, no, no. And that... It can't be. But it is. Well, he told me so himself. <laughs> what a discovery. This boy, this boy is our director's son. Our director is a father. Oh, it's too horrible. <laughs> Mother, what is he saying? <laughs> Iceland. Iceland, indeed. Bernard, stop it. Well, we'll see who tells who where to go now. Uh, John. Yes, sir? How would you and your mother like to return to civilization? Do you mean it? Oh, please, do you? Listen, they're crazy here. I was a beta minus. I always worked in the fertilizing room. I was a good worker. But how can I tell them? They don't understand. They mend things. They don't know what a helicopter is or, or, or Soma. They have babies, like dogs. Oh, it's too revolting. Oh, thank Ford. If it hadn't been for my son, for John... What a comfort he has been to me. Your son. How can you? You were beta minus. I know, I know, but he's been a comfort to me just the same. If only I'd had Soma. Oh, do you mean it? Will you take us back to civilization? <laughs> of course. Uh, we'll leave tomorrow. <laughs> you and your son. Back to civilization. <laughs> And Bernard was as good as his word. That very night, he and John and his mother and Lenina took the Blue Pacific rocket to London. For Lenina, it was a happy trip since she had taken four somers the minute they got back to the hotel. For John, it was a voyage of discovery. Poor Linda, his mother, could only weep for joy. But for Bernard, it was a moment of triumph. Triumph such as he had never known before. Brave New World, Part One, by Aldous Huxley. A startling, shocking account of what can happen to our civilization 600 years in the future. And more importantly, a warning to all of us against the destruction of moral standards, family life, and the soul of man. Join us next week when we will continue with part two of Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future of what could become the brave new world. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. <laughs> The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Byron Kane, Sam Edwards, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorene Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. This is the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, 
Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a study of the future as it may be unless we are extremely careful. It depicts a society in which man has replaced nature by science, morality by drugs, individuality by total conformity. It is a hideous prospect, yet we seem determined to follow this path of self-destruction. But Brave New World need not be our future. The choice, after all, is always in our own hands. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, part two of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels, Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. And we are proud to once again have Mr. Huxley as our narrator. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley. In the garden outside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns or playing games or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. And strolling across the smooth turf came the director of hatcheries and conditioning, followed eagerly by a group of new students. And here we have playtime for our little tots. Notice the games, all carefully constructed to use as many mechanical devices as possible. In olden times, children used to play simple games using only a ball and a bat. <laughs> Madness. Nothing was added to increase consumption. Then came our Ford. He taught us the principle of mass production in the assembly line many centuries ago and changed all that. Good morning, Director. Sir, what an unexpected pleasure. Boys, this is the resident controller for Western Europe. This is his Ford ship, Mustafa Mond. Boys? Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I was just showing the students the children, sir. Lovely children. Busy as bees at their unrestricted play. Controller, if you have the time, I wonder if you might tell the students something about the bad old days. I might. Where are you taking them? To the Hatchery and Conditioning Center to see the manufacturing of the babies. Very well, I'll walk along with you. Ah. Yes, in the old days, children lived in a place called home. A rabbit hole with suffocating intimacies. Maniacally, the mother... Uh, please don't be shocked at that word. The mother brooded over her children. Her children. Our Ford, or our Freud, as for some inscrutable reason he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters, our Freud was the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. Unpleasant as they may seem, students... These are facts. People used to be viviparous, gave birth to their children. What were the consequences? A world dominated by mothers and fathers was a world full of every kind of perversion, from sadism to chastity. There were also husbands, wives, and lovers. Now everyone belongs to everyone else. Thank Ford for progress. Yes, thank, thank Ford. Ford. Actually, we still preserve a few outmoded ethics of pre-stable societies in our savage reservations. Did you ever visit a reservation, Director? Yes, I once went to look at the savages in New Mexico. Well, that must have been 25 years ago. Mother's, father's marriage. Oh, very repulsive. <laughs> yes. Well, here we are. I'll say goodbye. Goodbye, controller, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, boys, if you'll follow me inside the hatchery. And here we are, a hive of activity. Alpha's superintending, Beta's doing the skilled work, Gamma's in green, busy at routine jobs, and Delta's in khaki, incapable of doing anything except sweeping the floor. Every member of society perfectly content to belong to his predestined caste. Except for a few criminal exceptions, 
Uh, which reminds me, one of those criminal exceptions is meeting us here at 11. An alpha plus, no less, Mr. Bernard Marks. What has he done, sir? What has he done? He refuses to participate in mechanical sports. He is lax. He... Ah, oh, here he comes now. Good morning, Director. Mr. Marks. You and Lenina Crown returned from the Savage Reservation last night, I understand. Yes, sir. Uh, we visited some of the places you told me about last week, Director. In fact, uh, we science. met... Science! Your attention, please. Everyone step this way. If I have interrupted your labors, it is because a painful duty constrains me. This man who stands before you, this Alpha Plus, the highest level of society, has grossly betrayed the trust imposed in him by his heretical views on sports and Soma, by his scandalous refusal to be promiscuous, he has proved himself an enemy of society, a subverter, ladies and gentlemen, of all order and stability, a conspirator against civilization itself. For this reason, I am ordering his immediate transference to a sub-center of the lowest order. In Iceland, he will have small opportunity to lead others astray by his unfordly example. Bernard Marx, can you show any reason why I should not now execute the judgment passed upon you? Yes, I can. What did you say? You told me you visited the Savage Reservation 25 years ago, Director, with a young Beta Minus, I believe. Uh, you told me she was lost during a storm and that you returned without her. I thought perhaps you'd like to see her again. Linda... Thomas! Thomas! Oh, Thomas, it's me. Don't you remember? You're Linda. Oh, I knew I'd recognize you, Thomas. You look just the same. No one ages here. Thomas, look at me. I'm Linda. Remember? Hug me. Hold me. What is the meaning of this? Who is this hag? Thomas. Oh, Thomas, it's Linda. Linda, you're beta minus. John, look, it's him. It's your father. 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 Oh. What's the meaning of this disgusting joke? Who is this savage and this dreadful woman? Take them away! It isn't a joke. It's absolutely true. I'm his mother and you're the father. Father, it's me, John. I'm your son. <laughs> and now, now who is guilty of antisocial behavior, director? Oh, no. Okay. no, 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 no! A father as director of hatcheries. It was out of the question. The controller asked for his resignation. And all upper caste London was wild to see the savage and his mother. Bernard Marx became a hero. And even Lenina Crown had her share of reflected glory. Good morning, Lenina. Oh, good morning, Fanny. Well, you certainly seem pleased with yourself. Yes, I am pleased. Bernard called up half an hour ago. He has to go to a party at the controllers, and he asked me if I'd take the savage to the feelies this evening. Oh, lucky girl. What's he like, Lenina? I've heard he's terribly good-looking. Oh, he is, but so very odd. Well, in what way? Well, the day Bernard and I left the reservation, the savage came into my room. I'd taken a soma, so I didn't notice him until suddenly I awakened, and there he was bending over me. What happened? Well, naturally, I assumed something was going to happen, but instead of that, he just ran out of the room. Well, how odd. What a terribly ungentlemanly thing to do. Doesn't he like you? Oh, I'm sure he does, so I can't make it out. And oh, please don't tell this to anyone, Fanny. It upsets me, because I like him. I mean, I really like him. <gasps> Lenina! I know it's immoral, but I just can't help myself. I do like him. The days passed. Success went fizzily to Bernard's head. His diffidence turned to bumptiousness. His nonconformity was forgotten and he became completely orthodox. The resident world controller appointed him official escort for the savage and asked him to make regular reports on the young man's reactions to civilization. This Bernard did assiduously. <laughs> Today I sent the savage to the Feelies with Lenina Crown. 
the feature was three weeks in a helicopter. Instead of holding the knobs on the chair arms, thus enabling him to experience the sensations of the lovers on the screen, the savage refused to participate. Lenina tells me he called the film vulgar and indecent. The savage refuses to take Soma and seems most distressed because the woman, Linda, his uh, M-O-T-H-E-R, uh, remains permanently on Soma holiday. Uh, in spite of her senility and the extreme repulsiveness of her appearance, uh, the savage frequently goes to see her and appears much attached to her. <laughs> Do you mean you refuse to come down to dinner? Bernard, I'm sick. I've eaten civilization and I'm sick. Do you realize that I've invited the most important people in London tonight? The Ford Chief Justice is here. The arch community songster of Canterbury has flown in just to meet you. You've changed, Bernard. You used to feel the way I do about things. I talked to Helmholtz Watson. He says you've changed too. I haven't. Listen, if you don't come downstairs for my dinner party, I'll be the laughing stock of London. I'll come. Just let me read this to you first. Hmm? One day, many years ago, I found this book in my mother's room. One of the Indians had found it in a cave. It must be hundreds of years old. Hmm. It's called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. Oh, I've heard of him. We don't allow it. Smut. But... He says all the things I feel about Lenina. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week. <laughs> marriage? Oh, Ford, no. Bernard. <laughs> oh, marriage, that's too good, really. Bernard, stop it. <laughs> and, and mother. Oh, sweet my mother. Oh, he's positively vulgar. You stop oh, wait it. Wait till I tell Helmholtz about this. Stop it or I'll hit you. <laughs> oh, come. Now, where's your sense of humor? Bernard. Can't you see how funny it is? Get out. I said leave me alone. No, I, I, I'm leaving, John. I'm leaving. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. The next morning, a pneumatic young girl, crisply clad in a beta minus viscose linen suit, stood outside the door of the savage's apartment and somewhat nervously rang the buzzer. Lenina. You don't seem very glad to see me, John. Not glad? Oh, if you only knew. May I come in, then? May I kiss your hand, Lenina? My hand? Admired, Lenina. Indeed, the top of admiration, worth what's dearest in the world. I wanted to do something first to show I was worthy of you. What? are you talking about? Lanina, tell me something. I'll do anything you tell me, anything at all. I'd sweep the floor if you wanted. But we've got vacuum cleaners here. It isn't necessary. No, of course it isn't necessary. But some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. I, I'd like to undergo something noble just to show you how much I love you, Lanina. <gasps> do you mean it, John? Yes, but I hadn't meant to say it. Not until I... Listen, Lenina, on the reservation, people get married. Get what? For always. They make a promise to live together for always. What a disgusting idea. Answer me this question, John. Do you really like me or don't you? I love you more than anything in the world. Well, then, why on earth didn't you say so? Come here to me, John. Hug me. Oh, but Lenina... Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Lenina, what are you doing? No, 
No, get away from me. Don't come near me. Hug me, honey. You, you strumpet. A grand is better than a day. Get out. But don't you want me? Get out of my sight. John. Before I kill you. He's mad. He's gone mad. Oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet that the sense aches at thee. Impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet. <coughs> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Savage. Who's ill? Linda. My mother dying. Yes, yes, I'll come at once. Welcome to the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying. You've come to see someone in the galloping senility ward? Yes. My mother. Oh, how vulgar. You know who I mean. Linda. Oh, oh, yes. Room 43, bed 16. She'll be dying any minute now. This way, please. Is there any hope? Well, of course not. Or else she wouldn't have been sent here. Through these doors. <laughs> What are these children doing here? Death conditioning, of course. It starts at 18 months. Every tot spends two mornings a week in a hospital for the dying. All the best toys are kept here, and they get chocolate ice cream on death days. They learn to take dying as a matter of course. This way. Oh, here we are. Well, I must go. I've got my batch of children coming. Time for their chocolate ice cream. Linda? Mm. Linda, it's John. Oh. Your eyes are open, but you don't know me, do you? It's John, your son. Linda? Linda, don't you know me? Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. <gasps> Linda. Linda. <sighs> Mother. <laughs> The menial staff of the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying consisted of 162 deltas, 84 red-headed female twins, and 78 identical mongoloid male twins. At six, when their working day was over, the two groups assembled in the vestibule of the hospital and were served their daily soma ration. It was into this crowd that the savage walked, so overcome with his grief and his remorse that he did not realize he was shouldering his way into the gathering throng. All right, here it is, Soma distribution. In good order, please. Oh, hurry up there, stand in line for your Soma. Linda. Linda died because of this. Oh, now don't grab, there's enough for everybody. One gram for an evening's delight, two for a trip to the gorgeous east, and four for a weekend in paradise. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Stop! Stop! Horde is a savage. Listen, I beg you, lend me your ears. Don't take that horrible stuff. It's poison. Mr. Savage, please, the people are waiting. You're slaves, all of you. Don't you want to be men? Don't you want freedom? Freedom? Ford Almighty, call the police. <laughs> From somewhere behind the milling, angry crowd, Bernard Marx saw the savage. He and his friend, Helmholtz Watson, had been searching for John. Now they hurried forward. Helmholtz, he's mad. They'll lynch him. Oh, Ford, help us. Ford, help those who help themselves, Bernard. Come on. Where are you going? Come back. It's a fight, a real fight. I've been waiting all my life for this. Man at last. I'll make you free whether you want to be or not. 
Give me those solar boxes. Sir, Mr. Savage, no! Stop it! Helmholtz! Join me! Yes! Stop. Throw the poison pills away! By all means, throw them away! Stop it! Freedom! Be men and be free! Over here, officers, this Freedom. way! Give them the Throw them away! Spray. Freedom! Stand up as men! Win your Soma. freedom! Soma spray! Win! John! You're done! Freedom. Take them to the Word. resident controller's office! All right. All right, it's all over. We're all happy now. We're so happy we all love each other, don't we? Oh, yes, we all love each other. Line up for your Soma. So you don't much like civilization, Mr. Savage. No, I don't. John, you're talking to the resident controller. We don't need your comments, Mr. Marks. I think civilization is horrible. And yet people are happy. They get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. They're well off. They're safe. They're never ill. They're not afraid of death. They're blissfully ignorant of passion and old age. They're plagued with no mother or father. They've got no wives or children to feel strongly about. They're so conditioned that they practically can't help behaving as they ought to behave. <laughs> and you ask them to chuck this all away for liberty? My good boy. All the same, it seems quite horrible to me. Of course it does. Actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensations for misery. And being contented has none of the glamour of a good fight against misfortune. Happiness is never grand. They call this happiness working at an embryo assembly line manufacturing babies? Science, my boy. Besides, they like it. Well, Mr. Marks, the time has come. You are being sent to an island. To, to an island? Oh, please, sir. Don't send me to Iceland. I, I promise... I I'll do what I should. I'll conform to the rules. One would think he was going to have his throat cut, whereas if he had the smallest sense, he'd understand his punishment is really a reward. He'll be sent to an island where he'll meet the most interesting set of men and women in the world, all the people who weren't satisfied with orthodoxy. Everyone, in a word, who's anyone. Then why didn't you go to an island yourself? Because, finally, I preferred this. Sometimes I regret it. Happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness. Well, gentlemen, there are many islands available. Which climate do you choose, Mr. Watson? Well, I should like a thoroughly bad climate. I think I'd write better if I had to contend with difficulties. How about the Falkland Islands? That would be fine. Good. You may leave now. You too, Mr. Marks. Oh. Uh, goodbye, Helmholtz. Goodbye, Bernard. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, John. One more question. Of course. Where is God in this scheme of yours? It's a subject that has always had a great interest for me. You've never read this, of course, the Holy Bible, New and Old Testaments. I've got quite a few revolting old books like that here. But if you know about God, why don't you tell the people? Well, this book is old. It's about God hundreds of years ago, not God now. But God doesn't change. Men do, though. No, my friend, call it the fault of civilization. God isn't compatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. But when you're alone, it's natural to believe in God. When you're quite alone in the night, thinking about death. But people are never alone now. We make them hate solitude, and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. No solitude, no God. Is that why there's no self-denial here, no God, no reason for it? Of course. Industry and prosperity are only possible when there is no self-denial. If there were, the wheels would stop turning. But God's the reason for everything noble and Fine and heroic. My dear young friend, civilization has absolutely no need for nobility or heroism. 
your condition so that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is, on the whole, so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. Anybody can be virtuous now. No temptations, no inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences. We don't. We prefer to do things comfortably. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have cancer. The right to have too little to eat. The right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow. The right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. I claim them all. You're welcome. Bernard and Helmholtz left for their islands, but the savage was not allowed to go with them. The controller wished to continue the experiment. Three weeks later, the savage ran away. After some days of wandering, he took refuge in an abandoned lighthouse. But his desire for solitude was not to be fulfilled. His hiding place was discovered. There were articles in the papers. Sightseers came by the thousands. One Sunday, Lenina Crown came for a picnic with three of her latest boyfriends. The day after her visit, two young reporters came to call, hoping for an exclusive interview. The door of the lighthouse was ajar. They pushed it open and walked into a shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room, they could see the bottom of the staircase that led up to the higher floors. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. They called. No one answered. They saw him. At last the savage had found solitude. He was alone, quite alone. <laughs> Thus concludes Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. We wish to thank Mr. Huxley for appearing on these broadcasts as our narrator. And uh, we would also like to thank you, our listeners, for your enthusiastic response to this new series. This is William Conrad inviting you to join us again next week when we present George Stewart's dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm. The following week, listen as Dr. Frank C. Baxter interviews William Shakespeare. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield... Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Parley Bear, Dora Singleton, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Loreen Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network.
This is Christopher Isherwood. The story you're about to hear was written by Aldous Huxley and myself. It's based on a true incident, and it has never before been told. It concerns a man who had a gift greater than he could understand, a gift so unique that when it was shared by others, it destroyed them. <laughs> CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Jacob's Hands, an original new story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. We are proud to have Mr. Isherwood as our narrator. Original music composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. On a small ranch in the Mojave Desert, not far from the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, is the home of Professor Arnold Carter, his sister and his daughter, retired now to this medically approved climate, nourished by the warmth of the sun. The professor lives quietly with his family and his bitterness. Shut the door! Look, Father. Where have you been? Aren't they lovely? Almond blossoms, the first of the year. Get them out of here. You want to bring on another attack of my asthma? I'm sorry, Father. Do you mind if I practice my singing? I can stand it if you can. Where were you at lunchtime, Sharon? Outside, looking for flowers. With Jacob, I'll wager. Good afternoon, Aunt Annie. Were you with Jacob, Sharon? What's wrong with that? Jacob wouldn't hurt a flea. Jacob is a hired hand. And you're the daughter of a fine scholar. Don't you ever forget it. That silly. He's just a friend. But your aunt means, Sharon, is... You're a grown lady now. You've got to learn to be cautious. Things can happen. To a cripple? To a girl who walks around on crutches? Annie, see if there's some lunch left over for Sharon. Self-pity. Look at her. Dirt on her shoes. Wash up, young lady, if you expect to eat in this house. Well, who is it? All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. It's me, Professor Tom Pierce. Oh, I'll come out. You here to look at my calf, Tom? Whatever looking I can do. The way you talk, Professor, it's a waste of time. Well, come along. We'll see. All right. What kind of shape is she in? Her hind legs are paralyzed. She's got a high fever. Yeah, could be the black quarter. She's over here, Tom. Tried to keep her away from the other animals. We never can be sure. Jacob, what are you doing with that calf? Just looking after her, Professor. Didn't I tell you to leave her alone? The disease might be contagious. Here, let me have a look, Jacob. She's been collapsed like this long since yesterday. Well, I uh, guess that's it, Professor. Black quarter, all right. All right. Jacob, get the rifle. Jacob! Sharon, stay back at the house. You can't shoot a thing just because it's lame. Did you hear me? I said go back to the house. You better go back, Sharon. It isn't pleasant. Before you do it, Professor, can I... Can I keep her for a minute? What? Can I hold the cat? Are you crazy? Get my gun. Let's not hear any more of this cat trap. You're not going to die. I won't let you die. Why? Why are you touching her, Jacob? I won't let you die. I won't. Take your hands off my calf. Do you hear? You won't die. You won't die. Jacob, the calf's on her feet. What did you do to that calf? I demand to know. I, I don't know. Well, you must have done something, Jacob. She's on her feet now. Her hind legs move. It's not anything I did. It 
just came to me, a, a feeling, something I could feel moving into my hands. That's ridiculous. That calf wasn't sick to begin with. Oh, I examined him. I say he was sick. Jacob here, he's, he's a healer. He's no such thing. You think as a scientist I could Just accept... the same, I'm going to try him out. Listen here, Jacob, I got me a lame dog down at my place. You try it on him? I guess so, if you want. Yeah, and there's others around here might like to see this thing work. Nonsense. You're making too much of it. Jacob, give that calf some water. And you, Sharon, come in the house. And Jacob healed the dog and a cat from another nearby ranch. And the following week, a colt said to be suffering from an incurable disease. And the editor of the local newspaper... Jacob, open the door. There's a man here to see you. Ed Burton, from the paper. I'd like to speak to you, Mr. Erickson. All right. There's a lot of talk around... Some of our folks seem to think that you have the power to heal. Is that right? Well, Jacob, answer Mr. Burton. I... I guess so. Sometimes it happens. I touch an animal, a dog or a calf, and he seems to get well. I see. And do you charge money for this uh, healing? No, sir, I couldn't do that. Why not? Because, well, it, it isn't mine... Whatever this thing is, it, it just comes over me. A strange feeling, I don't know. First I feel it in my hands, then it passes on to the animal. It's quite a story, Mr. Erickson. I'd like to write it up. I think everybody should know about this power. All right with you? Sure, if that's what you want to do, I don't mind. Thanks, Mr. Erickson. Good day. I'm going to write some friends of mine in L.A. to drive up. Prominent doctors, both of them. I think they could settle this whole business once and for all. A good idea. I'd like to do a follow-up piece when I get here. Ed, do you really believe in this nonsense? <laughs> now, Professor, do I believe in Santa Claus? Jacob, this is Dr. Marlowe and Dr. Carruthers. How do you do, How Mr. How do you Harrison? do? Pleased to meet you. Now, Jacob, these gentlemen merely want to talk to you. As doctors, they're naturally curious about your uh, power to heal. We certainly are, Mr. Erickson. Dr. Carruthers is an outstanding psychiatrist. My field is neuropathology. Professor Carter and I were at Chicago University together. Before the loss of my health... I was professor of biology at Chicago. You didn't know that, did you, Jacob? No, sir. Mr. Erickson, I'm frankly skeptical about so-called miracle cures. Have to be in my profession. I'm, I'm sure you understand that. Well, I just don't know. All this talk and everything, if you don't mind, I'd just now, as soon not... Jacob, no one is going to hurt you. Of course not. Well... All right, doctor, you may proceed. Uh, Mr. Erickson, here we have a rabbit. Oh, not just any rabbit. This poor little fellow happens to be quite ill. Cancer of the lung. But, sir, uh, I... Please, let me finish. In most cases of so-called faith healing, we find the illness to be hysterical in nature. That is to say, though there is an actual and very real physical illness, its basic origin is in the mind of the sufferer. Release the tension, then you often release the illness, hence a so-called miracle cure. Now, Mr. Erickson, we obtained this rabbit from a laboratory. We know the animal's disease. It is entirely organic in nature. We ask you to cure it. But I don't... Cure things. It's this feeling that comes into my hands. Yes, we understand all that, Jacob, but whatever it is, you seem to impress some people of our neighborhood. Why not let these two gentlemen in on it? They're men of science, Jacob. Yes, sir. Only I don't know if anything will happen. Sometimes it doesn't. There was a hen last week up at Tillman's, and I... We understand, Mr. Erickson. You just do it any way you like. We have plenty of time. 
Here you are, Mr. Erickson. Go ahead, Jacob. Talk to it. You're gonna get well. You're gonna get well. I, I won't let you die. I won't let you. Well, Jacob? You're gonna get well. You're gonna get well. I won't let you die. I won't let you die. I won't. Gentlemen? May I examine the rabbit, Mr. Erickson? Yes, sir. Thank you. It's very interesting how you stroke the back of the animal. You have a great gentleness in your hands. Everyone around here says Jacob is a very talented young man. They believe in him. Well, if there is any difference, I can't detect it. Of course, we'll have to dissect the animal when we get back to L.A. to be sure, but it appears... Well, you're, that... you're not going to cut him open? Naturally. You want to be absolutely sure before we pass judgment. But to kill the rabbit just to Mr. find Erickson, out... Mr. It... the rabbit will die anyway. Well, Arnold, we appreciate your letting us in on this. Yes, it was a wonderful opportunity. You don't often get to test these things firsthand. Well, we'd better be getting back. Long drive, you know. I certainly do appreciate your coming out. It's been a real pleasure for me. <laughs> and I feel a lot better. Yes, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you boys go on out to the car. I'll join you in just a moment. Jacob? Yes, sir? I think you'd better pack your things. You're fired. It's me, Jacob. Sharon. Can I talk to you? Oh, I guess so, only it's kind of messy in here. Oh, I don't mind. Your father wouldn't like it if he knew that... What he doesn't know won't hurt him. I, I heard what happened today. I'm sorry, Jacob. They don't understand. They wouldn't listen. I understand. You do? It wasn't your fault. It just didn't happen, that's all. Where will you go now, Jacob? I don't know. You know where I'd go if I could? Where? To Los Angeles. Oh, not me. I was in cities before. I didn't like it. Where? What cities? Well, when I was in the Army, they shipped me overseas from New York. It was noisy and crowded. So was Paris. Paris? Oh, they have the opera there, Jacob. Imagine if I could sing in Paris at the opera. A great stage and people in fancy clothes. And a girl on crutches singing opera. Well, what's wrong with that? Everybody in the audience would laugh. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of your leg at all. I'd be listening to your voice and looking at your face. And... Jacob. Yes? What if you could cure my leg? Sharon. I mean... It isn't as though it was deformed or anything. It isn't. It's, it's just lame, like the dog you cured. Oh, please, will you try for me? But I couldn't. Why? Well, don't you see? People and animals, they're not the same. I, I loved animals all my life. I understand that. Do I mean less to you than a dog? But that was different. Why, because animals can't talk back to you? Do you like me, Jacob? Yes. I mean a real whole lot? Yes. Then cure me. I, I don't know how. Kneel down. Take my foot. Take it in your hands. But Sharon, I... Now I, do it. Do what you did to the calf and to, to the dog and to the colt. Jacob, don't you see you have the power to make me well? I'm begging you. I want to walk. Do it for me, Jacob, please. Don't let her limp anymore. She's going to get well. She's going to get strong and well. I'm going to get well. I know it. I'm going to get well. She's going to get well. She won't be lame anymore. She'll walk like everyone else. She'll walk again. She's getting well now. 
the lameness is leaving her, and she's getting well. Jacob! I can walk! Look at me! Look at me! I'm walking! Jacob, oh, Jacob! Sharon. Oh, it's the happiest, happiest night of my life. Look at the night. At the beautiful, beautiful night. A million stars all shining for me. I own this night. I own the world. Jacob, it's mine now. I can heal. I can heal people. I'm going to walk and run and dance the rest of my life. Jacob. What? When you leave here tomorrow, I'm going with you. No, but you can't run I'm away. going with you. Sharon, no, you can't. But I am. I am. You're going to take me to Los Angeles, Jacob. And I'm going to sing and dance the rest of my life. <laughs> Sharon and Jacob left together for Los Angeles. But once there, they went their separate ways. For Sharon had only one goal, the opera. The weeks passed, and audition followed audition. And the response was always the same. Well, it's a pleasant enough voice, but a bit light for our needs. Why don't you try the popular field? And at the broadcasting and recording companies, audition followed audition. And the response was always the same. Yeah, okay, okay, Miss Carter, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll call you if something turns up. For Jacob, too, there was only one goal now, to heal the sick. But he chose another direction, a small mission near downtown Los Angeles in an area called Skid Row. And a year passed. I want you to get well. I want you to get well. I won't let you stay sick. You feel my hands on your foot. Now you're well again. You're feeling better. You see? Now you can walk. Well, what do you think of that, huh? Hello? Doc, that boy's got an act. He's for us, ain't he, Lou? Would that pull him into the art theater? Would that pull him in? <laughs> I tell you, we should hire that guy. You put him on top of the bill. After Flossie does a strip number, we got it made. Uh-uh. Lou, you're crazy or something? We packed the house. Uh-uh. This boy's too big for a barbecue house. Now, I got other plans for him. Such as? Doc, we're gonna go into the healing business in a big way. You and me and this here boy, Jacob. Now, listen. You go up there after this bit is over with, and you bring that guy back to the theater with you, see? I don't care if you have to rope in time, but you bring him. Lou, listen, I need money. Honest, I'm broke, I tell Baby, you. Baby, you're always broke. Will you stop trying to make like a diver or whatever? I got dames who can sing better and live on the salary, Lou, you know? Lou, please, I gotta have the money. Okay, Miss Dolores. Lay off to Miss Dolores, will you? <laughs> What's the matter? You don't like class. Okay, Lou, here he is. Wow, wow, Mr. Jacob. Are we ever glad to see you? Step right in. <laughs> Jacob! Oh, Jacob! Sharon, what are you doing here? Wait. Do you know this broad? All hallway. Oh, Jacob, it's really you. I, I didn't recognize you. That costume. Ah, oh, this here's Miss Dolores, the star of our show. Well, then you're singing. Well, that's wonderful, Sherry. Well, give us a knockdown, baby. Oh, Jacob, this is Lou Zaccone, the owner of the theater, and this is his assistant, Doc Waldo. Well, I'm pleased to know you, Mr. Zaccone. Doctor? Yeah, I'm pleased sure. Pleased to know you. This is the man who... This is my oldest friend. Wow, is that right? Why, well, you're just the girl to tell him what a deal he's got coming, huh? <laughs> Why don't you stick around, oh, baby? No, no, not Jacob. Uh, Mr. Jacob, the doctor here and me, we got a little uh, proposition we was wanting to talk over with you. It's a very high-class ethical kind of operation. Yeah, it's very ethical. Jacob, yeah. don't listen. Uh, it... Baby, are you forgetting where the tin spots are coming from? Uh, Mr. Jacob, uh, what we got in mind is a sort of a clinic, see? Uh, with the doctor's medical education and my business management, this here clinic could help everybody. Not just a few bums. Well... I don't know. Uh, Ain't that right, Sharon? Uh, why don't you tell Jacob? Hmm? 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> there, you see? Well, now you sit down, Mr. Jacobs, so we can talk. Psychomagnetic Medical Center. Mr. Erickson? I'm sorry, he can be seen by appointment only. Yes. Thank you for calling. Why is Mr. Erickson? Oh, isn't he in his office, Doctor? No, he ain't. Uh, isn't it? There's half a dozen patients waiting to see him. Oh, shall I try to locate him, Dr. Waldo? Uh, call the art theater on Main Street. Ask for Mr. Lawrence. She might be. Jacob, for heaven's sake, where you been? Don't you know there's people waiting to see you? Good afternoon, Doctor. Yeah. Miss Reed. Good afternoon, Mr. Erickson. And now listen, we're putting our blood, sweat, and tears into this operation, Lou and me. You treat it like you couldn't be bothered. Come on into the office. Now sit down and listen. I want to talk to you, Doctor. Yeah, well, I said listen. Lou and me sunk a bundle into this place. We hocked the art theater up to our ears. Now it's beginning to pay off and big. You're in on the take. Am I, Doc? You got 10% of the joint, haven't you? And you didn't put up a stinking dime. Doc, today I sat in the park and a man came up to me. A man who'd seen me at the mission. He was sick, Doc. And I asked him to come to me and I'd help him. And do you know what he said to me, Doc? What'd he say? He said, I came to you, Jacob, but they wouldn't let me in. I didn't have enough money. Yeah. Is that right? Doc, didn't we have an agreement anybody could come to the clinic, anybody? Now, don't get on your high horse. Didn't we agree to charge only people who had the money to pay? Oh, sure, Jacob. It must have been a slip-up. And this man, this man who'd seen me at the mission said others have been coming here, too. Others who couldn't pay and that they were turned away. Now, is that right, Doc? You answer me, Doc. Well, after all, Lou and Answer he... me, Sometimes it depends. It doesn't depend. I've lived with this until my heart can't stand it any longer. I've seen goodness turn to sin. I've hey, seen Doc, it... break out the bottle. This is a celebration. It's nice, Lord. This it's is nice. one grand celebration. Hi, Jacob. Hello, Jacob. We're here to celebrate, kids. This is... Uh... Hey, well, Jacob's not feeling very well, Lou. Some other time. Some maybe. other time. You're out of your mind. Today, right now. Uh... Uh, you want to tell him, baby, or you want me to? Lou, you and the doc, go on out. What? I want to talk to Jacob alone for a minute. What? You heard me. Well, now, listen, kid, this ain't no secret. Get out. It... Both of you. <sighs> okay, okay, but watch it, baby. I bruise easy. <laughs> Come on, doc. Jacob. Yes, Sharon. I've always believed in you, Jacob. I want you to know that. What is it, Sharon? Is something wrong? Did they hurt you Listen in some to me, way? Listen, Jacob. This is a tough thing for me. I. I didn't make it the way I thought I would. Once I said I wanted to stand on an opera stage in Paris, but I couldn't because everybody would look at my crippled leg. And you said you wouldn't. You'd look at my face and hear my voice. Isn't that right, Jacob? I guess so. Where am I now? They are looking at my legs, Jacob, both of them. And they want more. A lot more. I... I just can't take that anymore. I just can't. If... If I had money, Sharon, you could have it. You could always have it. Your money? You give it back to the patients, don't you, Jacob? They shouldn't I've have known that to for a pay. long time, Jacob. I'm going to marry Lou. What? I'm going to marry Lou. Lou? Lou's a coney? I've got to, don't you see? There's nowhere else I can go. There's nothing else I can do. Sharon... Sharon, if, if you'd have me... I'd spend the rest of my life without a dime, living in flop houses, watching you get taken by every sucker... Now, that... don't say that. Well, isn't it the truth? Isn't that what you are, Jacob? A sucker for every con man who ever came along? I was the first one. I got you here, then Doc and then Lou. 
You always took care of the other guy, Jacob. But what did you ever do for yourself? But I thought you understood. I do. That's why I've got to marry Lou. He's made a lot of money out of this place. And I need money, Jacob. I'm through with flop houses and cheap clothes. <clears throat> Jacob, wait. Hey, what's up, Jacob? You sore or something? Jacob, the better... <laughs> hey, now listen, that's going too far. <clears throat> Jacob, make it easy. All of it. All of it. Destroy it. Destroy it. <clears throat> it's sinful, don't you see? What I've been doing is sinful. I was wrong. I did do these things. I'm to blame. It's not your fault, any of you. I did it. These hands are mine. Doc, get the police. Lou, no. <laughs> Let him alone. He built it. He can tear it down if he wants to. <laughs> These hands. These hands. Please let me alone. Let me alone. Jacob returned to a ranch in the Mojave Desert to work that he knew. And he cared for the animals, and sometimes he healed them. But never again would he minister to a human being. For now, he understood how dangerous it is to heal the body if you cannot also heal the spirit. He knew the meaning of Christ's question, whether it is easier to say to the sick, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Jacob's Hands, an original news story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood, with Mr. Isherwood as our narrator. Jacob's Hands was adapted for radio and directed by William Frug. Vic Perrin was featured as Jacob, with Virginia Gregg as Sharon. Others in our cast were Herb Butterfield, Helen Klebe, Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Parley Bear, John Daner, Hans Conried, Bill Conrad, and Janet Stewart. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when from New York we present Living Portrait, an unusual study of one of the nation's most imaginative businessmen, Mr. William Zeckendorf. Whatever your own views on religion may be, CBS Radio believes that you'll be pleased to know that much time, thought, and effort is being devoted to giving children a strong spiritual foundation in Sunday schools throughout America. If your children are not attending Sunday school now, this week, Sunday School Week, is a good time to enroll them. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. My name is Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. I write stories. Charges have been brought against me by certain ignoramuses that I have never written a tale with a moral. 
By way of mitigating these ridiculous accusations, I offer the following unusual history, a history about whose moral there can be no question whatsoever. For you can see the moral in its very title, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. And note, please, that I do not bring in the lesson at the tag end of the fable as uh, others are wont to do. Very well. Here, then, I denounce my critics and beg no favor other than your close attention. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The world too long thought of Edgar Allan Poe as a door misogynist who concerned himself with black cats, gold bugs, pits, pendulums, and murder. Few realize, and fewer would believe, that this man of gloom had a sense of humor. This, the workshop now seeks to prove, in William N. Robeson's production of Edgar Allan Poe's satiric story, Never Bet the Devil Your Head, starring John Daner, with music conducted by Amerigo Marino, and with Jack Johnstone as guest director. It is not my design to vituperate my deceased friend, Toby Dammit. He was a sad dog, it is true, and a dog's death it was that he died. But he himself was not to blame for his vices. They grew out of a personal defect in his mother. I recall a conversation I had with her when Toby was a mere babe in arms. Duties to a well-regulated mind, Mr. Poe, are always pleasures. It is my duty, and therefore my pleasure, to see that as quickly as possible my son learns the difference between right and wrong. <coughs> but must you flog him so, Mrs. Dammit? Babies like tough steaks are invariably the better for beating. It drives the evil propensities out. But my dear woman, my dear woman, you have the misfortune to be left-handed. I do not consider left-handedness a misfortune. No, you failed miss, to understand me. Madam, a child flogged left-handedly had better be left unflogged. And deign to tell me why? The world revolves from right to left. If each blow in the proper direction drives out an evil propensity, it follows that every thump in an opposite one knocks its quota of wickedness in. Ha! That is a specious argument that does not warrant a reply, except perhaps this. <laughs> I was all too often present at Toby's chastisements, and even by the way he kicked, I could perceive that he was getting worse and worse every day. At last I saw, through tears in my eyes, that there was no hope for the villain at all, and one day when he had been cuffed until he grew black in the face, that no effect had been produced beyond that of making him wriggle himself into a fit, I could stand it no longer, but went down on my knees forthwith, and uplifting my voice made a prophecy. A prophecy of his ruin. For the fact is that his precocity in vice was awful. At five months of age, he got into such passions that he was unable to articulate. At six months, I caught him gnawing at a pack of playing cards. At seven months, he was in the constant habit of catching and kissing female babies. <laughs> At eight months, he peremptorily refused to put his signature to the temperance pledge. No, no, no. Thus he went on increasing in iniquity month after month, year after year, until in his youth. Mama, it is my desire to wear mustaches. And furthermore, I'll bet I can grow them. By the bill, book and candle, by Job's comforter, I'll bet I can. <laughs> As you see, he had even contracted a propensity for cursing and swearing and for backing his assertions with bets. Not that he actually laid wagers. No, I will do my friend the justice to say that he would as soon have laid eggs. With him, the thing was a mere formula, nothing more. You see, he was detestably poor. Another vice which the physical deficiency in his mother had entailed upon him. And this was the reason, no doubt, that his expletive expressions about betting seldom took a pecuniary turn. It was usually, I'll bet you what you please, or I'll, I'll, I'll bet you what you dare, or I'll bet you a trifle, or else, more significantly still, I'll bet the devil my head. At all events, through this most ungentlemanly practice, the ruin which I predicted for Toby Dammit overtook him at last. 
For indeed, the fashion had grown with his growth and strengthened with his strength, to the point that when he finally came to be a man, he could hardly utter a sentence without interlarding it with a, a proposition to gamble. Devil me, Mr. Poe. It is and remains my contention that these United States shall serve as an arrow to the target of liberty. Uh, my wager on that, sir, I'll bet you what you please. Toby, Toby, this habit of yours is an immoral one, and I feel constrained to tell you so. Pish posh, Mr. Poe. It is vulgar. I beg you to believe me. Twaddle. It is discountenanced by society. I say nothing but the truth. Tush! Gambling has been forbidden by an act of Congress. <laughs> I entreat you, I implore you. Utter foolishness. Then, by heaven, I shall have to knock some sense into you. <laughs> that, sir, was a, was a dastardly thing to do. Should you venture to try such an experiment again, I shall necessarily return in kind, and you will rue the result. I'll bet the devil my head you will. Yes, there it was again. The quintessence of his abominable expressions. I'll bet the devil my head. But there was nothing more I could do. I quit the scene in desperation and in sorrow. However, I could not evade the fact that Mr. Toby Dammit's soul was in a perilous state. I resolved to bring all my eloquence into play to save it. I vowed to serve him as St. Patrick. In the Irish Chronicle is said to have served the toad. That is to say... Awaken him to a sense of his situation. So, I addressed myself to the task. I remonstrated with him, but to no purpose. I demonstrated in vain. I entreated, he smiled. I implored, he laughed. I preached, he sneered. I threatened, he swore. I pulled his nose. He blew it. And once again... Uh. I'll bet the devil my head that taught you a lesson. Toby, have you considered the gross impropriety of a man betting his brains like banknotes? Ah, uh, should you have I? You adopted this mode of wager, I'll bet the devil my head with a pertinacity and exclusiveness of devotion that displeases me no less than it surprises me. Now, the truth is... I'll bet the devil my head I'm going to get another lecture from you. The truth is, there is something in the air with which you are wont to give utterance to this offensive expression, something in your manner of enunciation which, for want of a more definite term, I must be permitted to call queer. Oh? It is your soul I am considering, Toby. Otherwise, you must believe this. I would not be speaking to you of these matters when I am so aware of your distaste for them. For some moments, he remained silent, merely looking me inquisitively in the face, but... Presently, he threw his head to one side and elevated his eyebrows to a great extent. Then he spread out the palms of his hands and shrugged up his shoulders. Then he winked with the right eye. He repeated the operation with the left. Then he shut them both up very tight. Then he opened them both so very wide that I became seriously alarmed for the consequences. And applying his thumb to his nose, he made a disgusting, indescribable movement with the rest of his fingers. Finally, setting his arms akimbo, he condescended to reply. Mr. Poe, I will be obliged to you if you would hold your tongue. I wish none of your advice. I despise your insinuations, equivocations, adumbrations. In short, sir, your entire peroration. I am of sufficient age to take care of myself. Or is it your misconception to consider me still an infant? Sir, do you mean to impugn my character? Is it your intention to insult me? Are you a fool, sir? Tell me, is your maternal parent aware of your absence from the domiciliary residence? I beg you. I put this question to you as a man of veracity, and I will bind myself to abide by your reply. I demand once more, does your mother know you're out? <laughs> your confusion betrays you. I'll bet the devil my head she does not. And so I bid you, Mr. Poe, good day. He left my presence in quite undignified haste. It were well for him that he did so. My anger had been aroused. For once, I would have taken him up on his insulting wager, bet the devil my head indeed. And I would have won for Satan, Mr. Dammit's little head, because, you see, the fact is my whereabouts was known by my mother. Ah, well... It was in the pursuance of my duty that I had been insulted, so I bore the insult like a man. 
And it now seemed to me that I had done all that could be required of me in the case of this miserable individual. I resolved to trouble him no longer with my counsel, but to leave him to his conscience and himself. But I must confess that although I forbore to intrude with my advice, I could not quite bring myself to give up his society altogether. Worse, I even went so far as to humor some of his less reprehensible propensities, and there were times when I found myself lauding his wicked jokes, uh, but with tears in my eyes, so profoundly did it grieve me to hear his evil talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the great horned toad, Mr. Poe, your aptitude for companionship, without censure or reprimand, has taken a turn for the better. It, it puts me in mind of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Greeley, who importuned a man of tender years to seek the western shores, remember? Yet, to my knowledge, he never made the trek himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Unsought advice is like a woman left waiting at the church. Uncalled for. <laughs> Well, perhaps. Uh, Zounds and hellions, sir. I'll bet the devil my head if you cannot agree on that. Well, uh, all right, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> Toby, 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 what's to become of you? Oh, your concern is, uh, you know, touching, Mr. Poe, but it smacks of your former attitude, and I shall have none of it. None, I say. Come, it's too fine a day to spend it on peradventure and mayhap pursuits. Let us stroll the roadside in the country lane, commune with nature in her pristine glory, seek the unfettered pleasures of the here and the now. Well, sir? Very well, Toby. Thus it was that we strolled out together, arm in arm, our route leading us in the direction of a river. Ah, there, Mr. Poe. You see, beyond the stream, that field of fluorescence. Would not the Roman goddess herself exclaim over its perfection? Hmm. It is beautiful. Beautiful? <laughs> By the sons of Saul, your words make a beggary of faultless grandeur. My friend, your jaundiced eye requires closer appraisal, and your stopped-up nose a clearer whiff. But it's only a field of trees and flowers. I can see it very well from here. Stuff and nonsense. If you possessed a wit of perspicacity, that same jaundiced eye would indicate a covered bridge within a stone's throw. We shall cross it, go beyond it, and wander lonely as a cloud. Uh, to steal a phrase from one of the English greats. Come now. The bridge was roofed over by way of protection from the weather. And the archway, having but few windows, was thus uncomfortably dark and echoed resoundingly. As we entered the passage, the contrast between the external glare and the interior gloom struck heavily upon my spirits. Not so upon those of the happy Dammit, who offered to bet the devil his head that I was hipped. <laughs> he seemed to be in unusual good humor. He was excessively lively, so much so that I entertained I know not what of uneasy suspicion. A certain species of austere Merry Andrewism seemed to beset my friend and caused him to make quite a tom fool of himself. Up here! On the railing! I'm a bird! I fly! Whee! Nothing would serve him but wriggling and skipping about under and over everything that came in his way, now shouting out and now lisping out all manner of odd little and big words. I really could not make up my mind whether to kick him or to pity him. And the Luvian Transcendentalism! Whee! And the Disestablishmentarianism! At length, having passed nearly across the bridge, we approached the termination of the footway when our progress was impeded by a turnstile of some height. Through this, I made my way quietly, but this turn would not serve the turn of Mr. Dammit. Paul, uh, this, this mechanism, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Are we cattle to be impeded in this manner? It's merely a turnstile. I passed through it without it's any... It's merely a turnstile. Well, me, I defy it. <laughs> How can you defy an inanimate object? By leaping over it. Uh, not only shall I leap over it, but I shall perform a buck and wing at the apex of my jump. Oh, but Toby, it's nearly five feet in height. <laughs> a bagatelle. Oh, you're a braggadocio. You cannot do it, and you know you can't. No? 
I'll bet the devil my head I can. You hear me? I'll bet the devil my head. I was about to reply, notwithstanding my previous resolution, with some remonstrance against his impiety, when suddenly I heard, close at my elbow, a slight cough, <laughs> which sounded very much like the ejaculation... A hem. I started and looked about me in surprise. My glance at length fell into a nook in the framework of the bridge, and there upon the figure of a little old gentleman of, shall we say, venerable aspect, yes, and of reverend appearance, for he not only had on a full suit of black, but his shirt was perfectly clean, and the collar turned very neatly down over a white cravat, while his hair was parted in front like a girl's. His hands were clasped pensively together over his stomach, and his two eyes were carefully rolled up into the top of his head. Upon observing him more closely, I perceived that he wore a black silk apron over his small clothes, and this was a thing which I thought very odd. Before I had time to make any remark, however, upon so singular a circumstance, he interrupted me. To this second observation, I was not immediately prepared to reply. The fact is, remarks of this laconic nature are nearly unanswerable. I am not ashamed to say, therefore, that I turned to Mr. Toby Dammit for assistance. Dammit, what are you about? Don't you hear? The gentleman says, ahem. I looked sternly at my friend while I thus addressed him, for, to say the truth, I felt particularly puzzled. And when a man is particularly puzzled, he must knit his brows and look savage, else he looks like a fool. Toby, damn it! Uh, although this sounded very much like an oath, believe me, nothing was further from my thoughts. Damn it! The gentleman says, ahem! I do not attempt to defend my remark on the score of profundity. I did not think it profound myself, but I have noticed that the effect of our speeches is not always proportionate to their importance in our own eyes. But if I had knocked Toby on the head with the turnstile itself, he could hardly have been more discomfited than when I addressed him with those simple words. You don't say so. Are you quite sure he said that? Well, at all events, I'm for it now, and may as well put a bold face upon the matter. Here goes then. Ahem! 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 Strangely, the little old gentleman seemed pleased. God only knows why. He left his station at the nook of the bridge, came forward with a gracious air, took Dammit by the hand, and shook it cordially, looking all the while straight up in his face with an air of the most unadulterated benignity it is possible for the mind of man to imagine. Finally, he spoke. Well, well, Toby Dammit. Ah, uh, that's right, good sir. And what think you of my assertion and my wager? That you can leap the turnstile? Correct you are, and perform with consummate skill a buck and wing at the apex of my leap. I am quite sure you will win your wager, damn it, but we are obliged to have a trial, you know, for the sake of mere form. Ahem. <clears throat> a, a trial, you say? Ahem. <clears throat> my friend took off his coat with a deep sigh and tied a pocket handkerchief around his waist. He produced an unaccountable alteration in his countenance by twisting up his eyes and bringing down the corners of his mouth. <coughs> I did not express myself aloud, but I thought this is a quite a remarkable silence on the part of Toby, damn it, and is no doubt a consequence of his verbosity upon a previous occasion. I wonder if he has forgotten the many unanswerable questions which he propounded to me so fluently on the day when I gave him my last lecture. Ah, uh, him! The old gentleman now took him by the arm and led him more into the shade of the bridge, a few paces back from the turnstile. My good fellow, I make it a point of conscience to allow you this much run. Wait here till I take my place by the stile, so that I may see whether you go over it handsomely and don't omit any flourishes of the buck and wing. A mere form, you know. I will say, one, two, three, and away! And mind you start at the word, away. The little gentleman stood there a moment, looking quietly at Toby as though appraising him. Then he turned, walked away, and took his position by the stile. Again he paused a moment, as if in profound reflection, then looked up and smiled very slightly, tightened the strings of his apron, and took a long, long look at Dammit. 
I thought to myself, what right has the old gentleman to make any other gentleman jump? Who is he? If he asks me to jump, I won't do it, and that's flat, and I don't care who the devil he is. The devil he... But what I said, or what I thought, or what I heard, occupied only an instant. The black-suited little man gave the word as agreed upon. One, two, three, and away! I saw Toby run nimbly and spring grandly from the floor of the bridge, cutting the most awful flourishes with his legs as he went up. I saw him high in the air, buck and winging it to admiration. I thought it a singular thing that he did not continue to go over, but the whole leap was the affair of a moment. And before I had a chance to make any profound reflection, down came Mr. Dammit on the flat of his back, on the same side of the stile from which he had started. At the same instant, I saw the old gentleman running off at the top of his speed. But ere leaving us, he had caught and wrapped up in his apron something that fell heavily into it from the darkness of the arch just over the turnstile. At all this, I was much astonished, but I had no leisure to think, for Mr. Dammit lay particularly still, and I concluded that his feelings had been hurt and that he stood in need of my assistance. I hurried up to him and found that he had received what might be termed a serious injury. Quite serious. Quickly, I threw open an adjacent window of the bridge and the sad truth flashed upon me. About five feet above the top of the turnstile, there extended a flat iron bar that served to strengthen the structure. With the edge of this brace, it appeared evident, the neck of my unfortunate friend had come precisely in contact and alas, the truth is, he had been deprived of his head. He did not long survive his terrible loss. Despite the efforts of the physicians, he grew worse and, at length, died. So I bedewed his grave with my tears, worked a bar sinister on his family escutcheon, and assumed the general expenses of his modest funeral. Exit Toby Dammit. Toby Dammit, a lesson to all riotous livers, and proof absolute of my initial assertion that every tale should have, must have, does have, a moral. You have just heard John Daner in the CBS Radio Workshop's production of Never Bet the Devil Your Head under the guest direction of Jack Johnstone. It was adapted for radio by Alan Botzer, with music composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Heard in the supporting cast were Eleanor Audley, Leon Ledoux, Dawes Butler, Richard Beals, and Howard McNear. Next week, from New York, the workshop will present The Heart of Man, a dramatization of a surgical operation in which the heart itself is the principal actor. Hugh Douglas speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Overthrow Christmas, which has been going on for some time now. In fact, Norman Corwin wrote a play called The Plot to Overthrow Christmas, which has been broadcast on CBS for three years. Tonight, you will hear it again. 
This presentation is by way of a Christmas gift from CBS to its listeners on the principle that the best presents you can give your friends are the things you want for yourself. We wish you good cheer and ask you to follow the unraveling of The Plot to Overthrow Christmas by Norman Corwin. Did you hear about the plot to overthrow Christmas? Well, gather ye now from Maine to the Isthmus of Panama and listen to the story of the utter in glory of some gory goings-on in hell. Now, it happened in Hades, ladies and gentlemen. It happened down there that the fiends held a meeting. The fiends held a meeting for the purpose of defeating Christmas. With the aid of a fade, a fade on the radio, we'll take you there with a high and a hady ho to hear firsthand the brewing of the plot down in the deepest Stygian grot. Grot is a poetical term for grotto. Whenever you hear my voce sato, or sato voce, whichever you prefer, it's just I taking pains to make quite sure that nobody makes a poetical allusion which might in any way create confusion. I return you now to the voice you were hearing before I had to do this interfering. As I was saying, in this Stygian grot, the notables of Limbo hatched a plot. And what went on in the sulfurous hole will soon pick up by remote control. Of course, such a pickup is not made quickly. As a matter of fact, it's done rather trickly. You mustn't mind if it sounds erratic. That's merely intraterrestrial static. And don't be surprised if you're deafened by thunder just as we start on our journey under. You'll hear earthquakes and all of the commoner varieties of natural phenomena. And so, below, via radio, to the regions where legions of the damned go. Interrupt me in the middle of a movement of my favorite concerto. You should look to the improvement of your manners. Sir, if you please, my apologies. I would not have intruded upon your recital if the matter were not so terribly vital. The most important matter in the world is piddling when it comes to be compared with Nero's fiddling. Now, what you say may be very true, but I have been sent here to summon you to a great mass meeting of the tortured souls down in the graft of the flaming coal. A meeting? What for? What's the big idea? Why can't a fellow have some peace down here? Peace? Poor soul can't be found on the premises. This is a region abounding in nemeses. Now you're talking like a travel folder. Tell me, Violet, before I smolder, why are we meeting? Who's on the spot? We're meeting in order to fabricate a plot. A plot against the festival that mortal men... Comforting and gladdening again and again. You see, every year... Never mind the facts. I don't want to hear how mortal man acts. The only information about which I care concerns the mass meeting and who'll be there. His wickedness, Mephisto, will preside. Naturally. And several of the Borgias will be sitting at his side. And down in front, by the sizzling sodium will be many personalities noted for their odium. Haman, Caligula, Medusa, and the Greek. That's all very nice, but what about me? Oh, you will be sitting in row A, center, between Ivan the Terrible, the Tormentor, and Cersei. Mercy! Why, they're both deranged! 
Do you wish me to see if your seat can be changed? Yes, if you will, please. Taste comes first, even though a soul may be eternally cursed. right oh. See you at the meeting, then? Yes. And now, back to my fiddling again. <laughs> This is I, the sotto voce person. It should have been explained that Nero's rehearsing for nothing in particular. He's just that way. While hell's fires burn, he likes to play. Makes it feel a little more at home. It's just an avocation he picked up in Rome. called you here from over 60 seas of boiling pitch and blazing phosphorus to stop what constitutes a loss for us. We've lost prestige, and I greatly deplore that we stand in danger of losing more in the way of confidence and spirit. We are far from our goal. We're nowhere near it. And this is the reason. Though we've done well in carrying forward the work of hell, we've left a very big job unfinished. After all these years, there is undiminished goodwill on earth every late December because of Christmas. Now, please remember that as long as this continues to be, the race of man will not belong to me. I will listen now to any questions you may want to ask, and then suggestions. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Brother Heyman has the floor. You say we have done well in our effort to sell evil. I say we have done better. We have carried out the letter of your law. We've done what I think is a pretty good job. And I say as a veteran demon... Sit down there, Heyman. Enough of this folly. Sit down yourself. You're off your trolley. Sit down, for I am Ivan the Terrible. You're telling us why you are unbearable. <laughs> Hello, demons. This is no way to act. Please proceed with a little more tact. I want more decorum in this forum. All personal remarks must cease. Now, Brother Ivan, will you speak your piece? I merely want to say in a casual way that Heyman is a radical. He always gets fanatical. Why anybody think to hear him snort that the work of the Nazis should just stop short? Anybody think to hear him talking that Hitler and Hito should stop stalking the ways of the world? Mr. Chairman, Brother Ivan is a demagogue with a brain like a fly and the manners of a hog. Why, he says we... Now that's enough. We will hear from others. Surely there must be among you brothers enough venom and malevolence to crush a mortal man's benevolence, it's come to this. Are we going to let a little holiday like Christmas get the better of us all down here below? No, 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 no. Very well then, sirs. Very well. Let's go. Let's lay down our plans now to overthrow this Christmas business and all that guff. Of holly and mistletoe and stuff. Brother Caligula may take the floor. Mr. Chairman, I abhor, as a former emperor, anything which curbs our rule. I suggest we start right in manufacturing more sin. Let us give some presents, too. Candy sticks and things to chew. Fruits and nuts and little cakes. Poisonous as rattlesnakes. Bravo! Let our subtlest worker be um, bichloride of mercury. Let us wrap in tinsel bright little gifts of dynamite. Oh! Work things so that men will fear when 1225 draws near. Bravo! Uh, soon at this rate, if you please... Men will hang from Christmas trees. Oh! 
My dear Caligula, permit the chair to say that we think you've got something there. And now, with this fine start, let's hear some more. Uh, yes, Brother Nero, do you want the floor? With all due respect to Caligula's views, I think there's a better method we can use. I've just heard lately men are giving the razz to classical music by making it jazz. They're swinging it bark and what is keener. They're doing the shag to Palestrina. Sure, sure. As a connoisseur of music, of course I love the works of Rimsky-Korsakov. But today I note with a bitter shrug they've made Scheherazade a jitterbug. <laughs> Much as we admire your clever rhyme, uh, will you get to the point we're wasting time? I was just about to say when interrupted that Christmas can easily be corrupted. If you take and swing all the Christmas carols, I think of the evil. Just barrels and barrels of sacrilege every time you play a pious song in a profane way. Why, once you entice him to swing Noel, then victory belongs to us fiends. Well, <laughs> Mr. Legree, I like to say that it seems to me that you all's barking up a coonless tree. I think Mr. Nero's made a wrong guess. The way to go about it is to get in Congress and bribe a bunch of senators who know their oaths and just make a purchase of a block of votes. And then they can legislate a situation where they rule old Christmas right out of the nation. They can all get together and pass a law where there ain't going to be no Christmas anymore. I think the green suggestion is a beaut. That's very cute and quite astute. To me, uh, it seems a bit impractical because you have to be so uh, tactical. Why? For instance, now a senator who'd sell his vote to our lobbyists might very well sell right out again and become a tool of agencies representing the Yule. By the eternal night. That's right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Miss Borgia. I say that we should all give pause to think about this uh, Santa Claus. He is the man behind the scenes, the symbol of what Christmas means. If we could uh, rub him out, my friend... Our troubles would be at an end. Just think how it would tickle us to liquidate St. Nicholas. A girl like me could fascinate the guy and uh, then uh, assassinate? Do you think that you could do it, pretty one? Are you sure you wouldn't be by pity one? Sometimes you are an awful tease, my master, Mephistopheles. Ain't I murdered several dozens, poisoned uncles, aunts, and cousins? Don't my work right here in Hades make me first among the uh, ladies? Men of virtue all have cussed me. I am sure that you can trust me. Of that we have the particle of a doubt, Miss Borgia. And I'm sure we all have nothing but kind feelings towards you. But many times a woman's spy, alas, adores her victims. Games make poor ambassadors. Do you imply that such defects are found inherent in my sex? I do. Well, listen here, old Ironsides. You're heading for some cyanides. You crossed a Borgia, and you know the consequences that follow. Come, come, disciples. This is very bad. There's nothing to be gained by getting mad. Suppose we put the matter to a vote. First, the plan of Brother Nero's, viz, to swing the hymns and pious music. All those four will please respond by raising up a paw. Four. And those against? Against. against. Very well. Now, the project of Legree's. Who is there here who totally agrees? I do. Legree votes for himself. And those opposed? Opposed. And now... All those who favor Borgia's cause, it uh, being to eliminate uh, Santa Claus. Aye, aye, aye! And those opposed? <laughs> Seems the women have a way with that. 
At least they've uh, carried the day with them. <laughs> the motion's carried. And now we'll decide which one of us will take Nick for a ride. We'll all draw lots and thus settle the moot point of who will be sent to execute. Well, I... This is your old friend, Sotto Voce, visiting down where it's eternal noche. Noche is Spanish for night, you know. Merely a reference, just to show that English isn't all I have to go by. Oh, well. I guess I've missed my calling. I should have been a lobbyist. You see, I'm stalling to give them time to finish the voting. Let's see. The weather. Now I'm quoting the Daily Hellion. Continued heat, both overhead and under feet. Fresh and moderate gases blowing up to gale force and then going north by westerly. Light showers of brimstone toward the evening hours. That's what it says here. I'm not fibbing. How am I doing with my ad living? This is a thing a gabbard have fun with. Say, the drawing should soon be done with. We expect the results at any moment now. As soon as... The lots have been drawn, and I'm glad to say... The honor has fallen Nero's way. Now, Nero, you are charged with a great task. It's the evilest deed that we could ask a fiend to do. We'll be proud of you. Now, just one moment. How do I get there? Uh, What do I wear? Uh, Is it dry or wet there? Is it fact or fancy or just word of mouth that he lives at the pole? Is it north or south? If he dwells in the regions to which I've referred, must I pass through a camp of Admiral Byrd? What shall I use when it comes to the showdown? A gun or a dagger? Well, give me the lowdown. Now, Nero, you needn't sound so tragic. You'll get to Earth by the blackest magic. To create an express elevator is simple for an expert spell creator. With a lot of pyrotechnic dazzle... We'll let you off on a hill in Basel, uh, Switzerland. From there, you will make your way to the Arctic Circle, then break your way through ice with a blowtorch. After a while, you are bound to reach Santa's domicile. And once you get there, oh, my dear Nero, all of our work will have gone for zero. If you don't succeed in your assignment, a disadvantage of our confinement, in limbo is the fact that we only get... One chance in all the eternal roulette of circumstance. I know. If at first we don't succeed, we can try, try again. But there is no need because nothing will come of it. Meaning no offense. Do you mind if I take my departure hence? That, my friends, was a big brass gong. It's used in this story right along to indicate that we're about to travel to points where the plot will further unravel. And now... Ambassador Nero elects, we'll have another spot of sound effects. Tell me, stranger. Basel, Switzerland, or is it already Donner and Blitzerland? Donner und Blitzenlands, 5,000 miles away. Thank you, mister. Good day. Tell me, stranger, I've been walking inland for weeks. Where am I now? In Finland. Tell me, stranger, because I've lost stock... Where am I now? In Vladivostok. This is stranger after all these centuries of blistering heat. Now I have to suffer from freezing feet. I'm wincing with pain from this pesky toe. No speak English. Eskimo. 
I declare by my frenetic soul, I must be over the magnetic pole. My watch has stopped. Can that be right? I wonder... Ah, a light. A light. In a moment now, you'll hear me knock on Santa's door, and he'll unlock it never more to lock again. <laughs> So is doom. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Very well indeed, and you, sir? Splendidly. Won't you come right in? Take your coat off. I see your chin is frozen. Also your hands and knees. Sit down while I get you some antifreeze. Don't bother, sir. I will not be long. I'm about to perpetrate a fearful wrong. In short... I am going to do away with... Take it easy. Do not play with that gun. I know all about you. Really? Haven't I had my agents scout you for weeks? You've come all this way to abolish Christmas. Now, let me say... Listen, Santa. I'm no callow stripling. I've read Ernest Hemingway and Kipling and also the shooting of Dan McGrew. And plenty of detective stories, too. And just to show you what a broad guy I am, I've also read The Ruby at of Omer Khayyam. Do you think that a fellow with his reading so graded could have learned so little as to be dissuaded from a main objective? Why, don't make me giggle. I'd feel a lot better if you wouldn't wiggle that gun so. Much as I'm impressed with your education, I honestly believe that a figure of your station should have given more thought to the ways of man and less devotion to the cult of Pan. By others, no doubt your wisdom may be prized. But I didn't come here to be criticized. In fact, I came to dispatch a duty. So don't hand me any of this tutti-frutti. If you have any last words you want to say, then spill them. I haven't got all day. Now, what's the rush? Unless I've counted wrong, the polar day has always been six months long. Well, after I've disposed of you, I've got to hurry. Right back to hell, they'll begin to worry. Not about you, but about your career in homicide. Do you think that the mere loss of you would make them hysterical? Their only interest is numerical. Think so? Mephisto wants to rule just as much of humanity as possible for reasons of personal vanity. By the sticks, you're right. Just think that he'd dare. Are there any ladies here? Will you permit me to swear? My answer to that is an emphatic no. There are several lady dolls in the toy room below. Oh, Claudius. Oh, Cassius. Oh, Nephilim. What a fool I've been. What a fool I've been. Yeah, but wait. I think I see what you're after. You're as clever as a big-time Roman grafter. You remind me now of my royalty, just to get me in the mood for disloyalty. Do you think I could be that meanly deceptive to Satan? Why, Santa, I'm keenly perceptive. I can see right through all your clever ruses. Nero can be plenty foxy when he chooses. I'll have you know that I'm partly a dreamer, partly a wit, and partly a schemer. I'm part philosophical and also part mystic. I suppose you fancy that you're highly artistic. Fancy? Why, I have such a sense of beauty. Don't hand me a helping of Tutti Frutti. Any creature who really had beauty in his soul would appreciate Christmas. He would know that the whole idea of the holiday was one of such power that all the fiends below might gnash their fangs and glower, yet never in a million years could do it harm. Because it has a glory, a greatness, a charm you'd know nothing about. That's so? The spirit that it venerates, the good cheer that it generates, are things far, far beyond you. For all your wealth, no man on earth could sell ye these. Am I so cursed as that? Will you tell me, please, what beauties there may be that I've never seen? Have you ever seen a Christmas tree, tall and green, smelling of woodlands covered with a sheen of silveriness, its branches bending low with the fruits of human kindness instead of snow? No. 
Have you ever closely witnessed what takes place any Christmas morning on a young child's face? Or perceived any beauties purer than the joys distilled in the hearts of little girls and boys? Have you ever watched a fire in a fireplace on a Christmas Eve? Or listened to a grace at a table heavy with fruits and cakes and all the wonders that a kitchen makes, fowls and pastries, wines and meats and nuts and raisins and candied sweets? Uh, Have you ever seen mistletoe hanging from a ceiling? In frosty air heard a far bell pealing? Have you ever come back from a sleigh ride tingling and your feet keeping time with the sleigh bells jingling? Have you ever seen the beauty of a sprig of holly or felt for a moment how it feels to be jolly? Golly! Have you ever known how exceedingly pleasant it is to unwrap a Christmas present? Did you ever know how much cheer it lends to be wished a Merry Christmas by all your friends? Did you ever experience the fun of giving? Do you know at all the joys of living? I guess I don't. For all of me, I never knew such things could be. Just think how long in ignorance I've slept. It must have been the company you kept. I was a wicked tyrant once, you know. Oh, yes, but that was centuries ago. You really had no way of knowing. Perhaps. I guess that I'll be going. I really should be getting on my way. But do you have to? Don't you want to stay? You see, I'm just a bit, uh... Embarrassed? Why, yes, sir. Now, don't look so harassed. I know just why you came and who it was that sent you. But that's all done with. I take it you repent you of all your past mistakes? With many pains and aches of conscience. We interrupt this broadcast for a special bulletin. The Algiers Radio, recorded by the CBS shortwave listening station, has just reported that Admiral Jean Darlon has been assassinated. Said the Algiers announcer, complete order reigns in Algiers. Further details at 8.55 tonight. We return you now to the program, The Plot to Overthrow Christmas. Here, and uh, tell me, uh, will you have some wine or beer? Uh, I never touched the stuff myself, but I uh, managed to keep on hand a little rye for purposes medicinal. I mean, your chin should be unfrozen. What a state it's in. A while ago, you asked me if I understood good cheer. I do so now, St. Nicholas. I see it standing here. I want to ask you something, sir. Now, please don't give a yelp. Is there any sort of work to do where I can be of help? Indeed, there is. Indeed, there is. And I'm glad you asked me. I have so many toys to make. Uh, This year, the job's got past me. But first, you sit and eat this bowl. I've got a little trifle I'd like for you to see. So will you sit right here and stifle your curiosity? I'll get it for you right away. It's down the hall. Who'd ever think it? Will wonders never cease? At last, after all these centuries, I'm so happy I could buzz. It shows you what a lot a little Christmas spirit does. As emperor, I envied off the cheerfulness of peasant, and now I... Well, here it is, Nero, my boy. By way of Christmas presents, I offer you this little gift. But, Santa, for what reason? A very good one, sir. To wit, compliments of the season. Well, go ahead and open it. Why stand there so, reflecting? I'm just collecting thoughts, St. Nick. My thoughts, I'm just collecting. Just think how far a tiny bit of fellowship will carry us. Oh, well. I say... What's this? What's this? It is a Stradivarius. Oh, thank you. Thanks a million times. I, I, I don't know what to say to you. I'll tell you what I'll do, St. Nick. I'll start right in and play for you. I'll play, I'll play, I'll play, I'll play. I'll play all night and day for you. Fine. Here's some music. I'm sure you'll play it well. It's a little piece entitled Noel, Noel. This is I. Remember me, your salo voce friend? 
I've just come back to tell you that the story's at an end. Once again, the plot to overthrow Christmas has been foiled. One year ago today, none of us knew whether on December 24th, 1942, we could do such a broadcast as the Norman Corwin holiday play you have just heard. However, we could and we did. And we rather think that the plot to overthrow Christmas will be thwarted again in 1943. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Scat! The world's divided into two kinds of people. Aleurophobes and aleurophiles. Cat haters and cat lovers. There's no in-between. The man is yet to be born who can take cats or leave them alone. Either you love them or you hate them. I hate them. And even if you're a sweet old lady who lives all alone with 13 pussies, I'm sure you won't think too ill of me when you hear what the king of the cats did to me. Scat, you black fiend! The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind, presents The King of the Cats by Stephen Vincent Benet, Adapted for radio and directed and produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. If I hadn't been so young, I suppose I could have taken it in stride. Of course, I didn't think I was young. I was two years out of Yale, and I thought I knew all the answers. Certainly, I knew I was in love. They say the most beautiful women in the world are Eurasian, and they're right. Vivranca's skin was like golden velvet, her long straight hair ebony in the moonlight, and her eyes blue as a field of larkspur, fathomless as the center of heaven. Her mother had been an American missionary, her father Siamese, and undoubtedly a prince, my Aunt Emily insisted. Ordinarily, Aunt Emily wouldn't have approved of Ivranka, but this was the year that the king and I was a sellout at the St. James Theater, so a hostess who could decorate her dinner table with a breathlessly beautiful Siamese princess was definitely a hostess with a mostess. At least Aunt Emily always addressed her as princess, and Vivranka always replied to the My title. My dear, dear princess, how sweet of you to drop in. And tell me how nice you would get away from the office early. Lemon or cream, princess? Neither, Mrs. Calverin. And no sugar. Oh, of course, my dear. How stupid of me to forget. Here you are. Thank you. Tommy? I'll get myself a highball, if you don't mind. No, dear, go right ahead. I believe you know everyone, Princess, Mrs. Dandridge. Yes, Mrs. Yes. Stanford, Professor uh, Fairweather. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Dandridge has been telling us about the most fascinating man, my dear, a symphony conductor with a tail. A tail? How interesting. I still can't believe it. I saw it myself, twice. First in Paris and then again at the Teatro Royale in Rome. He conducted the Beethoven Pastoral, and, my dear, you've never heard such effects from an orchestra. You see, he conducted with it. With his tail? Oh, no. Oh, yes. And such a charming person. So urbane, so utterly fascinating. I should imagine I would love to meet him. And you shall, my dear. I'll see to it when he arrives. Oh, he's coming over? Yes. Yes, the new symphony people have invited him to be guest conductor for three concerts. He'll be very busy, of course, but he's promised to give me what time he can spare. Oh, that's sweet of you, dear, but you mustn't wear yourself out. The rest of us must do our part, too. I'll be only too glad to help entertain him. Oh, now, that won't be necessary. I'm just going to give Monsieur Thibault... Sweet name, isn't it? Felix Thibault. I'm just going to show him the simplest of times. A little reception for a hundred or so after his first concert. Perhaps he... He hates large mixed parties on account of his little... 
idiosyncrasy. It makes him feel a trifle shy of strangers. I should think it would, to say nothing of his friends and acquaintances. Uh, Vivranka, my dear, how would you like to go out nightclubbing with a jerk with a tail? It might be interesting. Huh? He is not a jerk, Tommy. He is one of the finest conductors in Europe. Sounds to me like he's the smartest showman since P.T. Barnum. What do you think, Professor? Uh, well, I should be interested to see this, Monsieur Thibault, myself. In the Middle Ages, there was a widespread belief in homo codatus, or men with tails, but I know of no authenticated case. Of course, we all have tails, in a manner of speaking. What? Oh, vestigial, of course. But the last few vertebrae of anyone's spine, the coccyx, is the evidence of a concealed and rudimentary tail. I dare say it might be possible in an extraordinary case that a throwback, a reversion to type... How fascinating! I never realised that I... Well, I think it'd be fun to get together a box for the first concert, all of us. Oh, well, I'm afraid I shall have my own box party. But, of course, you'll come on to the reception later at my place. Why, thank you, my dear. Then there'll be the professor and the princess and Tommy. Uh, count us out, Aunt Emily. When Vivranca and I want to see freaks, we'll go to the circus. I shall be very pleased to attend the concert, Mrs. Culverin. <laughs> Ah, splendid, my dear. But Vivranca... Is there anyone you'd like me to ask to replace Tommy? But Aunt it Emily... It doesn't make any difference. I'm only interested in meeting this wonderful Monsieur Félix Thibault. But Vivranca... I went to the concert. What else could I do? We took our seats in the box as the orchestra took theirs on stage and began their aimless squeakings and tootings, those caterwaulings which, I must confess, make about as much sense to me as the music that follows. Aunt Emily was in a dither of fluttery expectation. Professor Fairweather had lost much of his scientific detachment, and Vivranca, gorgeous Vivranca, sat beside me silent, but so tense I could almost feel her breathless expectation, and I didn't like it at all. And then Monsieur Thibault walked on stage. A lithe, dark-haired man with piercing eyes, like a black panther, his head weaving the way the big cats do when they're behind bars. It was true. They hadn't lied. From beneath the tails of his dress coat curled a third, a living tail, which he carried nonchalantly draped over his wrist. He acknowledged the presence of the audience with a regal bow. And then that incredible tail twined with dainty carelessness around a black baton on the podium. While he remained facing the audience, the tail rapped three times upon the podium for the orchestra's attention and then raised for the downbeat. At this horrible moment, I glanced at Vivranca. Her whole body was rigid as steel, and the blue flowers of her eyes were bent upon Monsieur Thibault in terrible concentration. She took my hand in hers and her long red fingernails felt like a claw as the hideous tail of that monster on stage lashed into the downbeat of Night on Bald Mountain. <laughs> That's the way it went through the Bach Passacaglia, through the afternoon of a fawn, through the Beethoven Ninth. New York music lovers had never heard anything like it before, and New York music lovers never behaved quite like this before. As Monsieur Thibault finally glided from the stage after his 15th bow, the president of the Wednesday Sonata Club had to be forcibly restrained by her husband from flinging her $90,000 string of pearls after the maestro in an excess of aesthetic appreciation. And as we shouldered our way through the hysterical mob toward the waiting limousines, I distinctly heard Ludwig Willems, conductor of the mid-century Philharmonic, say to Dr. Friedrich Laskar, the great plastic surgeon... But it must be possible, Doctor. Think of the miracles they have accomplished in Denmark. There's $10,000 in it for you, Doctor, if only you can find a way to graft the tail onto me. But through all the hysteria... Vivranca remained silent, self-possessed, her azure eyes fathomless as the center of heaven. She was silent as we drove to Mrs. Dandridge's party in Aunt Emily's limousine. But this was not too remarkable, because Aunt Emily never stopped raving about Monsieur Thibault. But aside from the heavenly music, my dears, the man himself, such elegance, such poise, such... Mm, I tell you, Tommy, if your Uncle Henry weren't still around, and I was a few years younger... Well, tail and all. 
Our hostess, Mrs. Dandridge, looked like the cat who had swallowed the canary, having trapped the social lion of the season, if I may be permitted to scramble a metaphor. Let Aunt Emily have her Siamese princess. Dolly Dandridge had the world's greatest conductor, complete with tail. And this dear Monsieur Thibault is my dearest friend. Emily, may I present Monsieur Thibault? Monsieur Thibault, Mrs. Henry Culverine. Enchanté, Madame Culverine. Oh, Monsieur Thibault, it is an honor to meet you. I am overcome. Yes, yes, thank you much, oh. Madame. I feel I should be on bended knee. It is not necessary. Oh, I should kiss your hand. You, you are too kind, no? Oh, I must. No, no, please, madame. He stopped trying to stop Aunt Emily from making a fool of herself. He had seen Vivranka. The end of his tail, just the very end, twitched turgidly, and he seemed to be at her side in a bound rather than a step. It was foolish and superfluous for Mrs. Dandridge to do the honors. Princess, may I present Monsieur Thibault? Monsieur, Princess Vivranka. Maestro. Princess. They exchanged no more words. Monsieur Thibault presented his arm to the princess. She linked hers and his, and his infernal tail switched from his right arm to his left to come to rest across Vivranka's wrist. Thus, like royalty, they made their way across the room, the guests parting to make a path for their regal progress. Now, Tommy, you mustn't take it so hard. After all, the princess is an awfully sweet child, but she isn't exactly our kind. And I suppose she's his. She seems to be. Look at them. So darlingly foreign, both of them. Yeah, aren't they? Out of this world. <laughs> and they were. I didn't realize it until I'd said it. They were somehow out of this world. They didn't walk across the room. They glided. The tail-coated maestro with his third tail so insidiously ubiquitous and the princess's hips swaying in the golden-threaded silken sheath of her skirt. A bas-relief from Angkor Vat suddenly breathing life. <laughs> She never left his side for the rest of the evening. I didn't like it. I didn't like it a bit. But there was nothing I could do about it. After all, one can't very well make a scene, especially with a guest of honor. But Professor Fairweather, detached man of science, was bound by no such restrictive codes. Extraordinary. Simply extraordinary. I think it stinks. What? How's that, Tommy? What stinks? The way Vivranka's acting. Oh, oh, nothing extraordinary about that. Her behavior's quite normal, I should say. Oh, it's the tail that's extraordinary. Yeah. Where'd he be without it? Where indeed, and what? Just another foreigner with a kiss-your-hand, madame, accent. They're a dime a dozen. Yes, the tailless ones. Uh-oh, the princess has joined the other ladies for a moment. It's my opportunity. For what? A word with Monsieur Thibault. I'd like several words with oh, him. Uh, Monsieur Thibault, Monsieur Thibault. Uh, ah, uh, Professor Fairweather. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, may I speak to you a moment? But of course. You know Tommy Calvin, I believe. I don't think I've had the pleasure. You are the lovely Mrs. Calvarine's son. No, her nephew. How interesting. And Princess Vivranka's friend. We're practically engaged. Congratulations. I thought you ought to know. Indeed, yes. I am honored by your confidence. Now, Professor... Uh, uh, yes, Monsieur Thibault, I speak to you as a man of science. Yes? A true specimen of Homo caudatus has been unknown to modern science until now. Homo caudatus? Yes, a man with a tail. What? Come now, Professor, it's nothing to be sensitive about. My interest is purely impersonal. Your interest? Yes, purely scientific. It wouldn't take much of your time, a morning or an afternoon, perhaps, no more. What would not take much time? Uh, an examination and measurements, x-rays and An so examination? On. Measurements of what? Your tail. Dunmer for the brokogan me on. Monsieur Thibault, Monsieur Thibault's tail lashed stingingly across the professor's face, cutting off his last words. Then the conductor turned and stalked out of the room, growling and spitting in his anger. Without even bothering to retrieve his hat and coat, he kept right on through the foyer and on out into the chilly night. Oh, dear. 
Ah, <laughs> wonderful, Professor. Wonderful. I can't thank you enough. Oh, for what, Tommy? For getting rid of him. But I wasn't trying to get rid of him. I know, but you did. And that's all that counts. Only he didn't. Aunt Emily realized at once that Mrs. Dandridge had lost her catch. For certainly Monsieur Thibault would never again enter the house where he had been insulted. And Aunt Emily moved with the speed of an aggressor nation. Within three days, Monsieur Thibault had accepted her invitation to be a house guest and had moved in bag and baggage. Now there was no escaping my tailed nemesis. And now it took no urging upon Vivranca to visit Aunt Emily. She wanted to be there. She preferred being there to any entertainment I could offer her. But there was one ray of hope. Thibault was committed to a long concert tour all the way to the coast. And with him out of the way, I felt sure I could mend the fences he had torn down. The day before the farewell dinner Aunt Emily was giving him, I dropped by after work to find my aunt in more than her usual dither. Oh, Tommy, isn't it just too, too exciting? I don't know, Aunt Emily, until I find out what it is. Why, Monsieur Thibault and the princess, of course. What about them? They're in love. This scarcely strikes me as news. And they're going to be married. Oh, no. Oh, yes, I'm going to make the announcement at the dinner party tomorrow night. Aunt Emily, how can you do this to me? Well, I didn't do it to you. Uh, anyway, you must face this like a man. You know, you must find some nice homey girl like that Gretchen Woolwine from Chicago. You used to like her. I was younger than Aunt Emily. And that was before I knew Vivranca. Well, my dear, I'm afraid you've lost your princess. C'est la vie, c'est l'amour, as I always say. Where is Vivranca? Is she here? Oh, my, yes, she's in the library with Monsieur Thibault. Naturally. Now, don't disturb them, dear. I'm sure they want to be alone. Naturally. The hard knot in the pit of my stomach grew and grew. Finally, when Aunt Emily chattered off to change for dinner, I slipped down the hall toward the library. I couldn't hear voices, and the room was dark. I was about to flick on the light switch when I heard a strange sound. And then I saw them silhouetted in the dying light of the fire. Thibault was seated in a chair, and Vivranca crouched on a stool at his side, while his hand softly, smoothly stroked her dark hair. And all I could think of was Black Cat and Siamese Kitten. And then I realized what the sound was. They weren't talking to each other. No. They were purring to each other. But, Professor Fairweather, what am I going to do? Now, Tommy, you must get hold of yourself. This whole thing has disturbed you to the point of hallucination. Nonsense, Professor. I heard them. I tell you, I heard them purring. Fantasy, sheer fantasy. Just because the man does have a tail, you're imagining... I'm positive he's a cat. And you cannot stand the thought of uh, Vivanka marrying... I can't stand the thought of her marrying anyone. But a cat? It's monstrous. What am I going to do, Professor? Well, you might have the SPCA pick him up. Oh, please, Professor. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, Tommy. I know you're serious. Wait a minute. I just thought of something. Oh, no, it's too ridiculous. What? Tell me, what? Oh, Tommy, you're a bad influence. You're leading my reason from the narrow path of scientific method to the doubtful fields of the supernatural. What are you talking about? <laughs> Well, I was thinking of a story I read once. Oh, it's turned up in one form or another in the folklore of every land on earth, I suppose. It has to do with a traveller who saw within a ruined abbey a procession of cats lowering into a grave a little coffin with a tiny crown on it. Oh, filled with horror, the traveller hastened away from the place, and when he reached his destination, he, he couldn't help telling his host of the strange ritual he'd seen. Well, scarcely had he finished when the host's cat, who'd been lying in front of the fire, leapt to its feet and cried out, Then I am king of the cats, and disappeared in a flash up the chimney. So? Well, proceeding upon your premise that uh, Monsieur Thibault is a cat, you will grant that he's a very extraordinary cat, a cat who could uh, presumably one day be king of the cats? Of course. Of course. Yes, it might work. I'll pull it on him tomorrow night at Aunt Emily's dinner party. Only... Uh, only what? Well, he won't buy that ruined abbey part. Well, then use your imagination. Uh, make it Central Park. Sure. Sure, why not? Bring the story up to date. A funny thing happened today on my way up from the office. Mm. 
And Emily outdid herself. Her dinner table was a poem of spring flowers, gold plate, the purest white linen, the candles fluttering ever so little in the warm night breeze that came through the open French doors. Time and again, through the first three courses, I tried to get into the stream of conversation. But when Aunt Emily's on, this is practically impossible. Thibault and Vivranca, seated on either side of her, were oblivious of everything. They ate little and never took their eyes off each other. Finally, the plates were being taken away, and I knew Aunt Emily was going to make her announcement during the dessert course. I just had to get my two cents worth in first. <laughs> you never forget that summer. <laughs> Eden Rock was never gayer. And after the Duke and the Duchess arrived, well... Uh, a, a funny thing happened on my way up from the office this Johnny, evening. I was about to tell... A funny thing happened on my way up from the office this evening. I was taking a shortcut across Central Park when I came upon the darndest thing. In a little clump of bushes, I saw a procession of cats. Oh, six or eight of them and they were carrying a little coffin toward a tiny open grave. And on the coffin was an exquisite little golden crown. Now, isn't that the strangest thing? Silence. The guests looked at me as though I were quite mad. That is, all except Thibault and Vivranca. Thibault looked at me, the end of his tail flicking above the edge of the table, and Vivranca looked at Thibault, the way she had that night at the concert, tense, breathless, her eyes blue flame. At last, Aunt Emily spoke. Well, Tommy, are you quite finished? Uh, yes, Aunt Emily, that's, that's all I had to say. I should hope so. Well, that summer, when the Duke and Duchess... Excuse me, out... Mrs. Calverine. Oh, of course, maestro. Tommy, you are quite positive of what you saw this evening? Oh, yes. Yes, you don't go around making up things like that. No, of course not. Yet one must be sure of the details. Now, there was a crown on the coffin, you say? That's right. A golden crown? Yes. With tiny pearls on it? That's right. You're absolutely sure? Absolutely. Then I am king of the cats! He leapt to his feet from his chair to the table and in one bound disappeared through the open French window. And an instant later, Vivanka followed. As she disappeared from the balcony to the alley below, I caught just a glimpse of something protruding beneath her silken sheathed skirt. It was a black-tipped, golden tail. And that's why I have become an ailerophobe. A cat hater. So is my wife, Gretchen. Uh, we were married shortly afterwards. But then Gretchen never did like cats in the first place. Especially Siamese cats. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented The King of the Cats by Stephen Vincent Benet, with Byron Kane as Tommy. Music arranged and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Included in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Helen Cleed, Peggy Weber, Joe Kearns, and Jay Novello. Next week, from New York, the workshop will present a psychological study of the do-it-yourself movement, The Day the Roof Fell In, by Charles S. Monroe. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, follows over most of these stations with the chilling story of the man who stole the Bible. For a half hour of breathless terror, stay tuned to this frequency. You won't regret it. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Transcribed. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, and its 217 affiliated stations presents the CBS Radio Workshop.
radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, from Hollywood, a graphic and dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm, from the famous book by George Stewart, adapted and directed by William N. Robeson, with William Conrad as narrator. Steadily, the great sphere of the earth spun upon its axis and moved in its unvarying course around the sun. From far off Venus, a watcher of the skies, if such a one can be imagined to exist, viewed it as a more brilliant planet than any to be seen by us Earthmen. It gave no sign that storms or men disturbed its tranquil round. Bright against the black of midnight, or yellow in the dawn, the earth hung in the sky, unflickering and serene. San Francisco Weather Bureau. Prayer tonight and Wednesday, no change in temperature. Moderate northwest winds. You're welcome. The same forecast, day after day, week after week. The junior meteorologists wanted to yell blizzards, thunder, lightning, and hurricanes. But as long as that high-pressure area hung off the coast, it would be the same. Fair tonight and tomorrow, no change in temperature. Now, this wasn't weather, it was a bore. And nothing on this morning's weather map could change it. Oh, there were storms, plenty of them, but always somewhere else. Sylvia, an old friend, was now over Boston, dumping a heavy fall of snow before she swept on across the Atlantic. Felicia, poor thing, wasn't doing too well. By all indications, she would die in the fastnesses of the Northwest Territory. But Cornelia... Ah, the junior meteorologist was proud of Cornelia. A big, full-bodied dowager of a storm. 400 miles at sea, southeast of Dutch Harbor. He'd known all of them since birth, days ago in the far western reaches of the Pacific. And it was his private pleasure to give them names. His eyes swept across the map down the arc of the Aleutians and the islands of Japan. And then he saw something he hadn't noticed before. A ship halfway between the weather stations of Haridayashima and Titijima had reported a barometric pressure of 1011. Yet by its position, it should have been 1012. The temperatures of the ship and the weather station showed too wide a divergence. The wind forces and the directions were at variance. Cold air from the tundras of Siberia had met warm air from the coral atolls of the Southern Ocean. So he rerouted a section of the 1012 isobar, drew a little ellipse like a football around the figure 1011. Mariah. This one shall be Mariah. <laughs> A proud city, San Francisco, set upon hills, pearl gray in the winter sun, swept clean of smoke and dust by the steady wind from the sea. A city of towers and banners standing up stiff in the northwest wind. In the streets of the city, women clutched at their skirts and men at their hats in the invigorating sun-filled breeze. And they greeted each other with sparkling smiles. Great weather we're having. Puts life in a fella. But out in the country, there was a drop in the vast central valley. The grain and the grasses curled by drops ceased growing. And the well-to-do cattlemen ordered cottonseed meal at the Fresno Mills. And in Tehama County, a not-so-well-to-do cattleman received a polite but firm letter from his bank. And an hour later, in the barn, they found his body hanging. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Is the map ready? Almost, sir. 
The last reports are just coming in over the teletype. Uh-huh. Nice little storm developing there west of Japan. You mean Mariah? Uh, oh. oh. You, you know, named them, too. I well, just to myself, sir. It must be nice to be new to the game. I used to do it when I first came to work here. Oh, you did? Yes, I called them mostly after heroes I'd read about in history books, Hannibal and so forth. I remember General Lee... Developed into a terror, but Genghis Khan is a fizzle. Well, I've been using girls' names ending in IA, but I'm nearly running out. There's Felicia over Hudson's Bay, and Cornelia's still doing fine in the Gulf of Alaska. Where'd this Mariah come from? Incipient. Day before yesterday, north of Chitajima. She'll be watching. You know the old saying. What's that, sir? The Chinaman sneezing in Shenzhen may set men to shoveling snow in New York City. Did bear watching. Half as large as the United States, she rolled across the Pacific at a thousand miles a day. Yet nowhere did she touch land. So vast and empty is the great ocean between the Aleutians and Midway Island. All over the top of the world rested unbroken darkness like a cat. Through that polar night, the flow of heat into outer space was like a steady drain of blood from an open wound. As the air thus grew colder and colder, it shrank toward the surface of the earth. Upon every square mile of snow-covered land and frozen sea, the air weighed more heavily with the passing of each sunless hour. Hey, Chief, look at the report from Copper Mine this morning. What about it? 1032. Up nine millibars from yesterday. And Fort Norman, 1035. That polar air mass is going to break out in Canada. Mm, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, there's no place else for it to go. And when it does, Mariah won't follow Cornelia and Felicia and the others into the Gulf of Alaska. She'll keep coming straight for the coast. Chief, it's rain in 48 hours and plenty of it. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, Chief. I guess I got carried away. That's understandable. You haven't seen as many storms come across this map as I have. No, sir. But don't go throwing around any 48-hour guesses. Storms are hussy, at least in this part of the world. I've known lots of them. Uh, storms, that is. You can't trust them 12 hours out of your sight. San Francisco, where are you? Hello. Uh, let me speak to somebody in authority, please. This is the chief forecaster speaking. Uh, this is Brownington Steamship Company. We got a ship in trouble. She just sent out an SOS. The Eureka related to us. Uh, what's the weather like out there? Can you give me her position? Uh, not exactly. The Eureka said she was six hours away. What ship is it? Uh, the Byzantium. In that case, we have it. She made a weather report two hours ago. She must have been all right then. Just a minute, let me check. Well, for heaven's sakes, hurry. It's mostly a local crew. They've got wives and families in the Bay Area. We've got to notify them. I understand. Uh, here we are. From the Byzantium reported, she had a nine-point wind. That'll be about 50 miles an hour. But it's going to get worse. In an hour, it'll be blowing a whole gale, 60 miles an hour anyway. For another hour, it'll be even worse than that, with gusts up to 70. It's a hurricane, then, a, a typhoon. Well, uh, look here. There's no sense in panicking. It's not a hurricane. It's not a typhoon. It's a storm, a very big storm. Make that clear to your people and to the newspapers. The Byzantium will be through the worst of it in the next two hours. After that, it'll fall off. But there'll be lots of wind for 12 hours and a heavy sea after that. I see. Well, isn't there anything you can do about it? I'm afraid not. We report the weather. We don't make it. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, son. Sir? Your Mariah's a big girl now. A killer. From the Arctic islands and the ice flows of the Beaufort Sea... The polar air swept southward across the plains at 50 miles an hour, across Alberta and Saskatchewan. By noon, it engulfed Edmonton. Just before the winter sunset, Saskatoon and Calgary. At midnight, it crossed the border and invaded the United States. By daybreak, it had occupied much of Montana and North Dakota and was advancing on Minnesota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. But in San Francisco, the proud banners on the tall towers still streamed southeast in the winter sun. Continued fair today. No change in temperature. 
Got the map filled in, son? Yes, sir. Just finishing. How does it look to you this morning? Well, I said yesterday it'd rain inside 48 hours. I say now it'll rain inside of 24 hours. Pretty sure of that, huh? Positive. Yeah, uh, let me have a look. Uh-huh. Bill Mariah's come a long way in five days. Yes, sir. Look at that cold front east of the Rockies, right out of Canada. Just as I forecast. Did you forecast this, too? Hmm? What's that, sir? Part of your cold front slipped west across Alaska. Far south of Seattle. Well, uh, no, sir. I, I didn't expect that. Care to forecast the possibility of it continuing south? Well, sir, my guess is that Mariah will get here before it does. Man, in this game, you can't afford to guess. There are a lot of factors on this map that argue against rain. There's this cold front. There's the Pacific High. Still has well, been for weeks. Oh, there's Mariah, and nothing's going to stop her. Chief. Yes, Chief. Whitey. Chronicles on the wire. They want the forecast. Tell them I'll have it for them in ten minutes. You see, son, it's up to me. If I say that one word, rain, the weather forecast won't be in a box at the bottom of the front page. It'll be in boxcar letters in the headlines. That single word will be the biggest news story in California. Thousands of people will change their plans because of it. Hundreds of businesses and industries will adjust to it. And if it doesn't rain... But it's going to. It has to. Would you like to take the responsibility of guaranteeing it? Uh, but, but, sir... On the other hand, if I forecast fair and it rain, that mistake might mean millions of dollars lost and the illness and the death. The more people than a man likes to think about. Yes, sir. Of course, it's possible that the Pacific High will hold, and it's possible that the polar air will get here before Mariah does. Uh, but, but it's not probable. And we must forecast probable, not possible, rather. Whitey, yes, get on the phone and order up storm warnings on the coast from Point Arena to Northhead. Yes, you, son, call the Chronicle and tell them we'll have the complete forecast in five minutes, but tell them to set the headlines and get ready. It's rain. <laughs> Rain. The load dispatcher of power and light was ready for the electric heaters that would be turned on against the chill and the lights that would burn later in the morning and earlier in the evening. Somewhere in his maze of high and low voltage wires, his powerhouses and his dams, there would be trouble. But he was ready. Rain. The plant superintendent of the telephone company sent some extra men up along US 40 in case things went bad on the pass. Rain. The general manager of the railroad dispatched the assistant divisional engineer and the chief trainmaster to Immigrant Gap and Norton to take charge of track clearance on the pass. For rain on the coast, rain in the valley, rain in the motherload, meant snow on the pass. The Pass, one of the five great gateways to California. The first covered wagons crossed the pass in 1844 from the high plateau of Nevada to the gravid valley of the Sacramento, where yet unsuspected gold lay in the sands of foothill streams. 500 wagons crossed in 46, crossed safely. All but the last, the Donner Party. The snow caught them. And the horror of their story has imprinted their name upon the pass. And brewed still over peak and canyon like a legend of Greek tragedy. But today, gleaming streamliners glide between the snowy crags with 20th century ease. The transcontinental telephone carries chit-chat and the closing of deals. The word of birth and death. And the jokes and tunes of radio through the high canyons and over the summits. The great steel towers of the power and light high line cut their wide path through the large pole pines and the tamaracks as they march with metal feet across the mountain. And feeling its way more subtly, following the contours of the convoluted land, is U.S. Highway 40, the all-weather road across the Sierras. One of the five great mountain gateways to California. Far out at sea, the crippled freighter Byzantium, her rudder jury rigged, made for Honolulu and repairs under a sunny sky. 
She had ridden out the storm, but she had lost her first officer overboard. Mariah was indeed the killer. And she announced her coming with a wave of pain. As she moved steadily shoreward, old lumberjack joints grown stiff in the dripping of redwood forests, twinged and throbbed. From Cape Disappointment to Point Arguello, overworked mothers winced with headaches. Nerve ends of leg stumps tingled. Old wounds of the Argonne and Guadalcanal ached again. In a moving belt 150 miles before the rain, renewed torches prevailed in the hurt and maimed limbs of men. <laughs> First, so fine was the rain, it was as if the low-lying mist had merely swooped a little lower. And then for a moment, it was gone. But it came again. And it, by minute, unhurrying, the rain grew thicker and more steady. East, east beyond the Sierras and the Rockies... The river of polar air swept on. Behind it, the snow-plastered houses of Cincinnati and Louisville. The quick frozen ponds of the Ozarks. In Abilene and Fort Worth and Dallas, they felt it now. And men battling their way along gale-swept streets reminded themselves... Between Texas and the North Pole, the only windbreak is a barbed wire fence. Rain will not harm a high-tension line. Snow will build up on it and then fall away of its own weight and bulk. But ice... At the 3,000-foot level in the Sierra, the morning after the storm broke, neither rain nor snow fell from the turgid clouds, but sleet, sheathing the trees in bizarre robes of ice, coating the wires of the power and light 60-kilovolt line until they were a half-inch thick... An inch, two inches, until the weight became more than copper cable could bear. San Francisco load dispatcher. This is Ringo, substation operator. The French fire 60 kilovolt line just went out. Don't say just. When did it go? 902. I'm replacing it from Two Rivers and Buckskin Dam. Thank you. The load dispatcher looked at his desk clock and noted with satisfaction that it was a little past 9.03. I know I'm seeing it, but I just can't believe it. What's that, sir? For this morning's map. It just isn't supposed to look like this. Storms should move from west to east between the high-pressure areas of the pole and the Tropic of Cancer. They do, in the textbooks. But it looks like El Mariah's trap. Well, that's what I mean, sir. Trap between that polar breakthrough over the plains and the one that came in over Alaska. Why, it could go on raining for days. And very well might. This is the miracle of electronics. This is the multiplex telephone cable, carrying two or three radio programs, half a dozen personal conversations, and several teletype messages. Six of these cables cross the Donner Pass, strung from pole to telephone pole. The central transcontinental lead between San Francisco and the East. <laughs> In 1579, the same year Sir Francis Drake landed on the coast of California, a cedar sapling sprouted on the lip of a ravine far up in the Sierra Nevada. It was, however, somewhat insecurely rooted, and in 1789, a half century before the first immigrant let his wagons down the canyon walls with ropes, a windstorm toppled it. Its trunk has lain athwart the ravine ever since decaying but little in the high, dry mountain air. But last fall, 
A chipmunk burrowing beneath it dislodged a pound or so of gravel and thus disturbed its delicate and ancient balance. And the weight of Mariah's snow finished the job. Now the log begins to roll, slides sideways, upends and drops over the canyon's edge. A hundred feet below, it strikes squarely among the cross arms of pole 1-243-76 of the Central Transcontinental League. Operator? Hello, operator. This is the operator. I've just been cut off from New York. I'm sorry, sir. The sorry's not enough. What's the matter with you people? Hold the line, sir. A company as big as yours, you'd think they'd give better service. Absolutely ridiculous. This is an important Here's your party, sir. I'm sorry for the delay. Yeah, you should be. Hello, Harry. Yeah. What happened? Who knows? Well, anyway, let's pick it up where we were before. You can't pick it up exactly where you were before, sir. Before, you were talking from San Francisco via Salt Lake, Denver, and Chicago. Now you are talking to New York through Los Angeles, Oklahoma, and St. Louis. Over one of the alternate circuits which had been previously set up by a telephone company traffic superintendent who knew what a storm could do on the Donner Pass. <laughs> You were right, Chief. Huh? Look at this morning's map. That polar air that broke through over the plains finally made it across Mexico. It's out in the Pacific now. Uh-huh. Joining up with Mariah. That'll be the death of her. But she'll give us trouble tonight. How's that? That old polar air mass is only a few hundred miles wide, but she's cold and dry below and warm and moist on top. When she hits Mariah, she'll blow her into bits. Cloudburst, hail and snow, thunder, lightning, damnation. Tonight will be the night. U.S. Highway 40 was still open, but only because the road superintendent and his crew had pushed the flangers and the rotaries around the clock for nearly 72 hours. Now the snow was thicker than ever. And the superintendent standing at the doorway of the maintenance station garage was tired. Bone tired. A heavily pounding truck came up great from the west. A sedan, its headlights clawing the swirling snow, followed. And a few moments later, another. And then something began to bother the super. Something vague. And then he realized what it was. Wally. You? Let's get out on the road. What's up? She's blocked somewhere down the pass. Nothing's coming through from the east. She was blocked, all right. At Windy Point, a big truck and trailer was jackknifed across the road. And the drifts were already piling up. Four cars were lined up great, their motors running. Idiots. Motor's idling, window's closed to keep warm. Wally, tell them to open up before they suffocate. You, I'll take the downgrade side. Anybody hurt here? Nobody hurt but this truck. Never mind the truck. You ran past the chain warnings yourself. If you'd had chains on, you wouldn't be stuck in that drift. Yeah, but look, hey, what am I going to throw? I can't... Hey, anybody in there? Oh, no. Hey, you. Call me. Yeah, you. Where are the people from this car? Oh, them? Yeah, what happened to them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, old dame and a guy. She was sort of hysterical. She yelled something about we'd all get snowed in and froze like somebody named Donna. Then they start off down the road walking. Hey, you think maybe we ought to start walking like she said, huh? No, you stay where you are. We'll get you out of this. When did they leave? About five minutes ago. And that's long enough. Hey, what's the matter up ahead? Road's blocked. You see a couple of people walking down grade? Yes, we wonder. You got chains? Sure, I always got chains. I'm from Colorado. Good, then you must know mountains. Now listen to me, Jack. I'm the road superintendent here. We aren't going to be able to clear the road for a while. Why don't you swing around while you still can go on back down grade after those two people? Well, now, I don't know. Well, I'll save a couple of lives. Why, of course we will. There's a joint down at the bottom of the pass where you can get them some coffee. We'll let you know when the road's clear. Well... Sure thing. Uh, glad to help. Thanks a lot. You better get going. One of my rotaries is coming up behind you. I had no idea you got so much snow out there. Yeah, well, way. we get enough. Shut the window, Emily, and let's get out of here. 
Hey, Steve. Hey, Peterson. Give me a lift. Hi, boss. What you doing down here? I'll tell you later. Raise the plow, Steve, and get me up the road as fast as you can. Radio hot. There's that pistol. Well, let's go. KRDM4. KRDO1. KRDM4 calling KRDO1. KRDO1 standing by for KRDM4. Hank, get this. Fault all eastbound cars at the summit. Phone the boys at the lake to stop all westbound cars at the gates. Contact the highway patrol and tell them there's a block at Windy Point. Get a couple of men off the day shift and send them down with a push plow and flanger. We're going to lose the road if we don't work fast. To lose the road was to lose his honor. But that night, as Mariah thrashed across the Sierra in her death throes, the superintendent once more held the road. Once more, the storm gave out before his machines did, or his men. Once more, there would come a time and a storm, he reminded himself, when they might not. San Francisco Weather Bureau. Prepare today and tomorrow. Moderate northwest winds. Slightly cooler. You're welcome. The junior meteorologist turned back to his map. Filling in reports from land stations across half the world. And ships spun out upon the great ocean. But soon he let his eyes wander down the Kuril Islands and across the Sea of Japan, where surely a new wave should be forming, a wave which might develop into another great storm, like Mariah. But now, no ship happened to be at the proper location to tell him about it. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Storm by George Stewart, adapted and directed by William N. Robeson, with William Conrad as narrator. Featured in the cast were Helene Burke, Chet Stratton, Herb Butterfield, Byron Kane, Harry Bartell, Tony Barrett, Barney Phillips, Frank Gerstle, and Jack Crucian. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. The workshop is produced by William Frug. This is ChestertonRadio.com. For almost two centuries, Americans have enjoyed the valuable privileges of freedom. Now, freedom needs each American to dedicate himself to its preservation. We must not allow our liberties to be endangered by neglect of our duties as citizens. During this year of rededication, join with your fellow Americans in reaffirming the principles on which this country is founded and the safeguarding of those principles. Make it your business to see that federal, state, and local governments are conducted honestly. Help to maintain the good morale of your sons and daughters in the armed forces. Learn the facts about all candidates and issues. Then, vote for the one you believe in. Make the most of every minute on your job. Produce as much as you can, and thus increase our military and economic strength. Work for better schools and a better community. Guard your American heritage of freedom. It needs you. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. There is such a house in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., 
And this year, as every four years, for more than a century and a half, men are contending for its occupancy, the highest honor that can be bestowed upon an American by his countrymen. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, the biography of that graceful yet indestructible symbol of our nation, the White House. Home of our presidents at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. Narrated by CBS News correspondent, Alan Jackson. In the beginning, there was a little more than a swamp by the river's edge, with a few hills rising here and there. But the country was new, and swamps did not scare it. Besides, it was an ideal location, just far enough in the so-called south to please the southern half of the new nation, and close enough to the north to satisfy that section as well. So, on one of the low hills bordering the Potomac and Anacostia rivers, our ancestors began to build a new capital. And on the next hill, not much more than a mile away, they built a house of lasting grace to serve as residence for their chief executives, the presidents of the new United States of America. General Washington, the first president, personally picked the site for the house in which he himself was destined never to live. The first occupant of the house was a stern man whose New England ancestors had weathered many storms in war and in peace. He was the second president of our new nation, and he moved into the house late in his single four-year term. His name was John Adams. And when John Adams first passed through the entrance of the still unfinished building, he uttered a prayer, the sense of which he put down in a letter to his wife, Abigail. John Adams' prayer was ultimately carved over the fireplace in the state dining room by order of the one occupant of the house, who has perhaps caused more debate than any other, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so it may be read today. I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and on all that shall hereinafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Executive Mansion, or the President's House, is what it became in the minds of the American people. And more than 100 years after John Adams became the first occupant, another president named Roosevelt, Theodore in this case, set a precedent by having his stationery engraved with the words, The White House. The name, at first unofficial, originated with one of the many misadventures which have befallen the house during the 150-odd years of its life. In August 1814, British soldiers set the structure afire, ruining the interior and blackening the sandstone outer walls. When the house was reconstructed, a coat of white paint was applied to the exterior to cover the damage caused by smoke and flame, giving rise to the name by which we know the building today, the White House. The British attack took place during the presidency of James Madison, whose universally admired and attractive wife was the famed Dolly. The British troopers and Marines came under Cockburn and Ross up from the river closer and closer to the house and to the president's wife, Dolly Madison. I am Dolly Madison. There are stories about me that I tucked the original copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution into my bodice just before I ran from the burning house. That I hacked the portrait of General Washington out of its frame and carried it off with the British at my heels. And, not least of all, that my husband was a coward and had left me alone when the British came. They are not true. And they were not true. The documents were taken off safely by clerks from the Department of State. The painting of Washington that had been painted by Stewart was carried to safety by two gentlemen from New York. And James Madison was with his troops at Bladensburg, where he should have been, and was later joined by his wife. 
And so the house was burned, later to be rebuilt and become what is probably one of the best-loved structures in the world. But what was it like in the beginning, when John Adams and his wife Abigail arrived? The city of Washington at that time had a population of just 3,210 and the nation of just 5 million. There were no bathrooms, of course, and... Cold. It's so cold, John, and so damp, so terribly damp. It's that miserable swamp that surrounds us. I ordered that all the wood we had been able to get should be burned in the fireplaces so as to dry out the plaster before you came. But the damp still oozes from this confounded, porous Virginia freestone in the walls. But we'll need to keep all of 13 fires going, even with so few chambers finished or furnished. There's no wood to be had, Abby. Could we not use coals? We have a small supply, but I have not been able to get grates made for the fireplaces. John, do you know that there is no place, no place at all to dry clothes? Uh, You'll just have to make do somehow, Abby. This is a wild new country we've come to. Oh, I'll manage. I'll just use the great audience chamber to hang our wash in. But it isn't these, these small inconveniences that worry me. What is it, then? It's you, John. Never have I seen you so disconsolate, so woebegone. And it's not the ague from the walls that makes you so. No, it's not. I suffer from a dampness of the soul. John, what a strange remark. I don't think I have ever known you to be sorry for yourself before. Not out loud. I'm not sorry for myself. But I never asked for this thankless task. I never sought the presidency. John. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've been ambitious in my mind, but not in my heart. With all my heart and soul at this moment, I wish we were back in Milton or in Brattle Street or on the Braintree Farm. Let Mr. Jefferson have this, this cave of the winds. Mr. Jefferson... Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, did become the next occupant of the house, bad heating and all. Jefferson, however, collaborated in plans for various additions to the house, most importantly for columned porticos, softening the somewhat severe aspects of the building from the north and the south. And his official dinners were renowned for their good food and wines and the good conversation that went with them. The insatiably curious president, in fact, not only sparked some memorable intellectual exchanges himself, but he also substituted round or oval dining tables for the customary rectangles, so that all his guests could more easily observe each other, thus encouraging the freest exchanges of intimate opinions, thereby eliminating those delicate points of diplomatic precedence, which he believed were out of place in a democracy. I still say that if the British were to support us... It seems that trifles do become giants in the mouths of Americans. There can be no more piracy, sir. The United States will not stand for it. Well, sir, as to slavery, we know that certain European countries... Purchasing Louisiana, in my opinion, is a mean and degrading mode of acquiring territory. Mr. Ambassador, you won't believe this, but when I left Virginia to take up my post in France, I had two bushels of ripe pears sold in bags... And when I returned six years later, they were in perfect condition. They'd candied themselves. <laughs> Mr. President, you will excuse us. Will the ladies please join me? The gentlemen will follow later. That was Dolly Madison wife of James Madison, who at that time was a member of Jefferson's cabinet. Dolly was a borrowed hostess for the Jefferson's formal dinners, for when Jefferson moved into the White House, he was a widower. After Jefferson served two terms, James Madison, his distinguished Secretary of State, succeeded him, and Dolly Madison became First Lady of the Land. Following Madison, James Monroe occupied the house, Monroe to whom we owe the Monroe Doctrine, which has become a keystone of our foreign policy. Of his wife, Virginia Courtright Monroe, it was said that she was often frail and had to keep herself secluded in one of the bed or drawing rooms on the second floor, among which were the Rose Room, the Northeast Corner Bedroom, the Northwest Corner Bedroom, 
the southwest corner drawing room, and the bedroom west of the book storage room. None of this, however, kept Mrs. Monroe from being one of the liveliest hostesses the house was ever to know. John Quincy Adams came next. He was the son of the John Adams who had been the original occupant of the house. John Quincy soon became known as the learned Yankee. He is said to have treated his guest at the house to disquisitions on poetry, music, painting, and sculpture, all, as the old books say, of rare excellence and untiring interest. Then a new kind of storm arose, a storm of votes and of voters, mostly out of what was then called the West, that is, the territory beyond the Appalachians. This was a part of their country which the cultured, eastern and southern states, still considered savage. But from it there came a tempest, born of a new consciousness of political power, and a Tennessean on horseback rode to the house in Washington in its wake. He was Andrew Jackson, and the house was destined to shake to a new rhythm as old Hickory and his friends entered the house. Perfectly disgusting. It reminds me of the days of the French Revolution. I say, do you notice that woman, that huge monstrosity? Why, she's actually wiping her hands on the window bridge. What was that? A chair, I fancy. The chairs are much too small for these bears to sit in. Have you seen the new president? What's that? I said, have you seen General Jackson? Only on his horse, out on the avenue. He looked like a ghost. They say he has never recovered from the death of his wife. Good heavens! They've broken that beautiful French sofa. Well, the breaking of that sofa does seem to have quietened the mob a bit. Gap, this sort of thing would never do with us. Never. I don't suppose it would do in your country, gentlemen, but I find it a rather pleasing spectacle. Oh, really? Why, yes. This is the people's house, after all. Let them enjoy it for a day. And who might you be, sir, might I ask? My name is Andrew Jackson. The general? Yes. Yes, I'm the one all this fuss is for. But I am very tired, gentlemen. It is a lonely life. The house was officially declared finished and furnished in 1829, the first year of General Jackson's administration. Still, even five years later, a member of Congress from Massachusetts observed... The receiving room contains nothing but a dilapidated sofa and a battered pine table. The two pieces together are not worth five dollars. There is not even a mirror. The fabled East Room was often used for public receptions, but there also the tables were still of pine and much of the other furniture was unfinished. Jackson, though, bought 20 shining brass spittoons for it. Water for the needs of the household was still caught in cedar wood troughs. It was only in Jackson's fifth year in the house that a pipe was finally laid to bring running water into the residence of the President of the United States. Jackson's successor was Martin Van Buren of New York. Van Buren, we are told, bought a gold dinner service for the house and was defeated in his bid for re-election, at least partly because it was noised around that he was in the habit of tasting French sauces from golden ladles. After Van Buren came Pippi General William Henry Harrison. He died after only 31 days in the house, too soon to leave an impress upon its character. And after Harrison came John Tyler, and after John Tyler came James Knox Polk. It was in Polk's time that gas lighting was installed in the house. Then, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan. And then, a new man and a new party arisen from beyond the mountains, 
From the newly settled, harsh, and hard-living prairie states, the area that we now call our Middle West, came Abraham Lincoln. With Lincoln, there came to the house much of the hurly-burly of family life, both joyous and tragic, which has almost always been a characteristic of this structure, so much abused, so often reconstructed, yet still one of the world's most beautiful homes. Lincoln's occupancy was dominated at all times by that most critical event, the war between the states. It began almost before he had had a chance to hang his best broadcloth coat in a White House closet and ended only a few days before his own life did, terminated by an assassin's bullet in a Washington theater not much more than a mile from the house. An awareness of the tragic war that was ravaging the country, north and south, was, of course, forever present in the house during Lincoln's time. It penetrated even to the children's quarters. The two young Lincoln boys, Tad and Willie, often played with two other children whose home was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and whose last name was Taft. One of these children, in fact, the one called William Howard, himself became president of the United States about 50 years later. There was a day when the four children made a doll out of some rags and old clothes and named it Jack. I think he should be shot at sunrise. What for? Sleeping on sentry duty. But you can't... A soldier in missing his duty must be punished. But Jack didn't do it. Not really. Let's ask the gardener here. Uh, I'll tell you, this is a pretty serious business. I don't believe anybody except the president could figure that one. The president? But my father... I mean, the president, well, he's busy with the war. Well, it seems to me that this here difference of opinion, you might say, it's got plenty to do with the war. Now, I got to see the president anyhow, so I reckon I'll ask him. The gardener did go to the president and returned with the following message. I seen the president, boys, and here's what he says. Now, look here, I'll, I'll read it to you. The doll Jack is pardoned by order of the president, A. Lincoln. It was not long after this incident that young Willie went out riding on his pony in a chilly rain. A few hours later, he fell sick of the fever, as Washington wives and mothers then called it. They blamed Washington's swampy origins for it and the deadly miasmas which were supposed to arise from the marshy shores of the Potomac and Anacostia Creek. Or sometimes they blamed the abundant insect life of the capital. We now know that the main cause of Washington's dreaded fevers was its unpurified water supply, a ready-made carrier for typhoid. Willie's illness occurred when he was only 11. It came during a particularly critical time in the war. Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, a Negro housekeeper in the Lincoln household, worked day and night to save the boy. His parents did all they could. How is he? His forehead feels hotter, sir. My boy. Mr. President. Mr. Nicolay? It's the Secretary of War, Mr. Stanton, sir. He asks you to join him at the telegraph office at once. A dispatch from General McClellan. Tell Mr. Stanton to... Tell Mr. Stanton I shall join him within the hour... You see, Mr. Nicolay, my young son has just died. I must see him first. But even tragedies do end sometime. On April 2nd, 1865, President Lincoln drafted this memorandum. Lieutenant General Ulysses Grant, 
at Appomattox, allow me to tender you and all with you the nation's grateful thanks. At your kind suggestion, I think I will visit you tomorrow. A. Lincoln. It was Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt who once said that if the White House was really haunted, it must be haunted by the shade of Abraham Lincoln. But there have been many other men who have paced the floors and carpetings of a house at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Paced the floor in the executive offices, which were originally located on the second floor of the house itself, but later moved to a specially built wing attached to the west facade. Or between the executive office and the library or the map room, or at night, walking up and down the second floor corridor, past the doors to the family bedrooms, thinking, planning, and making decisions. Andrew Johnson, who bought Alaska for the nation. General Ulysses S. Grant, the man who had won the war. Rutherford Hayes of Ohio, who labored hard to strengthen the federal civil service. James Garfield, who was shot less than four months after taking office in 1881, the same year that the first elevator was installed in the house. Chester Arthur, an attorney, interested in civil rights and the man who ordered a silver ceiling for the east room of the house designed by Tiffany of New York. And Grover Cleveland, the only man ever to occupy the house for two non-continuous four-year periods. The first president ever to be married in the house. Do you, Grover Cleveland, take this woman, Clara Folsom, to be your lawful wedded wife, to keep and to cherish? My dears, I wish you could see the bridal gown. It's of heavy, oh, very heavy ivory satin with a high, plain corsage, elbow sleeves, and a very long train. It's a standalone ivory suit. These are the footsteps of men of terrible responsibility, men who gave themselves to their country, men who in passing have left their imprint in the house of the presidents. Benjamin Harrison, during whose tenancy, electric lighting was installed. William McKinley, who on September 6th, 1901, was fatally wounded by an assassin's bullet. Theodore Roosevelt, the hero of San Juan, who attended to his house by fireproofing the first floor and building a new roof for the third. William Howard Taft, who had played with Lincoln's boys nearly 50 years before. Those are the footsteps that could be heard as President Wilson walked in the so-called Lincoln study on an evening in the spring of 1917. Good evening, Colonel House. Good evening, Mr. President. So, I... I've heard that you've made up your mind, sir. I have, Colonel. I shall ask Congress tomorrow to recognize that a state of war exists with Germany, my friend. Let me read to you a part of the message I shall deliver to Congress tomorrow. It is a fearful thing to lead this great, peaceful people into war. But the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things we have always carried nearest our hearts and fortunes. With the pride of those who know that the day has come when America is privileged to spend her blood and might for the principles that gave her birth and happiness and the peace which she has treasured. God helping her, she can do no other. There have been six occupants of the house at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue since Woodrow Wilson. These are still too close to us for words without partisanship, whether that of pride or that of anger. 
Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman were five of these. And during their time, the house was faltering in all its joints, slipping sidewise and bottomwise into the old district swamp. Plaster crumbled, ceilings cracked, and a piano belonging to President Truman's daughter, Margaret, once threatened to fall through the second floor. In 1948, a long overdue reconstruction was undertaken at a cost of nearly $6 million and was completed in 1952. And in January of 1953, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th president, entered the house. The house that, according to experts, is now secure for the foreseeable future. On Tuesday, the people will decide who is to live in the house for the next four years. Who is to make the difficult decisions to lead our country during the fateful years ahead? I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and on all who shall hereinafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof, and may it be so forever, and may no one ever betray the trust. This is Alan Jackson. A big job awaits the man who will reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue during the four years just ahead. On Tuesday next, be sure to vote for the candidate of your choice. And remember, as soon as you have cast your ballot, those of us who make up CBS Radio's team of CBS News correspondents, aided by the mathematical wizardry of the famous Univac machine, will be on the job reporting the election story just as quickly as it develops. You have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the story of the White House, written by George H. Faulkner, with music arranged and conducted by Charles Paul, narrated by CBS News correspondent Alan Jackson, and produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. This is Bob Height reminding you that from now on, the CBS Radio Workshop will be heard on a new day and at a new time over most of these same stations. For the highly imaginative productions of the CBS Radio Workshop, tune in every Sunday afternoon here at the Star's Address. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Penny, for those thoughts. Oh, I was thinking I'm glad we're going home, Roger. I hope this summer has given us both ample time to think this thing out. Well, actually, darling, we have too much invested in this marriage. Ten years cannot be dispelled by one summer. Uh, well, that isn't exactly what I meant. But... Oh, let's listen to the radio, shall we? I hope we've had an end to this sulking and... What was that, Roger? Felt like we hit something. Nonsense, I ran off the road. Oh, Roger, please, slow down. <coughs> Roger, listen. Sounds like a woman screaming. Oh, please, please, let's go back. I'm sure you've hit something. I didn't hear anything, Kay. I'm sure we didn't hit anything. This is the CBS Radio Workshop, the theater of the mind dedicated to man's imagination. Our story, Grief Drives a Black Sedan, stars Alice Frost and Lee Vines, written, produced, and directed by D. Engelbach. Black 
Relax the dad. Pull over. Roger, we should have gone back. Okay, none of your hysterics now. Please, we... I'm sure we must... Oh, just be quiet. You realize how fast you were going? Yes, officer. I was going 40 miles an hour, and that doesn't really seem like an excessive amount of speed to me. It is in a 25-mile zone. Although you can't see it from the road, this area is quite thickly populated. There are always children about. I see a driver's license. Hey, Tom. Mm. Look here a moment. Okay. Roger, do you Shut think up, we Kay. really... Shut up, Kay. There's nothing these state police would rather do than to stop a car with a New York state license. And I was only going 40 miles an hour. I'm afraid and... it's more serious than that. More serious than what? Move over, please. Say, what's all this about? I'm taking you to the police barracks in Westport. What have we done, officer? That's for you to tell me, madam. You see, your front left fender is dented. Is that a crime in this state? We'll have to find out. You see, around that dent is blood. <sighs> Captain, I'd like to see you in his office. May I come along, Roger? No, darling, you stay out of this. I'll find out what this is all about. Roger, remember... Stay out of this. I'll be back in a moment. Sit down, please. You are Roger Wickens, 25 Park Plaza Road, New York City? Yes, I am. What's this all about? I'm returning your driver's license and your car registration. We've checked the New York police. You've not had any previous accident record. What happened tonight, Mr. Wickens? What do you mean, what happened? I drove up here from New York City to take my wife home. She's been summering up here, and that's all there is to it. And I want you to stop treating me like a criminal. I was driving down Cross Highway when the police stopped me for driving 40 miles an hour. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Well, keep checking. Check every hospital within 25 miles. When you finish that, check all the doctor's residents in the vicinity. Send someone to retrace Cross Highway. Yes. Well, I think you'll find somewhere... Not too far from where the Wiccan's car was stopped, some blood stains and uh, possible pieces of glass. Report back as soon as possible. Yes, who? Oh, Doc's out there. We'll send him in. Captain, what about this? Are we under arrest? Well, there are two ways we can do this. We can technically arrest you for driving 40 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone. Or of your own volition, you can wait until all these things check out. Look, I think you're in trouble. I think you've hit somebody and run away from the accident. Of all the stupid things that I've ever heard of, I've... Hello. Hello, Captain. Okay, what is it? Oh, excuse me. Hello, Doc. Well, what will it be, Mr. Wickens? I'll wait. What about my wife? Well, she'd better wait, too. He seems rather touchy. Yeah. Hmm. Doc, why don't you take some blood samples, run them through the lab, report back to me as soon as you can. I believe this is a case of hit and run. I want to have all my facts. Another no-cooperation guy, huh? That's right, Doc. They never learn, do they? Cigarette? Uh, thanks, Tony. Roger, did you tell them? Tell them what? Oh, please, darling. Remember when we ran off the road, I told you I thought I heard a woman scream. Kay, I did not hear a woman scream, and I did not hit anything. Huh? This is all a fantastic nightmare. It seems it started when you came up here. 
there was no reason for all of this. We should have gone to Europe this summer and behaved like two mature people. Ten years of marriage, and we're still trying to figure out whether or not it will work. It's not going to work, Roger. I believe this was all for a reason tonight. I believe we're both in trouble. Nonsense. Roger, we must share that responsibility. Oh, for heaven's sake, Kay, what responsibility? The blood on the fender. Hello. Yes. You found what? Where? Babery Lane. Uh, let me get this down now. Babery Lane and Cross Highway. Yeah, yeah, but regular Sherlock Holmes. How'd I know what? I never mind about that. No one at the house, huh? Will you stay there? Keep calling in. No, Doc's still working. There's nothing to report here. Wickens denies everything. Okay, stay with it. Right. You want me to send out for some coffee? Oh, no, thank you. Well, it's past midnight. Eddie and Joanne said they would wait at the Maroc until one. What a wonderful homecoming party this turned out to be. Well, you win the superficiality award for the year. Eddie and Joanne, the Maroc, the whole stupid, silly pattern. Roger, don't you realize you may have killed someone tonight? Okay, let's stop this. This bickering, this hammering at each other. I did not hit anyone tonight. Now, starting with that premise, let's see if we can discuss intelligently our own problems. This is not the time nor the place. Actually, Roger, there is no problem. I'm leaving you. I, I, I don't blame you, Roger. I really don't know whose fault it is. Perhaps it's mine. Oh, no. No, no, it's mine. All I've ever done was given in to every little whim you ever had. Have you, Roger? Oh, oh, yes, you've given me things, money, a beautiful home, and oh, so much loneliness. What good are possessions? Oh, I, I know this sounds trite and, and very cliché, but I'm tired, Roger. We've failed... I, I don't know whose fault it is. I don't know where we really started to grow apart. I just want out. Well, darling, as usual, your timing is superb. I'm up to my neck in trouble because of you. Oh, and... please. No more of the comparisons. No more recriminations. Until we know what's happened here, let's, let's just Wait. 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 Yes, Tom. You did. A signed statement. Feels pretty bad, huh? Yeah, uh, what about the charges? Mine does. Uh, hold it a minute, Tom. Paul, have Doc call me. Uh, yes, Tom, you were saying? Hit about 10 o'clock. Dead, huh? It's too bad. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Doc, drop your test. We have all we want. Okay, Tom, get back here as fast as you can. Right. Paul, bring that Wiggins guy in here. Roger, why don't you ask the captain if they found out anything? Yes, I guess you're right. I will. Mr. Wickens? Yes. Officer, what have you found out? Mr. Wickens, the captain wants to see you. Right. Right. 
ten years. What do you do with ten years? Can you write it off? Can you forget it? Ten years and you look at someone. And that someone you've known for ten years. And you realize. Oh, this night. This, this long night. What have we done? Ten years. Ten whole years. What do you do with memories? Just lock them in a safety deposit box? Or do you tie them up neatly in pink ribbons and burn them? What do you do with plans? Those blueprints for the future? And what do you do with love? The community property of love, split down the middle and shared by no one. Ten years. Ten years. Ten. Sorry, darling, I must have dozed off. Yes, about an hour. Uh, don't be sorry. I needed the time to think. Kay, I must talk to you. Oh, haven't we had enough talk for one night? Just a bit more patience, darling. A cigarette? Roger, for heaven's sake, what's happened? Kay... I must tell you this in my, in my own way. And for whatever love you once had for me, please hear me out. I want you to know... Oh, that Roger, please. I want you to know this is no plea for any kind of sympathy. I know, Kay, why our marriage failed. You see, believe me, this isn't easy. I know I'm a, a coward. Tonight, I... I did hit something. More than that, I... I, I took a life. Right, you know. Please, darling, let, let me finish this. All my life, I've been hitting and... telling myself that I... I didn't hit. All my life... I've been running away. All my life, I've... I've been a coward. Oh, I... I wonder how much I've lost in love, respect, friendship. I wonder how much of myself has been sacrificed so carelessly, so needlessly, because I didn't take time to stop. Go back to pick up that which I... Which I had hit. You see, darling... I guess I've always been driving 40 miles an hour in a 25-mile zone. And the ironical part about this whole thing... Is that the police were not going to arrest me for speeding. But merely warned me to take it easy. I guess... Maybe help of any kind has always made me angry, and truth always hurt my ears. Roger, darling, would you please... I, I know I killed tonight, needlessly, carelessly. And, Kay, I want you to hear this letter the captain just gave me. And I want you to know, darling, that no more do I blame everybody else for my emptiness.
To the man who killed my dog. I hope you were going someplace important when you drove so fast down Cross Highway across Bayberry Lane tonight. I hope that when you got there, the time you saved by speeding meant something to you or somebody else. Maybe we'd feel better if we could imagine that you were a doctor rushing somewhere to deliver a baby or ease somebody's pain. The life of our dog to shorten someone's suffering, that mightn't have been so bad. But even though all we saw of you was the black shadow of your car and its jumping red taillights as you roared down the road, we know too much about you to believe it. You saw the dog. You stepped on your brakes. You felt a thump. You heard a yelp and then my wife's scream. Your reflexes are better than your heart stronger than your courage. We know that. Because you jumped on the gas again and got out of there as fast as your car could carry you. Whoever you are, mister, and whatever you do for a living, we know you are... you are a killer. And in your hands, driving the way you drove tonight, your car is a murder weapon. You didn't bother to look, so I'll tell you what the thump and the yelp were. They were Vicky, a six-months-old basset puppy, white with brown and black markings. An aristocrat with 12 champions among her forebears. But she clowned and she chased and she loved people and kids and other dogs as much as any mongrel on earth. I'm sorry you didn't stick around to see the job you did, though a dog dying by the side of the road isn't a very pretty sight. In less than two seconds, you and that car of yours transformed a living being that had been beautiful, warm, clean, soft, and loving into something dirty, Ugly, broken and bloody. A poor, shocked, and mad thing that tried to sink its teeth into the hand it had nuzzled and licked all its life. I hope to God that when you hit my dog, you had for a moment the sick, dead feeling in the throat and down to the stomach that we've known ever since. And that you feel it whenever you... Think about speeding down a winding country road again. Because the next time some eight-year-old boy might be wobbling along on his first bicycle, or a very little one might wander out past the gate and into the road the moment it takes his father to bend down to pull a weed out of the driveway. The way... My puppy got away from me. Or maybe you'll be real lucky again. And only kill another dog. And break the heart of another family. Signed, Richard Joseph, Westport, Connecticut. Well, Kay, that's it. No charges. No arrest. No. Roger. Oh, darling. Please. Let's go home.
Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of New York, Averill Harriman. Thoughtlessness and irresponsibility go hand in hand and cause far too many tragedies on our highways. The thoughtless driver who ignores traffic regulations, hoping to get away with it, hides behind the idea, no witness, no crime. But too often, this leads down a road of final accounting. Only by constant care, courtesy, and observance of the rules of the road can you be sure of avoiding the day when grief drives your car and brings tragedy to your family or that of another. The streamlined, high-powered automobiles of today demand of us the same intelligence and care in handling that has gone into their design. This weekend and in the future, I appeal to everyone to drive carefully, drive safely, assure a happy holiday for all. You've been listening to the CBS radio workshop, Grief Drives a Black Sedan, written by D. Engelbach. A letter to the man who killed my dog is from the book of the same title, written by Richard Joseph and published by Frederick Fell. Today's cast, Alice Frost, Lee Vines, Ralph Bell, Bill Mason, Larry Haynes, Jay Johnson. Next week from Hollywood, People Are No Good. Ted Pearson speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Well, Dr. Manning, I've done all a surgeon can for him. I mended his ankle, healed his back, straightened his arm, patched his scalp. But now he refuses to leave the hospital. He even refuses to get up out of bed. He just lies there, staring at the ceiling, muttering strange words... Uh, Molly, secretes, vapor vacuums, crawl spaces, and snakes. Snakes? Wire snakes. That's why I called you, Manning. Pete Bolton needs a psychoanalyst. He even claims he was hit by a boat while standing in a concrete driveway. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Today, a psychological examination of the man who forms the backbone of a $12 billion industry, the man in the gray flannel overalls, an account dedicated to those of you who do it yourself. As my colleague, Dr. Forster, had promised, I found Pete Bolton lying flat in bed. The ambulance driver confirmed the fact that Pete claimed his physical injuries, now healed, had arisen from a boat striking him. So help me, Doc, the nearest water for miles around was a fish pond in his backyard. Pete was a clean-cut-looking man in his middle thirties. His smile of greeting was pleasant, but he gripped the sides of his bed tightly as I walked over to him. Mr. Bolton? That's right. I'm Dr. Manning. Dr. Forster suggested that I come and talk with you. Yes? I uh, want to talk to you about those uh, snakes. Snakes? The wire ones. Oh. Oh, those. Well, you better watch out for those, Doc. Better sell that house of yours right now. The house? Well, don't you own a house? A little hideaway, a hunting cabin someplace? Well, I, I do have a retreat for a few of my patients. How long have you had it? Not long. I just took it over. Well, then give it back. Give it back, Doc. <laughs> Because they'll come, Doctor. They'll come. The wire snakes. Someday, a drain will stop up. You won't be able to get a plumber. You'll have to clean out that drain. Just simple things at first. But then you'll go on from there. You'll become one of them. Like I was. A do-it-yourselfer. Then the roof falls in. In the medical journals, I had noted the profession's growing shock at the havoc wrought by the do-it-yourself movement on the human body, the nationwide surge of smashed thumbs, sawed-off fingers, broken legs from falls off roofs and scaffoldings. 
I had noted the insurance company's rising alarm at fires from amateur wiring, floods from amateur plumbing, inadvertent burials from amateur excavations. As I began my talks with Pete Bolton, trying to ascertain what traumatic shock kept him pinned to his bed, I learned about the drives that send the men and women of modern America, some say 40 million of them, to paint, plaster, build, construct, pave, insulate, saw, hammer, and bore holes with an enthusiasm formerly reserved for the flag and mother. When Pete joined this vast army of do-it-yourselfers, he hadn't touched a tool since he took a required course in manual training in the eighth grade. Since his marriage, he had had two promotions at the bank in which he was employed, but he and Helen were still living in their small, rented living room, bedroom, and bath. Pete, have you seen that book of the month? Which month? This month, the book that came today. Oh, what's the name of it? How should I know? I couldn't find the little slip of paper to send back saying we didn't want it. You know, someday we've got to settle down and organize this love nest. You no, know, I never can find a thing anymore. Books piled on top of everything. And guest towels in the trunk down in the storage room. Every time we have a guest, I have to find the superintendent and get a key. We just had an extra shelf or two. Oh, I don't know where we'd put a shelf. Well, we have that little alcove beside the fireplace. Well, if you can pick up a bookcase, it'll fit in there. Pete, that would look horrible. What would? A bookcase stuck in that alcove. Well, there should be shelves built in. Build in, huh? Mm. Okay. Ask the super what they cost. I already have $78. What? Yeah, I knew you'd say that. Well, we're not asking him to build a, a whole new apartment house. Just a couple of shelves. He says carpenters have gone up. Well, let him stay up. I'll do it myself. In most areas of the United States today, the cost of materials for a home, an extra bathroom, or a new electric outlet is one quarter to one third the total cost. The rest goes for labor. Today, the workmen, looking toward social security, guaranteed annual wage, and health benefits, prefers year-round work with the mass housing contractor, the airplane factory, the glamorous fields of radio, television, and electronics. So the handyman, a vanishing American in most communities, knows where he can do better and charges accordingly. But while the high cost of labor may be a factor for the enormous rise of do-it-yourself since World War II, Pete Bolton was to reveal even deeper psychological reasons. Yes, sir? What can we do for you? Oh, I, I want some boards for a shelf. What kind of wood? I got some mahogany. My wife thinks mahogany would look nice. Hmm. How much mahogany do you want? Oh, four or five pieces. Uh, about this wide, about so long. Also, a hammer and some nails. Two, four, six, eight, or ten penny. Clout, wire, galvanized, steel cut. Well, what's that, Esperanto? Ways of ordering nails. Oh, look, if you're going to make it tough for me, I'll... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ever put up a shelf before? What do you think? Oh, we get some like you every day. Honestly? Simple shelf builders as well as experts who want to panel a rumpus room. Oh, it's just a small apartment. <laughs> we have to rumpus where we can. Take a look over here. Hmm? Looks like a supermarket, doesn't it? Do-it-yourself mm. kits for everything. Hi-fi, radiator covers, storage walls. Wow. Out back in our lot, we've got several big kits for prefabricated houses. Oh, yes, but, but don't you have any plain old boards? <laughs> I won't sell you a board or even a nail until you take this rule. Go home and measure for the wood you need, then come back and I'll sell you some good white pine, mm -hmm. not mahogany. Oh, but my wife... Bring should... your wife and I won't sell her mahogany. It's too expensive. Now, you don't need it for shelves. I'll sell you just what you need and only what you need. Who knows? Someday you may want to buy one of our prefab, split-level, ranch-type 12-room houses complete with sod for three acres of lawn. <laughs> Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Well, you've done wonders. One shelf up already, and you've only been working three hours. Well, these doggone nails won't go into the wall. Maybe you should have bought a sharper kind of nail. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've gone all over the whole store and tested each nail with my finger. Well, it's going to look beautiful. What are those chunks on the floor? Mm, oh, it's plaster. Plaster? Well, every time I hit a nail, a chunk falls out. Well, the landlord will be wild. I'll have to get a plaster in, I guess. 
Well, hang it all. Don't stare. You wanted these shelves. I wanted them. You offered to build them. Shh, shh, shh. Somebody at the door. Well, naturally, all this pounding after midnight. Hi, my name's Kennelly. Live next door. Heard you hammering. Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Kennelly. Did we wake you? Wake me? <laughs> no. My wife and I were working in the apartment. Finally, I said, Erna, somebody's doing it yourself. This I gotta find out about. Oh, I was just putting up some shelves. Uh... <whistles> Say, I put some in our apartment in the same place two years ago. Boy, did I tell Erna, my wife, if she's still on top of the desk. If she's where? On top of the desk. We're painting the ceiling of the apartment tonight. Holy smoke, you've made hash of that plaster. What kind of nails are you using? Oh, oh, these. Aren't they the right kind, Mr. Kennelly? You should have told them at the store you were going into plaster. I'll go get some of the right kind and earn her. By the time you fix drinks for everybody, I'll be back. You don't need to trouble. Trouble? We're friends now. All a do-it-yourselfer has to do is knock once with a hammer, and he'll get friends from 60 miles away. <laughs> Okay, Pete, this side, and that's it. There she goes. Okay, boy, knock her into place while I call the little woman, and we'll all have a drink. Ellen! Hey, Ellen, come and look what we've got. Well, it's you'll have the landlord here shouting like that. Take a look, Helen. How do you like it, honey? You finished them. You made my shell. Pete made them with his own little hands. Oh, well, shucks. Who told me about the nails? <laughs> Brought his power saw so I could... They are beautiful. Really professional. They're so beautiful, and you've worked so hard. Oh, hey, now, honey, don't cry. It was nothing, really. Yes, it was. It was working all day at the bank and staying up half the night to build my shell. Well, I got a kick out of this, honey, honest. Well, I felt just like old Daniel Boone and Abe Lincoln and the other pioneers building log cabins that... What's the matter? What are you staring at now? Nothing, nothing, dear. Well, yes, you are. You, you're staring at the shelves. Isn't she, Alex? Huh? Oh, I was just pouring drinks for the three of us for a I toast. I think you and I should toast Pete, Alex. Oh, not till you tell me what you're staring at about those shelves. Uh, what's wrong with them, Helen? Nothing, except... Except what? Well, I was thinking we'll have to paint them. Well, sure we'll have to paint them. But don't you see, dear, if we paint the shelves, it'll make the rest of the room positively dingy. Hey, haven't you kids painted with rollers? It's a cinch. Earn and I'll show you. Well, Rembrandt, here I come. Gray room. She ain't what she used to be. Ain't what she used to be. Ain't what she used to be. The old gray room. She ain't what she used to be. Now she's painted green. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Uh, let's gather up the paint claws, wash the brushes, move the furniture back, and then we'll have champagne in our new living room. Oh, boy, have we had fun these last two weeks. Well, when are you going to paint the rest of your apartment, Helen? Oh, I don't know, and I'm sort of tired these days. We thought maybe we'd wait. Say, you know what you want to get? An electric paint sprayer. An electric paint sprayer? Mm. Terrific! Goes... <laughs> you do your wall, ceilings, furniture in half the time. Oh, dear, somebody heard us sing. I'll see who it is. Well, good evening, Mr. Peabody. I beg to differ, Mr. Bolton. It's morning and no time to be singing in my apartment house. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Peabody. I'm terribly sorry. Now, look. <gasps> What's happened to this room? Well, that's what we were singing about. We just finished painting it. I presume you're responsible for this, Mr. Kenley? Well, now, Mr. Peabody, I just... Haven't I had enough trouble with you in your apartment without your invading a second apartment of my building? I suppose he gave you permission to paint your walls, Mr. Bolton. Well, no, we just... Do I smell rubber base paint? I do. You know what this means. Uh Uh-oh. Well, you may Uh oh, Mr. Kenley. I don't suppose you told these people rubber base paint on the walls of this apartment is permissible only if the tenant guarantees to have it scraped off and two coats of oil paint put on when they move. Look, they had the rubber base already bought before I... And you've added bookshelves, I see. Uh Uh-huh. Nailed or screwed in, Mr. Bolton? Why, 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 nailed? Nailed. You know what that means in any apartment building? The shelves belong to the landlord. Section 182, shelves, cabinets, valances, and other elements of decoration become the property of the landlord unless fastened by the use of screws. All right. We'll get our use out of them in the next couple of years. 
Oh, well, we'll take care of the painting. Pete, we can. Why not, honey? Where are we going to store all the extra paint and the ladders and the brushes and the cloths? Why, well, right where we're storing the tools. Going to the bedroom. Till I build that storage cabinet. There isn't going to be any room for a storage cabinet. I'm going to need a crib. Uh, yeah, crib. Oh, darling. You mean it? Well, the heck with a crib. Now we can build a house. By recalling these first adventures in Do It Yourself, Pete had gained an insight into the Oedipal Drive that led him to emulate the pioneer forefathers. Modern man no longer rests a harvest from the earth. He puts his hand in the food freezer or opens a can. He no longer levels the forest to build a cabin and gets logs for the fire. He rents an apartment and pounds on the pipes for more heat. Yet, deep in his subconscious, he knows he is the natural child of the pioneer. Therefore, he turns to this new field of do-it-yourself, striving to prove he is as good a man as his forefathers were. Pete, uh, tell me about building the house now. Well, it's a funny thing, Dr. Manning. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't build one. We bought one. Oh? A nice one, outside of town. Room for young Susan to have her nursery. Mm -hmm. Big yard. Oh, really nice, if a little old-fashioned. Uh, you, uh, you gave up do-it-yourself? Almost completely, for a couple of years. And uh, did you give up the Kennelys, too? Well, they, they gave us up, you might say. I can't blame them. See, they bought a lot across from us and built a house. Uh -huh. Alex was pretty sore when I wouldn't put on a miner's lamp and help him with the plumbing and wiring after dark. Uh -huh. Erna said Helen let her down with the plastering. We didn't speak to each other for a year. Then one night when I came home from work... <laughs> Helen? Helen, what are you doing? Oh, Pete, I wanted to finish before you came home. I couldn't stand the squeak in that next to the last step any longer. Well, it's squeaked ever since we moved in. Well, wake Susan up. Oh, no, nah, Susan's nursery's way down the hall. Helen, you're not looking at me. What's up? Well, honey, don't be angry. I asked the Kennelys over for a drink tonight. Oh, you did Please, it's the way Erna looks at Susan every time I take her out in the stroller. I know she wants to see her and hold her, and finally today... Well, we were such good friends. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I can feel Alex's eyes on me, too. From his roof, from his new terrace, from his new sun porch, bedroom window, the chimney, the cellar window, from wherever he's working. You know, it was tough when he was just building that house. Now they've started remodeling. I just couldn't let them up to Susan's nursery with that stair shrieking. Oh, of course you couldn't. Here, give me that hammer. <laughs> Well, it's a good house you've got, Pete, a good house. Of course, if you wanted to put in an hour or two and shore up your front porch, you Oh, know how about another drink, Alex? Huh? Oh, well, I don't know. Erna and I have to go back and pour some concrete tonight. Alex is putting a new wing on the house. We have to extend the basement. Haven't oh. you seen our concrete mixer? It's a cinch. Hook it up to the power, throw in the sand and gravel. Why don't you two kids come on over and see it no, work? No, we can't leave little Susan. Oh, that's right. They're family folks now, Alex. Why don't you go over with them, Pete? I'll stay with Susan. Yeah, how about that, Pete? Well, no, I, I think I, I ought to stay here. Oh, why not, Pete? Helen can come over tomorrow while you stay with the baby. Look, I've got an even better idea. Why don't you two come over for early supper tomorrow and bring the baby? Why, yes. Now, you can't say no to that. And then we can show you the whole house, concrete mixer and all. <laughs> Yeah, I know. No what? Well, this darn stair still creaks. Well, not half as loud as before you fixed it yesterday. You know, honey, we went from cellar to attic in Alex's house, and not one stair creaked. And the windows open without breaking your back. And their cellar is dry. That beautiful kitchen of Erna's. Oh, yeah. Honey, you wouldn't think of doing all that electric wiring yourself. Well, darn it, I'd like to be able to use the toaster without dimming every light on the first floor. Could we have a light over the sink? Well, sure. Well, I think so, anyway. Come on, let's look. Hey, you 
I got it, boy. Push that BX a little harder, son. I gotta have enough wire to reach the outlet by the sink. Ella, come and watch it. You bet your ladder right against the cord to my drill. just got to put down that saw and come upstairs for a minute. Erna's got Susan on top of the stepladder painting the nursery ceiling. So it went, Dr. Manning. So it went. Then, Dr. Manning, 18 months later, the house was painted inside and out. Helen had her modern kitchen. We had a new bathroom. I'd insulated the house, shored up the front porch. And... Oh, would you believe it, Doctor, beyond a few cuts and scrapes and nicks, well, Helen and I had never been happier in our lives. Well, there was a lot to be said for do-it-yourself. And I suppose we'd still be at it, but... Well, something snapped when I got sidetracked onto that boat. It was a small eight-foot pram, pre-cut, complete, down to the last screw. A child of ten can build this in eight to a, ten hours, the advertisement said. How's it going, son? Okay, but I'd like to meet the guy who wrote that ad. Eight to ten hours. There are 737 screws in this thing. Besides the marine glue. Almost done? Yeah, just these last couple of screws. That's all. Man, it looks like the Queen Mary. Oh, she'll float all right. You know what? This works. Maybe you and I could get a kit for a 35-foot power cruiser. Sure. Build it in our basement. She finished? Eh, she's finished. Except for painting her. Boy, that first night I met you, I'd never have thought you could do a job like this. Oh, me neither. You ever want to leave the bank, you could make a fortune doing jobs like this. Oh, i come off of it. I'm compared to you. Oh, I'm... I mean it, Pete. This boat is real. Pete, watch the boat. She's let go. Pete, where are you? Pete! <laughs> Some six weeks later, after he had been taken to the hospital and his various physical injuries healed, I had met Pete Bolton for the first time. Now, after our long talks together, we had at last uncovered the basic underlying drive of the 40 million people who do it yourself to the tune of $12 billion a year, their basic creative urge. Modern man's basic creative urge is taking the worst beating in history. This is the age of specialization, of mechanization, of automation. The worker on the assembly line and the corporation president are in the same sinking boat. They can never point to something and say, I and I alone have created this. Well, doctor, a man and woman together can create a baby. That's true, Pete. When was it you and Helen stopped uh, painting and hammering and sawing? Well, when Susan was born... Oh, yes, I see what you mean. The creative drive is so strong in man that even though he fathers a baker's dozen, even though he is a creative artist, he still likes to do it yourself. It is born within him as surely as the lungs, the heart, and the brain, until suddenly he is in need of a shelf or caught by the gleam of a power tool that resembles the fire engine of youth. Then he is lost. Or, as I think now, he has won. Calling, Dr. Jenkins. Calling, Dr. Jenkins. Pete was just about ready to leave that hospital bed, but my colleague, Dr. Forster, terminated the case more abruptly than I might have wished. 
Good morning, Pete. Well, Dr. Forster, I haven't seen you in weeks. Uh, yes, we'll talk about that some other time, Pete. Right now, we're in a terrible jam. Haven't got a bed available in the entire hospital, and there's a patient outside. Auto accident? No, a do-it-yourselfer like you, up on his roof trying to nail a shingle to stop a leak. Oh, gosh, I'll get right out. Fell off it, huh? Uh, no, uh, fell in. The roof fell in with him. All right, nurse. Yes, doctor. Uh, bring the man in right this way. Right over here. We got it's Dr. Manny. You have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and a psychological account of the do-it-yourself movement, written by Charles S. Monroe with music composed by Ben Ludlow and conducted by Alfredo Antonini, produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Barry Kroger was heard as Dr. Manning, Joe Helgeson as Pete, Elspeth Eric as Helen, and Jackson Beck as Kennelly. Others in the cast included Ralph Bell, Leon Janney, Elaine Rost, and Joe Julian. This is Bob Pfeiffer inviting you to listen again next Sunday afternoon to the CBS Radio Workshop. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, from Hollywood, Season of Disbelief and Hail and Farewell, adapted and directed by Anthony Ellis. Two unusual and provocative character studies by one of America's most original authors, Ray Bradbury. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bradbury. It has always seemed to me that life, to all of us, is an endless coil of rope playing through our hands every moment of every hour of the day. The long line of the rope goes back to the time we were born and extends on out ahead to the time of our death. In between lies the eternal now, the flickering moments when each of us must play the rope as best we can, without burning our fingers, snarling the coils, or breaking the line. This is a study of one woman and her rope. Season of Disbelief. Old Mrs. Bentley was a saver. She saved tickets, old theater programs, bits of lace, scarves, railroad transfers and such things. All the tags and tokens of her experience she saved. I have a stack of records. Here's Caruso. That was in 1921 in New York. I was 40. John was still alive. Here's June Moon. 1929, I think, right after John died. That was the huge regret of her life, in a way. The one thing she had most enjoyed touching and listening to and looking at, she hadn't saved. John was far out in the meadow country, dated and boxed and hidden under grasses. And nothing remained of him but his high silk hat, his cane, and his good suit in the closet. But what she could keep, she had kept. Pink flower dresses crushed among mothballs and vast black trunks and cut glass dishes from her childhood. Her past lived with her. Then, the thing with the children. It happened in the middle of the summer. Mrs. Bentley, coming out to water the ivy on her front porch, saw the two cool-colored, sprawling girls lying on her green lawn, enjoying the immense prickling of the grass. At the very moment she was smiling down on them with her yellow mask face, around the corner, like an elfin band, came an ice cream wagon. 
The two girls sat up, turning their heads like sunflowers after the sun. Little girls, would you like some? The wagon stopped. There was an exchange of money for pieces of the original Ice Age. These she gave to the girls who thanked her with snow in their mouths, their eyes darting from her buttoned-up shoes to her white hair. Don't you want a bite? No, no, child. I'm old enough and cold enough. The hottest day won't thaw me. Come up on the porch and sit in the shade. But mind you, don't drip. I'm Alice. She's Jane. How nice. I'm Mrs. Bentley. They call me Helen. I didn't know old ladies had first names. <laughs> well, you never hear them used. Oh, my dear, when you're as old as I, they won't call you Jane either. Old age is dreadfully formal. How old are you? I remember the dinosaur. No, but how old? Seventy-five. That's old. Oh, I don't feel any different now than when I was your age. Our age? Yes, once I was a pretty little girl, just like you, Jane. Well, what's the matter? Nothing. Oh, you don't have to go so soon, I hope. Well. Is something the matter? What? My mother says it isn't nice to fib. Of course it isn't. And not to listen to fibs. Who was fibbing to you, Alice? You were. About what? About your age. About being a little girl. Well, but I was. Many years ago, a little girl like you. Come on, Jane. But how ridiculous. It's perfectly obvious. Everyone was young once. <laughs> You're joking with us. You weren't really ten ever, were you, Mrs. Bentley? You run on home. You get away from here. I won't have you laughing. And your name's not really Helen. Of course it's Helen. Goodbye. Thanks for the ice cream. Once I played hopscotch. You hear me? I did. The idea. No one ever doubted I was a girl before. What a silly, horrible thing to do. I don't mind being old. Not really. But I do resent having my childhood taken away from me. After supper, she gathered together certain items in a perfumed kerchief. Then she went to her front porch and stood there stiffly for half an hour. As suddenly as night birds, the two girls flew by, and Mrs. Bentley's voice brought them to a fluttering rest. Girls! Girls! Yes, Mrs. Bentley? Come up on the porch. Yes, yes Mrs. Mrs. Bentley. I've got some treasures to show you. Uh, sit down, both of you. <clears throat> now, here. I wore this when I was nine. It's a comb. Let's see. Oh, it's pretty. Uh, and here's a tiny ring I wore when I was eight. It doesn't fit my finger now. Why, it just fits me. The comb fits my head. And here, here, a, a picture. Who's this little girl? It's me. Oh, it doesn't look like you. Anybody could get a picture like this somewhere. But it's the truth. Any more pictures, Mrs. Bentley? Of you later? You got a picture of you at 15? And one at 20? Oh. One at 40? 50? Oh, oh nonsense. I, I don't have to show you anything. And we don't have to believe you. But this picture proves I was young. That's some other little girl like us. You borrowed it. I, I was married. Where's Mr. Bentley? He's been gone a long time. If he were here, he'd tell you how young and pretty I was when I was 22. But he's not here, and he can't tell. I have a marriage certificate. You could have borrowed it. And the only way I'll believe you were ever young is if you have someone say they saw you when you were ten. Thousands of people saw me, but they're dead, you little fool. Dead or ill or gone away in other towns. I don't know a soul here. Just moved here a few years ago, so no one saw me young. Well, there you are. Nobody saw her. Listen, you must take these things on faith. Someday you'll be as old as I. People will say the same. Oh, no. They'll say those vultures were never hummingbirds. Those owls were never orioles. Those, those parrots were never bluebirds. One day you'll be like me. No, I won't. Or me. You wait and see. You, child. Uh, your mother. 
Haven't you noticed over the years the change? No, she's always the same. I guess we'd better go home. Thanks for the comb, it's fine. And thanks for the ring, it just fits. And the picture, the little girl. No, come back. You can't have those, they're mine. No, you stole them. They belong to some little girl, you stole them. No, come back. Oh, come back. She lay awake for many hours into that night among her trunks and trinkets. A night wind blew in the room. The white curtain fluttered against a dark cane which had leaned against that wall near the other bric-a-brac for many years. The cane trembled and fell. Its gold ferrule glittered in the moonlight. It was her husband's opera cane. It seemed as if he were pointing it at her as he often had, using his soft, sad, reasonable voice. Those children are right. They stole nothing from you, my dear. These things don't belong to you here, you, now. They belong to her, that other you, so long ago. And then, as though an ancient phonograph record had been set hissing under a steel needle... She remembered a conversation she had once with Mr. Bentley. Mr. Bentley, so prim, a pink carnation in his whisk-broomed lapel. My dear, you never will understand time, will you? Don't you see, no matter how hard you try to be what you once were, you can only be what you are here and now. Time plays tricks. When you're nine, you think you've always been nine years old and will always be. When you're 30, it seems you've always been balanced there on that bright rim of middle life. And then, when you become 70, you are always and forever 70. You are in the present. You are trapped in a young now or an old now. But there is no other now to be seen. Ticket stubs are trickery. Saving things is a magic trick with mirrors. You're saving cocoons, corsets in a way you can never fit again. Why save them? You can't really prove you were ever young. Pictures. Pictures, John. No, they lie. You're not the picture. After the No, You're not the dates or the ink or the paper. You're not these trunks of junk and tricks. You're only here now, the present you. Yes, I see. I see. In the morning, in the morning, I'll do something final about this. And settle down to being only me and nobody else for many other year. That's what I'll do. The morning was bright and green, and there at her door, like moths bumping softly on the screen, were the two girls. Got any more things to give us, Mrs. Bentley? More of the little girls' things? <laughs> She led them down the hall to the library. Uh, Take this. The dress in which she had played the mandarin's daughter at 15. And this. And this. A kaleidoscope, a magnifying glass. Pick out anything you want. Books, skates, dolls, everything. They're yours. Ours? Only yours. And will you help me with a little work? I'm building a big fire in my backyard. I'm emptying the trunks, throwing out this trash for the trash man at doesn't belong to me. Nothing ever belongs to anybody. We'll help you, Mrs. Bentley. It'll be fun. And now, on summer afternoons, you can see the two little girls like wrens on a wire on Mrs. Bentley's front porch. They sit in their cool dresses, not stirring, waiting for her. And when the silvery chimes of the ice cream man are heard, the front door opens, Mrs. Bentley floats out with her hand deep in the throat of her silver-mouthed purse, and for half an hour you can see them there on the porch, the two girls and the old lady, putting coldness into warmness, eating chocolate icicles, 
laughing. At last, they are good friends. How old are you, Mrs. Bentley? Seventy-five. How old were you 50 years ago? Seventy-five. You were never young, were you? And never wore ribbons or dresses like these? No, Jane. Never. Have you got a first name? My name is Mrs. Bentley. And you've always lived in this one house? Always. And never were pretty? Never. Never in a million trillion years? Never in a million trillion. Trillion years. Presenting now the second of our duo. And Mr. Ray Bradbury. The rope of life hisses through our fingers. We reach, it's gone. The beauty of any particular flower, song, poem, or person lies often in the fact that roses must fade, songs die with the breath, poems burn in the fire, golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. But what if beauty could be made to last? Would it still be beautiful or monstrous? Here's the study of a person who seized the traveling rope of life, a moment of beauty, and felt it freeze in his hands. Hail and farewell. going away. There was nothing else to do. The time was up, the clock had run out, and he was going very far away indeed. His suitcase was packed, shoes shined, hair brushed, it expressly washed behind his ears, and it remained only for him to go down the stairs, out the front door, and up the street to the small town station where the train would make a stop for him alone. Then Fox Hill, Illinois, would be left far off in his past. And he would go on, perhaps to Iowa, perhaps to Kansas, perhaps even to California. Willie? Yes? Almost time. All right. I'll be down. In the mirror on his dresser, he saw a face made of June dandelions and July apples and warm summer morning milk. There, as always, was his look of the angel and the innocent, which might never in the years of his life change picked up his valise, looked once more around his room, and went downstairs. Here I am. You can't really be leaving us, Willie. People are beginning to talk. I've been here three years now, but when people begin to talk, I know it's time to put on my shoes and buy a railroad ticket. It's all so strange. I just don't understand. It's so sudden. We'll miss you, Willie. We'll miss you very much. I'll write you every Christmas. It's uh, it's been a great pleasure and satisfaction. It's a shame it had to stop. Shame that you had to tell us about yourself. An awful shame you can't stay on. You're the nicest folks I ever had. Oh, Willie. Willie. <laughs> it's not easy to go. You get used to things. You want to stay but it doesn't work. I tried to stay on once after people began to suspect how horrible people said. All these years playing with our innocent children, they said, and us not guessing. Awful. And I finally had to leave town one night. It's not easy. You know darn well how much I love both of you. Thanks for three swell years. Well... Willie, where will you go? I don't know. I just start traveling. When I see a town that looks nice and green, I settle in. Will you ever come back? Oh, in about 
20 years, maybe it should begin to show on my face. When it does, I'm going to make a grand tour of all the mothers and fathers I've had. Oh, Willie. We can't complain, Anna. Better to have had a son 36 months than none whatever. Well, I guess it's time. Goodbye. Thanks. Willie kissed Anna quickly, touched Steve's hand, seized his luggage, and was gone up the street in the green noon light under the trees, not looking back. A small boy, 12 years old, with a birth certificate in his valise to show that he had been born 43 years ago. boys were playing on the green park diamond when he came by. He stood a little while among the oak tree shadows watching them hurl the white snowy baseball into the warm summer air. The boys' voices yelled and the ball lit on the path near Willie. Hey, Willie! Where are you going, Willie? Uh, gonna visit a cousin of mine for a few days. Huh? You guys just throwing the ball around, huh? Yeah. You taking the train alone, Willie? Yeah. Boy, that's neat. Hey, uh... How about a couple of throws? I got a little time. Sure, I guess so. Willie dropped his bag and ran back. The white baseball was already up in the sun and plunging down to him. And away again to their white figures, up in the sun again, rushing, life coming and going in a pattern. He thought of the last three years, now spent to the penny, and the five years before that, and so on, down the line. The baseball flying here... There, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Hanlon, Creek Bend, Wisconsin, 1932, the first couple, the first year. Henry and Alice Boltz, Limeville, Iowa, 1935, the Smiths, the Eatons, Robinsons, 1939, 1945, husband and wife, husband and wife, no children, no children, no children, a knock on this door, a knock on that. Pardon me, uh... My name is William. I wonder if I could... A sandwich? Come in. Come in and sit down. Where are you from, son? The sandwich, tall glass of cold milk, the smiling, the nodding, the comfortable, leisurely talking. Well, son, you look like you've been traveling. You run off from somewhere. No. Are you an orphan? We always wanted kids... Never worked out. Never knew why, one of those things. Well, <laughs> getting late, son. Don't you think you better hit for home? I got no home. A boy like you? Not dry behind the ears? Your mother will get worried. I got no home and no folks anywhere in the world. I wonder... If... I wonder... Could I sleep here tonight? Well, now, well, son, I don't just know. We never considered taking oh, in the... We've got chicken for supper tonight. Enough for extras. Enough for company. The voices and the faces and the people and always the same first conversations. The years turning, flying away. The voice of Emily Robinson in her rocking chair in summer night darkness. The last night he stayed with her. The night she discovered his secret. Her voice saying, I look at all the little children's faces going by, and I sometimes think, what a shame. What a shame that all these flowers have to be cut. All these bright fires have to be put out. What a shame all these have to get tall and unsightly and, and wrinkle and turn gray or get bald and... Finally, all bone and wheeze be dead and buried off away. When I hear them laugh, I can't believe they'll ever go the road I'm going. They're so eager for everything. I, I guess that's what I miss most in older folks. The, the eagerness gone, nine times out of ten. The freshness gone. So much of the drive and life down the drain. I like to watch school let out each day. It's, 
It's like someone threw a bunch of flowers out of the school front doors. How does it feel, Willie? How does it feel to be young forever? Are you happy? Are you as fine as you seem? I, I worked with what I had. After my folks died, after I found I couldn't get man's work anywhere, I, I tried carnivals, but they only laughed. Son, they said, you're not a midget. And even if you are, you look like a boy. We want midgets with midgets' faces. Sorry, son. What was I? A boy? I looked like a boy, sounded like a boy. So I might as well go on being a boy. What could I do? What job was there for me? And then one day I, I saw this man in a restaurant looking at another man's pictures of his kids. Sure wish I had kids, he said. Sure wish I had kids. And that instant, sitting there, I, I knew what my job would be for all the rest of my life. There was work for me, making lonely people happy, keeping myself busy, playing forever. I knew I had to play forever, deliver a few papers, run a few errands, mow a few lawns. All I had to do was to be a, a mother's son and a father's pride. But, Willie, didn't you ever get lonely? Didn't you want things that grown-ups wanted? I fought that out alone. I'm a boy, I told myself. I'll have to live in a boy's world, read boys' books, play boys' games, cut myself off from everything else. And I played it that way. Oh, it wasn't easy. There were times. But it's nice being a child for over 40 years. It's a living, as they say. And when you make other people happy, then you're almost happy, too. And anyway, in a few years now, I'll be in my second childhood. All the fevers will be out of me and all the unfulfilled things. And most of the dreams... Then I can relax. He threw the baseball one last time and broke the reverie. Then he was picking up his suitcase. The two boys stood beside him. They were embarrassed at his shaking hands with him. Oh, Willie. Means if you're going to China or something. Oh, that's right. It isn't. So long, Willie. See you next week. Yeah. So long, Sam. So long, Jim. And he was walking off with his suitcase again, looking at the trees, going away from the boys and the street where he had lived. And as he turned the corner, a train whistle screamed, and he began to run. In the early morning, with the iron smell of the train around him and a full night of traveling shaking his bones and his body, he awoke and looked out on a small town just arising from sleep. A porter moved by a shadow in the shadows. Sir, what town's this? Uh, Valleyville. How many people? Mm, 10,000. Why, this your stop? It looks green. It looks nice and quiet. Uh, son, you know where you're going? Here. I hope you know what you're doing, boy. Yes, sir. I know what I'm doing. Down the dark aisle, luggage lifted after him by the porter and out into this smoking, steaming, cold beginning to lighten morning. He stood looking at the porter in the black metal train against the few remaining stars. Boy! Wish me luck! What? Wish me luck! Oh, best of luck, son. Best of luck to you, boy. Thanks! He watched the black train. He didn't move all the time it was going. He stood quietly... A small boy, 12 years old again, on the worn wooden platform, and only after three entire minutes until the train was completely gone away and out of sight did he turn at last to face the empty streets below. Then as the sun was rising, he began to walk very fast so as to keep warm down into the new town. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented two studies by Ray Bradbury, adapted and directed by Anthony Ellis. 
the first season of disbelief with Virginia Gregg and John Daner, Dawn Bender, Marion Richmond, and Herb Butterfield. The second, Hail and Farewell, with Richard Beals, Stacey Harris, Vivi Janis, Lawrence Dobkin, Paula Winslow, Roy Glenn, Billy Chapin, and Peggy Weber. We wish to thank Mr. Bradbury for being our special guest. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced by William Frug. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when we present the eminent Shakespearean teacher, Dr. Frank C. Baxter, professor of English at the University of Southern California, and Mr. William Shakespeare, noted author, who will be our special guests, presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by The Jack Carson Show. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. St. John Paul II stated that, for the disciple of Christ, evangelization is a duty, an obligation of love. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church states that evangelization is necessary for salvation. So we know we're called, but how do we do it? St. Paul Street Evangelization can help. To learn more, contact us at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Shut her up, Dorothy. Shut her up. I got her. Empty his pockets before the cops come. Look, go on. What are you waiting for? He looks like he's dead. No, ain't that shocking. I only stabbed him in the heart. You're too quick with that knife, I told you. Come on, empty his pockets and stop preaching. Can't hold this woman all night. Okay, okay, Lefty. Hey, ah, well, the lousy luck. Ten bucks is all he had. You're lying. No, Lefty, honest. I'll cut out your heart. Come across. Honest, Lefty, you know I wouldn't lie Look, to you. Look, I know you're a liar. Come on. But, well, I'll be dog. Two more dead presidents stuck in my hand. Yeah. What do you know about that? We gotta get out of here. Hey, what do we do with the dame? If she knows what's good for us, she'll keep quiet and take her old man to the morgue. There's a real good sawbones up at the hospital there, lady. He helped me. Uh, hey, shut up, you fool. Pick up your feet. Come on, get going. Get going. George. Oh, George. You're not dead. Oh, George, no. Oh, I can still hear your heart up just a little. It's still beating. Oh, God, let it keep on until I get up to the hospital. Let it keep beating until I get a doctor somewhere. There must be a doctor who can help you. There's got to be one somewhere. The CBS Radio Workshop. The theater of the mind. Dedicated to man's imagination. Today, let the proscenium of that imagination encompass the heart. Our story, written by Peabody Award winner Richard Durham, titled, The Heart of the Man. I am the human heart. I am the spirit's rhythm. I am a hollow bag the size of your fist. I live in a dungeon between two lungs, the lonely abode of the soul. I am the timekeeper of human life, fair, impartial, equal, to Turk or Tartar, Roman, Greek, Ethiop, Hebrew. I am old. I circulated blood for Cro-Magnons, Neanderthals, Rhodesians. I am young. I warm the breast of the fresh and the new. I have moods. 
In some men I have been called cold, in others warm. In some I am the lion, and in others the lamb. In some filled with love, and others full of hate. I have been tame, I have been wild. But if, as among men, the good is oft interred with their bones, so let it be with the blood which I drive through their veins. So let it be with the few men who have mastered me, who have learned the laws of veins and lobes, of arteries and oracles, who have timed my restless writhing and twisting to planet precision, who fought to heal me whenever I was ripped and split, as I was one stormy night in the breast of a dying man outstretched on a hospital table. Right in here, Doctor. Stethoscope, please, nurse. Doctor. Doctor. Can't you hear me, Doctor? His lips are moving, Doctor. He's trying to say something. Mm. He's too weak. He can hear us, I think, but he's too weak to make us hear him. The stethoscope hardly picks up a sound, but the heart must be beating. Doctor, can't you hear it? Listen, Doctor. Listen. I can hear it. How long has the patient been here? About three minutes, Doctor. I called you right away. Checked his pulse, respiration, temperature? Pulse rapid, ready, 130. Respiration 30, temperature 105. If I could have just gotten to him sooner. This wound in his chest goes down, down to his heart. Don't, don't, don't. Can't you hear me, doctor? Can't you hear me? His heart is punctured. Doctor, I've been trying to tell you. I was almost home. Some men came after me, wanted me to hold up my hands. I hit one. And then something touched my heart. Felt like a pin. Like a pin. His heart's weakening. Adrenaline. Adrenaline. That'll hold it a while. His heart's been split. Only one thing we can do. There's nothing you can do. Nothing. Don't let him move, nurse. Call the emergency staff into the operating room. His heart's split and leaking badly. He'll die if we can't sew it up. Prepare him for surgery. We must operate immediately. No. You can't operate on my heart. Not on my heart. There's one chance in a thousand. If we take it, he may live. No. I'll die. You don't fool me. I'll never see the sun rise again. I know it. You hear that, doctor? I'm speaking to you. I'm I'm speaking to you. Yes, I am the heart. And I speak to you, doctor. You here, scrubbing your arms while red sand drips down an hourglass dusting your hands with powder, flexing your fingers for the rubber gloves, while inside your brain and nerves is etched the memory of the long, long search for my secrets. A long search which began for you 20 years ago, Doctor. 20 years ago, when you were a young pre-medical student and whatever spare time you could find was spent in the home of a Texas surgeon. Daly, will you stop that humming, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. My wife's dead, boy, dead. Let her rest. Rest. Yes, Doctor. I I didn't mean to be disrespectful. I'm sorry. Excuse my gruffness. I, I just can't get her out of my mind. I'm tired, Ulysses. Tired. I finished marking the class papers for you, Doctor. Would you want to look them over? Yes, yes. Where are they? I need something to get my mind off this. Right here, sir. The examinations from your surgery students. I checked over them. Here you are, sir. Hmm. Good. You've got a fine head on you, boy. 
Even if you're overly curious. Mm-hmm. This one's all right. Uh, here's an odd one, Doctor. What's odd about it? Well, I didn't know how to mark it. You see, this student thinks it's possible to sew up the human heart when the fibers are cut. He thinks he can take the Operate needle... Operate on the human heart? He's mad. But he drew a diagram. He thinks that if the pericardial sac can be reached... I said he's mad. It can't be done. If it could, wouldn't I have saved my own wife? Didn't I try it after she stabbed herself? Didn't I try it? Yes, Doctor, you did. Not just me, but doctors everywhere in Germany, Italy, France, Switzerland have tried for years and failed. It just can't be done. Don't you see that? How shall I mark the paper? Zero. Oh, just talking of it makes me hear the way our heart beat that night. I can't forget it. Son, you've got nimble fingers and a good head. You'll be a fine surgeon someday. You'll find we surgeons can do something with the kidney, the bladder, the stomach, the scalp, nigh everything in the body except the human heart. The poet put it correctly. The heart's a lonely hunter. But when it's wounded, there's not a chance in a million to heal it. Not a chance in a million. Everything's ready, Doctor. All assistants are here. Good. Let's look this way, please. We'll cut a window on the chest wall above the heart. A half-circle incision. This way. Every move counts. We can't afford a single slip. Scalpel. Scalpel. Clamps. Clamps. More clamps. Clamps. Sponge. Yes, Doctor. Sponge. A single slip, and I stop. Scalpel. I'm speaking Scalpel. to you, Doctor. You with your body bent over a table under the glare Clamp. of a white light, Clamp. concentrating on a six-inch half circle. Your Clamp. fingers demonstrating Clamp. the meaning of the words you spoke decades back in a college hall Sinter. when you took an Sinter. ancient oath. Repeat after me. I, Ulysses Grant Daly. I, Ulysses Grant Daly. Swear by Apollo Physician, by Aesculapius, by Health, by Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses. Swear by Apollo Physician, by Aesculapius, by Health, by Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses. Making them my witnesses, that I will carry out this oath and this indenture. Making them my witnesses, that I will carry out this oath and this indenture. To use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. To use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view you took an to oath injury and wrongdoing. And you carried it out to the letter. In whatever you went out to heal I me enter, in homes, in hospitals, in clinics. I shall enter to help you went across the sea to learn my laws in Paris, in Rome. You stood watching me under the bright lights while I lay outstretched on a table. You watched French surgeons with shrewd fingers try to suture me in Paris. Je bois maintenant. C'est fini. C'est fini. C'est trop tard. La palpitation a cessé. Nous y étions très loin. Vous pouvez le voir vous-même, Dr. Daly. C'est impossible, impossible. And in Rome, you watched. Confitior Deo Omnipotente. Beata Maria e Semper Wigini. Beato Michaeli Arcangelo. Infermiera, siamo qua, quasi al cuore. Incastri. Sì, dottore. Spero che possiamo giungere il cuore a tempo. È molto debile. La spunga adesso. Eccolo, dottore. Ci siamo. Ecco il cuore. Ora un ago, infermiera. Quello lungo. Sì, dottore. Ah, va bene. 
Vediamo se posso cucirlo innanzi e cada insieme. Sì, dottore. Pre corpe ata Mariam semper reginem. Beatum Michaelo Macanglo. Dottore. Amen. You saw me stop dead in hospitals in Rome. You probed archives to see if any had survived the prying of a knife into the inner sanctum of the soul. You went to Germany to find new methods to heal my wounds. Um der deutschen Herzensgesellschafts willen möchte ich meine amerikanischen Kollegen willkommen heißen. Sie sind alle frei, ihre Untersuchungen in Berlin und anderswo in Deutschland fortzusetzen. Ich danke Ihnen. Or, as I would say in English, I welcome you, American doctors, to Berlin to do your research in surgery. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Gerhardt. My colleagues and I have been looking forward to seeing your work at Eichelberger Clinic. Ach, jawohl. Uh, we've done very good work there. Uh, just until today... We had your American surgeon, Dr. Ulysses Grant, daily assisting us. Until you uh, heard We're especially news. keen on your suture methods, Professor. We uh, understand some German doctors have come pretty close to finding a way to operate on the human heart. Oh, yeah, but, but in America... Our hope is that one day surgeons will be able to sew up the heart as we can suture skin or any other organ. But it has already been achieved, her doctor. Well, Here? Here? No, in America. I, I'm sorry, I, I should have told you. The news came over the wire this morning. An American doctor, Dr. Dan Williams, completed a successful operation on the heart. Your Dr. Daly has left for Chicago to work with him. Now, surgeons in Germany are waiting to hear the details. How was it done? Oh, it must have been a marvelous thing. But how was it done? So, Dr. Daly, you've come from Germany to work with me. Yes, doctor. Good. But what can I tell you that you don't already know but this? This patient got up in two weeks and walked, and now he's back at work. When they brought him to me, his heartbeat was so faint I had difficulty picking up a sound with the stethoscope. But I followed that sound until I found it. I tell you, doctor, there is no sound on heaven or earth more beautiful and poignant than the beat of a human heart. I took him into the operating room. As I recall, it was two o'clock in the morning. What a morning. Rain, thunder, and lightning. The elements seemed out to extinguish life, not give it. There was no time for my staff or even for proper equipment. I had to work fast. I got inside, and with these hands, then I took out his heart and stitched it six times. I did it for one patient, and I've done it for another. Now we know it can be done. How? How can I say it? This heart, this great human heart, is not only delicate like a butterfly's wing, but it's tough and strong and can fight with a fury. Yet it acts as though it's got a soul of its own. It's sensitive as a baby's body. And be pious when you pressure it and when you go in to handle it. It's the little things that you do that'll make the difference between life and death. Doctor, remember this when you're calling for your scalpel, sponge, sutures, clamps. You cannot give the patient much anesthesia. Scalpel. Scalpel. He's too weak to stand it. The patient sponge. will have his eyes open, sponge. watching you all the time. Clamp. Clamp. Cut your window over the fourth rib. Scalpel. Tie off the scalpel. vessels. When you lift the window, then you'll see the heart. Clamp two. Clamp two. The heart. The first time you see it naked and alive, it's an awesome sight. Clamp three. 
It's like some strange animal come up out of the sea. It slips and writhes, twists and struggles like a captive trying to break free. But you must be bold. Take the stitches in between the heartbeats. And if the stitches hold back the flow of blood, you've got a chance. But remember, keep in rhythm with the heartbeat. Keep the rhythm. Never break that rhythm. It's ready. We'll lift up the window. Steady. Easy now. Easy. Doctor, what are you taking out of me? Doctor. There, it's off. The heart. Doctor. Doctor. Keep check on his respiration. Transfusion ready? It's on the rack, Doctor. Pressure? He's gasping. He's weakening. We've got to get on. Ready to lift the heart. Lift it out. Out of the body. Not too much pressure. Keep in rhythm with the heart. Doctor, everything's going round. A little more. Round. There. The heart is out. Now to hold it in my hand. Don't break the rhythm. Blood leaking out. Not much time. Nurse, needle, curved needle. Right here. Fine silk. It's threaded ready. If the stitches hold, three stitches should stop the leak. One. Two. It still leaks. Still leaks. One more, maybe. Three. It still leaks. Good Lord, let it stop. It stopped. Thank heavens. But his pressure, it's gone down. His heart's hardly beating. Doctor, I'm falling. Falling. Adrenaline. Quick, adrenaline. Yes, doctor. Good. Transfusion set? Yes, doctor. Then let the blood flow into him. There. It's holding. Give him more. Let it go freely. It's going in. The beat's picking up. Good. Clean the incision. Sprinkle sulfur. Take off the clamps. Sew up the vessels. Doctor, I'm so weak. I'll never see the sun rise again, will I, Doctor? Will I, Doctor? (laughs) Nurse, keep the blood flowing and let him sleep. He's... He's crying. I know. His heart's lonely. Oh, so lonely. Let him cry. We've won. He'll make it. I... I did make it. I am the human heart, a hollow bag the size of your fist, the timekeeper of life, fair, impartial, equal to Turk or Tartar, Roman, Greek, African, Anglo-Saxon or Arab, to Mongoloid or Caucasoid common denominator of us all. I salute the men who first mastered me, who timed my writhing and twisting 
to planet precision as I drive my blood through the endless arteries of the living. I am your heart, a mortal part of us all. You've been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop. Today's venture, Richard Durham's The Heart of the Man, produced and directed in New York by D. Engelbach. Percussion, Saul Gubin. Our cast, Martin Blaine, Barry Kroger, Louis Van Ruten, Ralph Camargo, Guy Rep, Bill Mason, Joanna March, Lester Fletcher, Danny Ako, Inga Yolas. Next week from Hollywood... Malakimi Magic, a satire on a vacation in Honolulu. This is Ted Pearson speaking. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS radio network. It was the maddest, gladdest, damnedest existence ever enjoyed by mortal youth. A newspaper reporter in those days had a grand and gaudy time of it, and no call to envy any man. And yet I have marveled that the human race did not revolt against the imposture, dig up the carcass of Gutenberg, and heave it to the buzzards and hyenas in some convenient zoo. The CBS Radio Workshop. Dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Bring On the Angels, an affectionate revival drawn from his own book newspaper days of the early life and times of Henry L. Mencken. The man in the bed has had a stroke, a being full of gusto and sour joy. He's paralyzed. A master's master of words. He'll never speak sense again. He's 68. His eyes are open, but there's no fire there. They see instead, inward. What the sudden grab of thrombosis has left of his brain now gropes in the swirling mist of reversing time. Seeks, finds, remembers. I remember my father died on Friday, January 13th, 1899, and was buried on the ensuing Sunday. On the Monday evening immediately following, I presented myself in the city room of the old Baltimore Morning Herald applied to Max Ways, the city editor, for a job. Uh, Mr. Ways, sir? I was 18 years, four months, and four days old. Wore my hair longish and parted in the middle, had on a high, stiff collar and an ascot cravat, and weighed something on the minus side of 120 pounds. Sir? What's the problem, Sonny? Uh, I, I'd, uh, like a job, a reporter's job. Got any experience? Uh, no. No, sir. Been to school? Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, but I've done some writing. Poetry. Well, yeah, yes, yes, sir. What makes you think you want to be a newspaper man? Well, I think it'd be inter- uh, exciting. Huh. You working? Yes, sir, for my Uncle Henry at Mankin and Brother, the cigar factory. What's your name? Mankin, sir. Henry Lewis Mankin. Well, I'll tell you, Henry Lewis, we don't have any opening right now, but you drop in now and then evening, say, between 7.30 and 7.45, something might turn up. Hey, boy. <laughs> The next night, precisely at 7.31, I was back. Max waved me away without parley. The third night, he simply shook his head. The fourth, fifth, sixth... Well, to make an end, this went on for four weeks. Night in and night out. Until Thursday, February 23rd, 1899. I found Max reading copy. For a few minutes, he did not see me. Then his eyes lifted and he said, casually... 
Go out to Governstown, see if anything's happening there. We're supposed to have a Governstown correspondent, but he hasn't been heard from for six days. What'd you get, Henry? Well, uh, there were only two lights burning in town, so the I... The news, the news. Uh, uh, the Imperial Order of Red Men have postponed their oyster supper to March the 6th. Stop the press. Anything else? Yes, sir. A horse was stolen. Give me a stick. Sir? A stick is one paragraph. Pen and paper over there. I was up with the milkman the next morning to search the paper. And... There it was. A horse, a buggy, and several sets of harness, valued in all at about $250, were stolen last night from the stable of Howard Quinian near Kingsville. The county police are at work on the case, but so far no trace of either thieves or booty has been found. He didn't change a single word. I was hooked. I was in print. I was a reporter. I was hired. Sonny, I'm going to give you a start. I'm going to put you on the payroll at $7 a week. If you make good, you get a raise. Oh, that's wonderful, Mr. Way. To $8, and the name is Max. Yes, sir. It wasn't long before I had a typewriter, a spittoon of my own, and a beat. Oh, those were the days. The happy days. The days that chased each other like little kittens chasing their tails. The very first week, I landed in court uh, on the witness stand. The reformers had blithered up a crusade against the body dance halls, and I became an unwilling witness against two cops who had been aware of what was going on. Well, I was there in my official capacity, and I presume the police were. Answer the question. Did you see the defendants there? Well, uh, I spoke to many officers of the law that night. I may have seen... The poor flat feet were guilty, for I talked with them there many times. But I managed to sophisticate my testimony with so many ifs and buts that it went for nothing, and they were acquitted. That was my first and last experience as an agent of moral endeavor. I made up my mind at once that my true and natural allegiance was to the devil's party. And it has been my firm belief ever since that all persons who devote themselves to forcing virtue on their fellow men deserve nothing better than kicks in the pants. Hence, Mencken's law. To wit... Whenever A annoys or injures B on the pretense of saving or improving X, A is a scoundrel. I learned my trade from veterans who had seen Lincoln clear. Sometimes, for instance, it would be a matter of legging it to the iron wilds of Locust Point. But De Becker was more experienced than I and had a beard to prove it. Come with me, Mankin. Where are we going? Never mind. Come with me. Two beers, dark. Ah, again. Henry, why should we walk our legs off trying to find out the name of a stevedore kicked overboard by a mule? Yeah, but my city desk wants... The fact, my boy, that another poor man has given his life to engorge the interests is not news. It happens every ten minutes. Well, uh, kicked by a mule... That is the story. Men are not kicked overboard by mules every day. That is the story, not the name. Therefore... I move you, my esteemed contemporary, <laughs> that the name of the deceased be Ignaz Karpinski. Karpinski. That the name of his widow be Marie. Marie. That his age was 36, that he lived at 1777 Fort Avenue, and that he leaves 11 minor children. Charlie! <laughs> So the sad facts were reported in all three Baltimore papers the next day, along with various lively details that occurred to DeBecker with successive beers. This labor-saving device was in use the whole time I covered South Baltimore, and I never heard any complaint against it. Every one of the three city editors 
comparing his paper to the other two, was surprised and pleased to discover that his reporter always got names and addresses right. But we never stooped to faking. Well, hardly ever. Henry, my boy, that was a fine story on the judge and the wife beater. Did he actually... Where's that copy? I quote... The crime you're accused of committing, thundered Judge Grannon, is a foul and desperate one. And the laws of all civilized nations prohibit it under heavy penalties. I could send you to prison for life, I could order you to the whipping post, or I could sentence you to be hanged. But inasmuch as this is your first offense, I will be lenient. You will be taken to the House of Correction, and there confined for 20 years. In addition, you are fined $10,000, Henry. Did Gene Grannon actually say that before he suspended sentence on the poor boob? Well, not exactly. In, in the bar next door to court, he said he wished... All right, Henry. Nice story. Nice color. Writing. That's the thing, my boy. From now on, $16 a week. But never forget, my boy, that the newspaper business builds its profits on the lifeblood and ambition of youth. By this time, I had begun to reflect upon my trade... It worked me too hard. More than once I produced 5,000 words of copy between noon and midnight. Not in a single story. Why? But perhaps 12 or 15, every one of them requiring some legging. But there were compensations. Max put it best, I think, one night at the Steve Dawes Club. <laughs> Touches the hair of John Greyhead, dies like a dog. Henry, my boy, you're a good writer. Too good for this trade. Someday you'll get out. Well, I'd, I'd like to do a novel or a play. That's right, that's right. But where else, my boy, where else can you see the show from a reserve seat in the first row, huh? Y you mean light? I mean humanity. Two beers? A uh, light for me, dark for my nephew here. Humanity, Henry. The rest of the boobs have to wait in line and shove for places. But we, we get in by the side door. Here's to the fourth estate. Long may it slay. In Tegger, we ties, gonna risk way foolish. No naked boy. The Steve Doors Club. Max proposed me for membership. I shall be grateful as long as my vital juices flow and tongue shall wag. I learned to drink a potion called handset whiskey. The linotypers throve on it. Now, don't tell the other boys the secret, you see? You mix wood alcohol, snuff, tobacco sauce, and coffin varnish. It's the varnish gives it the body. The Steve Doors Club. A professional society it was. Met at Frank Junker's saloon opposite City Hall. Max explained the rules to me. Guests are allowed to remain only if they treat the house. Guests are not to include musicians unless they bring actors, to whom guest privileges can be accorded by majority vote. Uh, how about that fellow over there? What's he? Him? Oh, he's a street cleaner. They're allowed in on Saturday nights if proof of bath is furnished. He seems to know you. He's coming over. Never saw him before in my life. Now, another privilege here. Reporters get special rates on double crabs, five cents apiece. Hey, Max. Now, the 25-cent businessman's lunch is good Max, here, but... Max, Max, all Max. All right, all right. Henry... Meet my esteemed colleague, Mr. Walters, city editor of the opposition paper, whose dastard name shall never pass my lips in the company of callow youth. Mm. Listen, Max, that story about the two congressmen who got into a debate in Miss Nellie's music room. Oh, yes, yes, I've been wondering about that one. Well, it's accurate, Max. One of them dented the other's skull with a spittoon. Yeah, that's the way we got it. Max, are we going to print that? Now, Miss Nellie's got a nice reputation. Do we want to run her music hall down? Oh, I wouldn't want to do that, Chuck. Miss Nellie's an awfully good news source. Of course she is. Now, if it's all right with you, I thought we might put the accident up in Mount Vernon Place. The most respectable neighborhood in town. Fine, all right, I'll go along with you. Now, about... About the spittoon. Well, let's say one was opening an umbrella and the other turned suddenly. Oh, we can do better than that. Say they got kicked by a runaway hack horse. Uh, excuse me. What is it, my boy? Why not make it sound reasonable? Say they slipped on the icy pavement. On the icy pavement? Well, that's all right with me. Fine by me, Chuck. Ice it is. Mount Vernon Place. Set them up all around, Frank. <laughs> Thus, the cooperation of the press to protect a respected establishment, Miss Nellie's Music Hall. Scoops, beats, oh, there were plenty. But when the city editors agreed on the facts, that is how they appeared. 
nor ever did one break his word. There is honor among thieves, editors, and sometimes even editorial writers, giants of the embellished fact, the expanded truth. Mike Jones, our telegraph editor, claimed to have been a church organist once. Well, there was the baby in the bank vault. What was the baby doing there, Jonesy? Why, uh, Henry, the mother, being wealthy, had just forgotten about it in her eagerness to get the coupons over to the teller's window. So they sent for me. I set up my organ in front of the vault. Where did you get an organ, Jonesy? Uh, borrowed it from a nearby sailor's vessel. Now, I fooled around until I found a note that would vibrate steel and shook the time lock to pieces. Whatever happened to the baby? Grew up to be a congressman, I believe. Should have left him be. Boy! Jonesy had one failing. He took to handset whiskey on the job and began scouring the world for ancestors. Whenever the AP would announce the death of some eminent man, he'd stagger into the city room with the flimsy, sobbing piteously. What's the matter, Jonesy? Terrible thing, Max. Terrible. What is it, Jonesy? Let's have it, man. Bismarck is dead. Well, what of it? What do you care about him? You don't understand, boss. He... He was my father. When, in the course of one day's international wire, Jonesy had claimed for his parents a Confederate general, a Boston suffragette, a Marshal Lieutenant Hung Chang, that was November 7th, 1901, Max had to let him go. We were amazed when word drifted in that he was actually working as an organist in a Presbyterian church in a poor suburb, claiming to be a son of both John Calvin and John Knox. Giants and sinners, all of us. What we did, we did with great gobs of gusto. It was a time of thoroughness, anyway. I was sent to the Patapsco to cover a suicide one day. The unfortunate had been a bar owner. The cop couldn't even spell his last name. Kuno, all Kuno. The boob made the deal with the artist for free meals and beers that they do on a mural on his wall. What happened? Well, it drove him to self destroyal Henry. At the end of a month, they give him eight square feet of beautiful bims and peekaboo shabizies. But it ran him 120 meals and 500 some beers. We got him. We got him. Uh, let's go, Henry, and take your hat off. Now, the way we make it out, he climbed up on the rail, tied a rope to it, looped around his neck, swallowed a dose of arsenic, shot himself through the head then fell or jumped into the river. You always want to say it like that, my boy. Fell or jump. Respect the family's feelings. Sure, we worked sometimes and hard. Rewrite men were unheard of. Every reporter came back to the office and wrote his story himself. But the Herald City Room was the most modern in Baltimore. It had two telephones. Occasionally, somebody would get the right number. Harold Mencken. Henry, this is Miss Nellie. Yes, Miss Nellie. How are all the girls? Fine, fine, but you'd better get down here. The most extraordinary thing has occurred. Miss Nellie, I will take a hack immediately. Miss Nellie had appreciated my part in moving the Cuspidorian congressman out of her precinct, so she called me on this one. Her story was succinct. Peebles, the hack driver, brought her. He says she gets out of the train, climbs into his cab, and says, take me to an establishment for fallen women. So he took her here. Did he say why? Because she was so young and innocent, he didn't know what to make of her. So with that, she tells me she comes from somewhere near a bird called Red Lion, P.A. Uh, what's her name? Emmeline Baron Blicker. Father's one of them old rubes with whiskers. Very strict people. Yes, sir. Now, Emmeline had a beau in York, PA, name of Elmer. Whenever Elmer could get away from his work as train butcher on the Northern Central, he'd come out to the farm and they'd do a little hugging and kissing. Well, one day, old whiskers caught him at it and hollered Emmeline out of the house. 
Now, Emmeline was a great one for reading books. So while she packed a carpet bag, she remembered what girls in books done when they lost their honest name. They rush off to the nearest city and take up a life of shame, and their name is rubbed out of the family Bible. Well, wh why didn't she go to Philadelphia? Henry, nobody in their right mind goes to Philadelphia. Uh, what do you want me to do, Miss Nellie? Print the story and ask Papa's forgiveness? Oh, no. This ain't for printing. I just want you to give the little girl some advising. I got her under lock and key upstairs. Now, would you, Henry? You're a writer. You can do it. Presently, Miss Nellie fetched in Emmeline. She was no Lillian Russell, but she was far from unappetizing in a country sausage, smear case kind of way. Miss Nellie set her at her ease, and soon she was retelling her story to a strange young man with a celluloid collar. Then, out of my worldly wisdom, I spoke. My dear Miss Barnblicker, you have been grossly misinformed. I don't know what these works of fiction are that you have read, but they are wrong. The world no longer burns men for heresy nor women for witchcraft, and... Uh, it has ceased to condemn girls to lives of shame and death in the gutter for trivial derelictions such as those you acknowledge. The only thing that is frowned upon nowadays is getting caught. What do you think Emmy should do, Mr. Mankin? I advise you to go home, make some plausible excuse to your pa for lighting out, and resume your faithful ministrations to his cows. Now, you see, honey, Mr. Mencken says go home. Yes, and, and at the proper opportunity, take your bow to the pastor and join him in indissoluble love. It is the one safe, respectable, and hygienic course. The primrose path, my dear, is not for you. It is beset with thorns, heartburn, and corset stays. All the ladies of the resident faculty wept copious tears, took up a collection to which I added a dollar, the coachman another, and Miss Nellie ordered a box lunch for the triumphantly repentant return to the parental pastures. Emma promised to send Miss Nellie a picture postcard of Red Lion showing the new hall of the Knights of Pythias, but it never arrived. We were sinners in the days of giants. Giants. Giants everywhere. Huge drinkers, vast eaters, cheerful sinners, honest geniuses. Men, women, and fools. They were all bigger those days. And the story's too bigger and better. I shall never forget my best. <laughs> At midnight on Saturday, February 6th, 1904, by which time I was city editor, I put the Herald to bed, then joined the exercises of the Steve Dawes Club until 3.30. Catching a Nighthawk trolley, by 4 o'clock, I was snoring on my celibate couch in Holly Street. But at 11 a.m., how dare you disturb the peaceful Sabbath? Well, Mr. Mankin, there's a fire down in Hopkins Place. Uh, let it burn. Well, sir, it looks like a ding whistler. Well, then let the ding thing whistle. This is my day off. Well, Mr. Mankin, sir, the fire department's talking of sending to Washington for apparatus. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Send a hack up while I dress. <laughs> I hoisted my still malty bones from my couch, and ten minutes later, I was on my way to the office. That was at about 11.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 7th. It was not until 4 a.m. of Wednesday, February 10th, that my pants and shoes, or even my collar, came off again. What I had walked into was the great Baltimore fire of 1904, which burned a square mile out of the heart of the town and went howling and spluttering on for ten days. I can remember the eight-column stream ahead, I wrote, when three days later, burned out, we finally printed in Philadelphia. Fight for 
Baltimore wrecked by greatest fire in city's history. We had a story I'm here to tell you. Was there ever one that was fatter, juicier, more exhilarating to the journalists on the actual ground? Apparatus from Washington, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, every block in Midtown on fire. I need men. Cliff, Cliff, get on the phone, check the bars in the poorhouses, find me printers and reporters. If you need 20 pages, take them. If you need 50, take 50. They're going to money to the next block. All right, everybody out, everybody. Where are we going, boss? Out of here. We'll operate out of the Sloan Hotel. Everybody out! I went into it a boy. When I came out of it at last, I was settled and indeed almost a middle-aged man, spavined by responsibility. When it was all over, I returned to the ruins of the Herald. It was easy to find the place where my desk had been. The desk itself was a heap of white dust. My clippings were gone, my poems rejected short stories, spare collars, and trolley passes. Even my collection of pieces of hangman's ropes, I had always intended to present it sooner or later to the Smithsonian. <laughs> I did find my old copy hook, twisted as if it had died in agony. I took it with me. I was a man... I was 24 years old. Two years later, in 1906, by then managing editor, I was to read to my staff a notice from the publisher. Notice. Tomorrow, the property of the Herald Publishing Company will pass into new hands, and there will be no further publication of the Sunday Herald, the Evening Herald, or the Weekly Herald. In my desk, I had a volume of stories by a new writer named Joseph Conrad. The man could write. His people were sailors, not newspaper men, but they spoke for me. I remember my youth and the feeling that we'll never come back anymore. The feeling that I could last forever. Outlast the sea, the earth, the earth and all, and all men. men. Youth. All youth. The silly, charming, beautiful youth. The man on the bed has had a stroke. But he shifts his eyes. They fall on a twisted, agonized, old-time copy hook nearby on his desk. The eyes find fire somewhere, perhaps purloined from the past. He, a writer who is to be paralyzed, who is never to speak sense again afterward, opens his mouth and speaks. <laughs> yes, Mr. Mencken, what is it? <laughs> Bring on the angels. The angels will treat him kindly. Why? Simply for this alone, of all his writings. If, after I depart this veil, you ever remember me and have thought to please my ghost, forgive some sinner... And wink at a homely girl. Henry L. Mencken, 12 September 1880, 29 January 1956. Newspaper Man. The CBS Radio Workshop has presented Bring On the Angels from the notes of Henry L. Mencken as dramatized by Alan Sloan and produced and directed by Paul Roberts. 
The music was composed by Ben Ludlow and conducted by Alfredo Antonini. Louis Van Ruten was heard as the elder Menken, Mason Adams as the younger Menken, Ed Prentice as Max Ways. Others in the cast included Ethel Owen, Daniel Ocko, Jackson Beck, Walter Kinsella, John Gibson, Joe Helgeson, and Ian Martin. This is Bob Height inviting you to join us again next week for the CBS Radio Workshop. And remember, America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. CBS Radio Works Imagination, the theater of the mind. Today, the space merchants. Frederick Poles and C.M. Kornbluth's modern classic about the future when the wizards of high-pressure salesmanship take over. It's the story of Mitchell Courtney, a copy smith, star class with Fowler Shock and Associates, the biggest and greatest advertising firm of the future, and a tale of a rocket ride to Venus. As I rubbed depilatory soap on my face and waited for my beard to melt away, I switched on the news over the bathroom mirror. A funny little man whom I finally recognized as the president had given another speech last night. There was a shot of the Venus rocket squat and silvery on the Arizona sands. The report of rioting in Panama, the country underground probably. Then the phone rang. Hello. Chief, you're due at the office. Can't you see I'm dressing? Oof, why that time? Never mind. Why are you phoning me? Mr. Shawkins called a board meeting a half an hour early. He's going to name the head of the Venus Project today, so hurry. Uh, Hester, do me a favor. Will you call my wife, Dr. Nevin? Make an appointment at noon for Walter J. Silver. For who? Walter J. Silver. Are you crazy? Well, she won't talk to me, Hester. Use the fake name. Maybe I can get in. All right. Now get down here fast. <laughs> Down on Fifth Avenue, there wasn't a pedicab in sight. For a moment, I thought I had a Cadillac with two men peddling it, but somebody else got it. I did the best I could. I hopped aboard the rolling northbound sidewalk and found myself hemmed in by a milling, perspiring group of consumers. I got off at Shock and Towers and rode the express elevator to our offices on the 182nd floor. By sheer luck, I'd just taken my seat with my fellow board members when Fowler Shockin walked in. Gentlemen, good morning. Good, good morning, Mr. Shockin. Now, sit down, sit down. I'm going to stand for a moment. I've just come back on the moon rocket, as you know. I want to stretch my legs. How, How is our project on the moon, Mr. Shockin? Gentlemen, I'm proud. And I'm humble when I say it's successful. The mining ventures are bringing the people here on Earth. Many of the metals our forefathers exhausted long ago. The colonists seem quite untouched by the Conci revolutionists. Only instances of Conci sabotage in the past week. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear some reports on our other projects. Industrial anthropology? <clears throat> well, I wish to report that according to the Midnight Indices, all primary schools east of the Mississippi are being fed our Fowler Shock and Package school lunches, soy burger, and regenerated steak. <clears throat> now, these lunches are being packaged in our Stars alias Red 
which means that in the future, these young consumers will be completely conditioned to buying everything packaged in our special color, Stars Alias Red. They'll have no choice. Magnificent, magnificent. Now, let's hear from point of sale. <clears throat> oh, well, Mr. Shocken, sir, we have tested our latest beverage, Coffeeus, in 15 key cities. Each sample of Coffeeus contains three milligrams of a simple alkaloid. Nothing harmful, but definitely habit-forming. After ten weeks, the customer is hooked for life. A cure will cost a thousand dollars, so it's easier to buy more coffeeus. Three cups with every meal and a hot jug beside the bed at night. You know, uh, gentlemen, on my trip back from the moon, I begin to wonder, are we getting soft? No, sir, Mr. Shockhead. Thank you, Matt. But I wonder, were we doing enough for our consumers? Those consumers sleeping out there on the stairways. I know how lucky they are being able to buy the wonderful goods we make, package and sell them. Seaweed suits, soya burger, regenerated steak, coffees, straw butt cigarettes. But I still wondered, were we in the upper classes of advertising getting soft? But now I've decided Fowler Shock and Associates is not soft. That it's ready to meet a challenge greater than our organizing India into one giant cartel. Greater than our development of the moon. The greatest challenge the world of advertising and promotion has ever met. The colonizing of Venus. Shock and sense of the dramatic was never better. The touch of a button on the conference table before him, the lights were dimmed. Another touch of a button, and one wall of the room became a giant projection screen. We are looking at it again. The Venus Rocket. But this time we knew that one of us would be named to head the Venus Project. There she stands, gentlemen. The Venus Rocket. A thousand-foot monster. Surrounded now by steel scaffolding and a glow with welding torches. And here's how you'll see her six months from now, just before the takeoff. Just before the takeoff, there's the ship that Congress gave us, Fowler, Shock, and Associates. There's the ship that will span the stars, six and a half million tons of craft lightning and steel, a rocket-powered Mayflower for 1,800 pioneers seeking a new world to settle. Who will man it? Gentlemen, it's our job, A, to justify my buying enough congressmen to vote us that rocket. B, to sell 1,800 crazy consumers on giving up life on the earth for the sulfur and nitrogen and canned life on Venus. Yes, sir, Mr. Shocken. Yes, sir. I've made my choice of the man to head up our Venus rocket project. His name is Mitchell Courtney. <laughs> Congratulations, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Terrific break for a young and experienced guy. Yes, I'm flattered. Paolo seemed to be sure he uh, knew what he was doing. He seemed to be sure... Well, drop into my office any time you need advice. Yeah, thanks. I'll keep my back to the wall. <laughs> Good luck with Venus Project, Mitch. As far as I'm concerned, you can't sell people on life in a sardine can, even if you throw in a slave girl as a premium. This way, Mr. Silver. Dr. Nevins will see you now. Dr. Nevins. Mitch. Mitch, how did you get in? I used another name. I had to see you, Kathy. After all, you're my wife. I am not your wife. My certificate's on file. Mine isn't. It never will be. As soon as this year is up, we're through. Now, wait. I've got some news. Well, what is it? I've been put in charge of the Venus Project at the agency. Congratulations. Oh, Kathy, I love you. I'm, I'm not above using this promotion as an excuse to celebrate. Won't you go out on the town with me tonight? No. Well, I promise not to make a scene. You're the only one I want to celebrate with. All right, Mitch. My apartment at seven. And now let me take care of the sick people. <laughs> Outside Kathy's office, I hailed a two-man Cadillac pedicab and told them to step on it to Shock and Tower. I took the express elevator to the top of the towers. (laughs) 
I ran across the heliport to Shotgun's private helicopter. I had a very important date out of New York's newest airport at Montauk. I was due to meet the Earth's number one celebrity, Jack O'Shea, the first and only man who had ever set a rocket down on Venus and returned. As I landed, his jet was just coming in. And as I jumped to the ground, his jet moved up the runway toward me, and the place was crawling with women. Hmm, I'd forgotten what a swath Jack had cut with the women on his cross-country lecture tours. In fact, I'd almost forgotten until his Pinkerton cards cleared away through the vast crowds. I'd almost forgotten that Jack was a midget. Welcome to New York, Jack. Hello, Mitch. I hear you're number one boy now. Well, I still work for Father Shockin, Jack, but the Venus Rocket Project is mine. You're a fool to take it. Oh, you're joking. Am I? All right, fellas, Mr. Courtney's from Father Shockin. You can check off now. Yes, sir, Mr. O'Shea. Crummy guards. I never get a free moment. Well, that's the penalty for being a celebrity. This way, Jack, our helicopter's over here. Hey, hey look out, Mitch. That cargo ship... Darn fool, pilot. Run, Mitch. Run. Hey, Mitch. Mitch, you all right? Yes, I'm okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mitch, that was no accident. That pilot had orders to get one of us. And I think it was you. I had to start pumping Jack O'Shea about Venus. Shockin was paying him a fat retaining fee as a consultant. Jack didn't seem to want to talk, however. I showed him projections, maps, drawings, charts. But he barely said a word worth recording on tape. Suddenly an idea hit me. I made a phone call. Oh, Kathy. Kathy, do you know that this is the first time I've laughed, really laughed, since I came back to Earth? Is it, Jack? <laughs> I'm complimented. <laughs> and that this is the first time I've been alone with two people since I came back? I thought you'd had enough of being alone in that rocket on Venus. It, uh, it must have been a shattering experience, Jack. Kathy, you're the first person who seems to have understood that. Not exciting. Not thrilling. It was frightening. Shattering, as you said. It wasn't at all like what I've told the women's clubs, the reporters. That's been a pack of lies. The atmosphere, for instance. It's really formaldehyde. Embalming fluid. Who'd understand that except the dead? And the heat, who'd understand that? Who's lived in heat above the boiling point of water? If there was any water on Venus, which there isn't. Why did you go, Jack? That's easy. You're a doctor. You know about midgets. We eat one-third the food, drink one-third the liquids, inhale and exhale one-third the air full-size humans require. They'd never have gotten that test rocket to Venus if I hadn't been the size I am, if I hadn't been a child who's been laughed at, who'd turned test pilot to prove myself. <laughs> I was so small they could pack me into that test rocket with all the equipment necessary to sustain me. Eighty-three days. It takes a lot of equipment to sustain even a midget. Six of those days were on Venus. What was it like, Jack? I think the closest thing on Earth is the painted desert. The wind blows hard. It tears rocks apart. Soft rocks disappear and make dust storms. The light is <laughs> funny. Nobody ever saw a light like that on Earth. Orangey, brownish light. Very, very bright but threatening. And there's no water on Venus. 
No vegetation. No living thing. In the quiet of Kathy's apartment, Jack O'Shea talked for another hour. Then suddenly, with hardly a word of goodbye, he stood up and walked out. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for changing plans and letting me bring him. Don't mention it, Mitch. Do you uh, think you got it all on your little tape recorder? <laughs> you knew I had one in my pocket. I was sure you would have. And I hope you play it back to yourself over and over and over. Oh, Kathy. Yes, over and over and over. Until even you were convinced how hopeless your Venus project is. Hopeless? Oh, oh. our science boys have answers to all those objections. Mitch. Mitch, doesn't that mind of yours ever stop selling somebody something? Do you have to be a contriving, selfish Machiavelli who served Fowler, Shocken, and never people? People? You mean consumers? Oh, Mitch, must you always be top dog, making money, money, money without scruples, without ethics? What, what was that? A gunshot. Jack's out there. Well, I'll go and see. Oh, he's all right. Those are his steps. Mitch! Mitch, I was standing talking with a doorman and someone shot him in cold blood. Someone thought that doorman was you. Well, Mitch, trouble with the Venus Project already? Uh, personal trouble, Mr. Chalkin. Personal trouble? Yes. Yesterday afternoon, a cargo helicopter tried to drop its full load on me. And last night, somebody tried to shoot me. I had a couple of head-on collisions with Matt Runstead. Are you accusing a shocking man? That's treason. Killing an agency employee is an offense against the United States government. Any idea who's behind this? No. Well, it might be the Conchies, of course. Well, conservationists hate us. They're trying to sabotage everything we want to do, but they're crazy, mixed up, unorganized. They want to go back to the old days when we had natural wood, natural water, all that sort of pot trap. Forget them. Well, it could be another advertising agency. Uh, it could be. But look, Mitch, I made you copy Smith, star class, because I thought you could live up to your responsibilities. Now, you're young, but you have power. Five words from you, and a few months later, half a billion consumers will find their lives completely changed. That's power. Absolute power. So you must remember, power has its compensation and its hazards. That's all. <laughs> With this encouragement, I continued work on the Venus Project for the next six weeks. I even talked Kathy into giving up her patience for 48 hours and taking a flying trip with me to Arizona. I wanted to get the feel of the giant rocket itself as it was being built. Your credentials, please. Army intelligence, check. Navy intelligence, check. Air Force intelligence, check. FBI check, AEC check, CIA check, four A's check. I hope you two are all right. This way, please. Kathy and I followed the security officer into the vast steel shell of the Venus rocket. Well, 157 feet high. More cubits than the average New York apartment building. He took us into the dormitories for the 1,800 pilgrims. I had to sell on the idea of going to Venus. Low cycle food, water, and air regeneration. One third living space, one third drive, one third freight. It was an inferno and a promise of paradise, a monument to 22nd century engineering, and an incomparable monument to the sheer artistry of the machine. You always have to talk like a copy smith. Huh? Oh, well, I noticed you were impressed too, Kathy. Well, it draws me and repels me. I, I can't explain it. It excites I... me. Kathy, how would you like to go on to San Diego with me? Whatever for? Well, Matt Runstead's boys in our San Diego office have been gathering test figures on our sample colonizing campaign. Very helpful. No, I, uh, I can't come, Mitch. I'd love to, but... My patients back in New York need me. Oh. Well, then I'll get you aboard the return jet and see you in New York in 48 hours. I 
I didn't tell them I was coming to San Diego. I walked in on our entire San Diego staff playing push-button poker. What's the meaning of this? Oh, who are you, mister? Mitchell Courtney. Well, it's Courtney from New York, fellas. What are the reports on the Venus sampling, Harris? There aren't any, sir. Tally sheets, punch card codes, Sigma progress charts. Nothing on the attitudes of consumers toward life on Venus? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing. Uh, you've made up everything you've given me so far. Well, I'm afraid so, sir. Well, get New York on the line. I want Matt Runstead. Well, he's not there. Well, where is he? Well, he called this morning. He's taken off for Little America to look after our interests there. And left you holding the bag, huh? Find out when the next jet leaves for Little America. <laughs> Little America is a dollar trap for the tourists of the world, conceived and promoted by Fowler Shockin. A clerk at our hotel told me Runstead had checked in for a two-day tour of the Stars Alias Glacier. That he already had started out on the trail. I rented the glacier equipment, Antarctic coveralls, hood, gloves, boots, and power pack to warm them. And on my back, I had an EDF that went beep, beep when I was on the trail, and beep, beep when I lost my way in the snow. I set out after Runstead, beeping and still mad. I stopped after a while and cooked a meal in my electric pocket. It wasn't bad. Well, very bad. I had some coffee to pep me up, and then I set out again. My feet hit a drift, and I stumbled. The wind was blowing stronger now. The snow flurries were more frequent. I must have gone on another hour. How far in distance, I don't know. Then up ahead, I saw the figure of a man. Matt! Matt Blunstead! Miss! Miss Courtney! Matt, I've been following you! Me? What do you want with me, Miss? I want to know what happened in the San Diego office. What are you up to, Matt? A sudden blast of wind hurled snow into my face, and then, as it cleared, I saw Matt raising his skis high above his head. I saw them coming down toward me as he poleaxed me. The CBS Radio Workshop has brought you part one of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles Monroe, with original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlowski. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Stotts Cotsworth starred as Mitch Courtney, Virginia Kay as Kathy. The sound effects were devised by Tom Buchanan and Tom Perkins. The engineer, Jack Katz. This is Ted Pearson inviting you to join us next week for the second part of the CBS Radio Workshop production of the Space Merchants. The CBS Radio Workshop has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces. a cargo jet in the 22nd century. Here's a man we had trouble with in the hold, Lieutenant. What's his complaint? Well, he claims he's Mitchell Courtney, a copy smith star class of the Fowler's Shock and Advertising Company. He says he's been shanghaied aboard this jet. Roll up his sleeve. Let's see his social security tattoo. Uh, 1304 one three zero four dash nine nine seven four dash one four one six dash one five six dash one eight seven seven two three. Liar! Get him out of here. If he's with Shock and advertising, he'd have a low number. Can't you see it's been altered? Let me use the radio and talk to Mister Shock himself. <laughs> Where from, Mister Courtney? The dead? 
Take a look at this copy of today's New York Times, dated February 17th, 2157. Mitchell Courtney, head of the Venus Rocket Project at the Fowler Shock and Advertising Firm, has been found dead in Little America. Now, wait a minute. A man by the name of Matt Runstead knocked me out there. But can't you see that I'm alive? I am Mitchell Courtney. <laughs> you can prove that after ten years. Ten years? My manifest shows that you're not an advertising man. You're only a consumer named George Groby. You've signed up for ten years labor in Costa Rica. And those ten years begin as soon as this jet sets down. Take him back to the hole. CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The CBS Radio Workshop continues part two of The Space Merchants by C.M. Cornbluff and Frederick Pohl. Today, the workshop resumes the story of Mitchell Courtney, Copysmith's star class with the world's greatest advertising agency of the future, Fowler Shock and Associates. The tale of a rocket ride to Venus. I lay on my filthy bunk in the hold of the cargo jets, trying to think of a way to get back to New York. I wanted to find out why Matt Runstead had knocked me out and had me shanghaied. Who wanted to get me off the Venus Project, the advertising campaign we dreamed up to colonize Venus? I wanted to get back to my wife, Kathy. But there was nothing I could do until this cargo jet landed in Costa Rica. You scum skimmers, get in line. Now, what's your name? Mitchell Courtney. Mitchell Courtney. Oh, yeah. You're the bum we had trouble with on the plane. Oh, sorry, my name is George Groby. Oh, that's better. What do you want to do here, Groby? Got any choice of job? Anything. Anything the sun-drenched plantations of Costa Rica have to offer. I'm here to clasp the deft hands of independent farmers with pride in their work. I'm here to extract the juicy, ripe goodness of chlorella protein. Say, how'd you learn that? That's our prime impact commercial. Learn it. I wrote it. But don't let that stand in your way. Groby, you're not going to get anywhere being a wise guy. Yes, sir. You're assigned as a Chlorella Scum Skimmer Third Class. Report for duty and assignment to a bunk at Tier 48 in Dormitory Z. <laughs> Part of Florella products is a strange, glutinous, ever growing organism called Chicken Little. It provides one third of the world with the protein that replaces old fashioned meat. It grows in huge, sweating vats. And only the constant slicing keeps it from overgrowing and covering Costa Rica and its neighbors, or in time, the face of the earth. I had written of its delights many times in the agency, but I now came to know it at first hand. I was assigned to skim the scum which dripped from its side. <laughs> she stinks pretty bad, don't you, Orke? She's high, Herrera. She's high. <laughs> but she's beautiful, chicken little, eh, Orke? Well, but she's pretty awful. <laughs> Orke, this is the first time I ever hear you say the advertisements are wrong. <laughs> Go into town with me tonight, eh, Orke? I'd made one friend, a master slicer named Herrera. He'd been aloof and standoffish at first, befitting his high station, but now he's befriended me, done me a lot of favors. I didn't know why until that night we went on the town to a dark, almost empty cafe. Porque, I have watched you very carefully. You don't belong here doing this work. Well, don't I? How am I ever going to get out? You have the brains, Orke. Not like the others. Oh, thanks. What good are brains here? I'm so tired half the time I can't think. Orke, I'm going to put my life in your hands. Do you ever hear of the Concis? The Concis, of course. You know what the Concis stand for? Sure. World Conservation Association. I mean their ideas. Oh, I know you have heard they are dangerous. They want a revolution. They want to go back to the old ways. Real meat, real grains and fruit. They want a break for the consumer, they say. Nothing in packages, nothing tested and guaranteed. Do you think they are so wrong? After six months here? Here, Orke, 
take this pamphlet, read it, then talk to me again, or denounce me, I am not afraid. The Concy Underground opposed everything a self-respecting 22nd century advertising man like me believed. I would have denounced Herrera to the Chlorella authorities the next day, except for one thing. If I joined the Concy's first, if I learned their organization and secrets, I'd have a better bargaining position in getting back to New York. I joined them. The irony was the Concy's were a lot better organized than I'd suspected, and after six months, they decided they needed me in New York. And it was they who engineered my return to the city. I returned to New York on a secret mission for the Concies. Two weeks after being in New York, I got the secret sign to attend a Concy meeting at the Metropolitan Museum. As my first taste of luxury in more than a year, I hailed a Cadillac pedicab and told the driver to take me to the Metropolitan Museum. Can't do better than to visit the Metropolitan Museum, mister. World's greatest masterpieces. Don't miss the painting on the first floor. It's called, I Dreamed I Was Ice Fishing in My Wonder Form Bra. Yeah, I read it brought a million and a half. Not a shot less. Don't miss the theatrical collection. They got dancing cigarettes. Say, uh, do you mind if we stop a second? These new Cadillac cabs are hard to pedal. Okay, get out. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> the idea of the gun. I recognize you when you walked out of Grand Central, Mr. Mitchell Courtney. What, what do you want with me? I want you to get out of the cab and come with me to the Taunton Agency. They've offered a big, fat, juicy reward for anybody who'll bring them the inside story of Fowler Shock and Venus Rocket Project. And you're the boy who headed it up. So you're the boys who shanghaied me and got me off the project. No, we're not. I don't know who did. But we're sure glad we found you. The boy with all those nice secrets about colonizing Venus. Taunton wants those secrets. Come on, get out of here. Drop that gun. Drop it or I'll break your neck. I grabbed the gun and hit him behind the ear. Then I ran across Fifth Avenue and lost myself in a group of consumers on the sidewalk rolling back towards Shocking Towers. I jumped off and ran to the express elevator. down the corridor to Shockin's office. It was dark and deserted. Then down the corridor, I saw a light under my old office door. I walked up to it, and I didn't knock. Esther. <gasps> Mitch! Oh, no. Esther, it's all right. I'm alive. Oh, but, but Mitch, they said you were dead. Who, Matt Lundstedt? Yes. Everyone believed him. Did my wife, did Kathy believe him, Hester? Yes. Well, get her on the phone for me. Call her. Oh, well, she's disappeared, Mitch. What? No one's been able to find her. After the news of your death, she just closed her office and disappeared. Maybe Shockin knows where she is. Where is Shockin, Hester? Well, he caught the moon rocket yesterday morning. He was going over your notes on the Venus project. He's taking and... it over? Yes, from Matt Rudd's said. It was going badly. I'll bet. Matt's trying to ruin our campaign. Hester, you've got to get me aboard the next moon rocket. Use the name George Groby. Runstead and a Taunton agency will try to stop a man named Courtney. I've got a lot to tell, Mr. Shockin. <laughs> Passengers, this way, please. We are now on the moon. Tourists to the moon to the left, visitors on business to the right. Now, sir, name? George Groby, copy analyst, class four. Groby, copy analyst, four. Oh. God, yes. this way, please. Yes, sir. This man says his name is George Groby. Fine. You're under arrest, Groby. Let go of me. I'm here to see Fowler Shockin. Mr. Runstead down on the earth told us to expect you. I don't know what you're talking about. You may be interested to know that your secretary, Miss Hester Barnes, is being tried for treason. Treason? She is charged with forging documents and passing them to you. The 43rd Amendment of the United States Constitution. Treason to any registered advertising agency is punishable by death. Hold him for the return passage and a similar charge, guard. 
guard had his nightstick in my back as we walked down the streets, past storefronts with signs, moon-made fashions, stunning conversation pieces prove you were here. Souvenirs of Luna, cheapest in town. Moon suits rented 50 years without a blowout. Ye tasty goodie shop on ye moon. Warren Astron, readings by appointment only. Call it. Huh? What is it? You sure your name's Groby? Positive. You ever know a man named Herrera? Well, yes, Herrera and I... Wish we could find out what you're up to, Groby. Stand out of Costa Rica to report in New York, never show up at a meeting there, then you turn up at Fowler Shockin's agency and get your passage on a moon rocket. You mean you're a... Shut up! up. Now, go into Astron's there. He'll hide you till our top boss up here comes. First, take my nightstick and knock me out with it, then point it at the streetlight and blast it out. Hit me hard, but not too hard. Oh, this is going to cost me two strikes and a week's pay. Oh. <laughs> My Conti training was really paying off. Astron took me in stride, hid me in a room under his floor, gave me something to eat, and I fell asleep. I waked with a light pouring down into my face. You can come up now, Groby. The chief is here to see you. In that room back there. I'll see you're not disturbed. Thanks. here into the light, Mr. Groby. Kathy, Kathy, what are you doing here? Oh, Mitch, why didn't you stay on ice? What crazy thing have you done to turn up here? Go on, I'm crazy. Why shouldn't I be crazy? My wife, a kingpin consi. <laughs> what a shock. You, a star-class copysmith, married to a consi. Matt's one of you. You got Matt Runstead to Shanghai me. Mm, like a fool. I thought if I could get you away from Fowler Shock and I might bring you to your senses. Trying to decide what was best for poor little Mitch. Mitch, I loved you. You loved me. You actually were in love with me. Yes, I was, in spite of everything you stood for. But you are not going to talk to Fowler Shockin. I'm not. Mitch, I don't want you to ruin Venus the way you've ruined the world. A woman of ideals. What do you plan to do with me? Are you going to report to Fowler Shockin? Yes. Then there is nothing I can do for you. Then let me tell you something before you turn me over to Astron and your friends outside. I've been shanghaied, robbed of my name, forced to work like a slave in the tropics... I've had all I can take of others deciding what to do about poor old Mitch. Your guard friend left this nightstick with me. You know what it does, Kathy. Get on that phone and call Fowler Shockin and tell him where I am. Then get out. Take your friends with you. I'll give you two days to vanish. But this time, stay out of sight forever. Go on. Call Shockin. This is Dr. Nevin, Mitchell Courtney's widow. I'd like to speak to Mr. Shockin, please. Mitch, my boy, I'm going to fatten you up and turn Venus section back to you. You know my policy. Find a good horse, give him his head, and back into the limit. You've never let me down. And Venus section's in rotten shape. Nobody's applying for space on the Venus rocket. The whole campaign's at sea. The indices are down to 3.37 for North America. They should be four and rising. We've got to get those 1,800 consumers on board the Venus rocket. When we got back to Earth, Matt Runstead had disappeared. I arranged for Hester to be released from Alcatraz, and she returned in triumph in Shockin's private jet. I began to whip the Venus rocket project back into shape. I was living again, writing new jingles, starting new rumors by word of mouth, developing new techniques, until finally... Mitch, the big day has come. 1,800 consumers have volunteered to ride our rocket to Venus. Now, I've arranged for Congress to meet tomorrow. And my boy, I want you to address them as Fowler Shockin's personal representative requesting a takeoff date. Gentlemen, the Senate is now in session. You all received a recording of the opening prayer last night. So let's hear from the senator from Chlorella Limited. 
Uh, the senator from Colorado Limited passes in deference to the senator from Alaska Mining. The uh, senator from Alaska Mining passes in favor of the senator from United Steel and Smelting. The senator from United Steel and Smelting passes in favor of the senator from Caribbean Fruits. The senator from Caribbean Fruits passes in favor of the senator from Yummy Cola. My dear fellow senators, I thank you all for graciously allowing me to speak before we pass upon this very important bill concerning the Venus rocket. The people of this great republic of ours, extending from Atlantic seaweed to Pacific fish... Suddenly I sensed something had gone wrong. I had been sitting back thinking about Kathy, thinking of her face, her voice, her smile before we'd married. I was wondering where she was, what she thought of all this. Then the speaker's voice focused my attention upon him... I hadn't been worried. Fowler Shonkin owned two-thirds of this gathering. But there was something about old yummy Cola that troubled me. He wasn't addressing his fellows. He was looking up, addressing me. A big grin on his face. I leaned forward just in time for the weenie. In a brief discussion I had before this session, Mr. Taunton gave me some information in private. But I feel it my public duty to ask a couple of questions of Mr. Courtney, who is present. I would like to ask, Mr. Courtney, if the name of George Groby is familiar to him, I would like to ask if Mr. Courtney is George Groby. I would like to ask, Mr. Courtney, if when he was known as George Groby, he was a member in good standing of the World Conservationist Association, known to most of us loyal Americans as the country. Below, there was a raging tidal wave of taunting congressmen and shocking congressmen battling. For the first time in history, shots were being fired in anger on the Senate floor. If Taunton hadn't tipped off old Yummy Cola, I knew who had the conscience. Somehow I didn't mind. I realized that for some time now, I'd really been one of them. A little man beside me dressed in black suddenly seized my arm and led me out the side door. You'll find a car outside, ready to take you to the airport, Mr. Courtney. What airport? Don't stop to ask questions. Just go wherever you're taken. You'll be protected. Fat chance. You'll be all right. I guarantee that. Who are you? The president. Good luck. God bless you. I had to admire that little man's courage. He'd walked back into that raging den of lions without a quiver. Aboard the jetliner, I wondered what would happen to him when they found out he'd sent me to safety. Or was it to safety? I tried to ask questions of the men aboard the liner, but they looked the other way and kept absolutely quiet. You can climb out now, Mr. Courtney. They're all ready for you over there at the Venus rocket. There's no time to lose. Say, look here, I don't want to go to Venus. <laughs> Who's in charge here? I won't go aboard that rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's aboard but you. Come on, Mr. Courtney. In you go. Last passenger, fasten them in for the takeoff. Last passenger, ready for the takeoff. Kathy, where are you? Up here, over your head. Stop floating around. Come down here and unfasten me. All right, I'll try. But we're beyond the law of gravity. We're on the way to Venus with 1,800 conservationists. How did you get out of a harness? A steward set me free, then floated away. I have to talk to you. <laughs> me? You threatened to kill me, remember? Yes, I remember. You could have, Mitch, in time. But you never told Shockin who or where I was. Why didn't you? Because I love you, Kathy. And I think that for a long time I've been coming over to your side. And you're willing to face life on Venus? Yes. 
It's time people got a break. People, not consumers. Oh, I like hearing you say that. And I love you too, Mitch. Oh, Mitch. Mitch, you broke my hold on your harness. Come back here. I just wanted to put my arms around you. Oh, there'll be plenty of time for that on Venus. Come back here. Unbuckle your harness and catch me. I can't. Uh, who invented this crazy gimmick anyway? Oh, Mitch. Mitch, you stop talking like an advertising man. Kiss me. CBS Radio Workshop has presented part two of The Space Merchants, adapted for radio by Charles S. Monroe. Original music composed and conducted by Samuel Matlowski. Produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. The CBS Radio Workshop has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, The Eternal Joan, the story of Jeanne d'Arc, as provided by historians, novelists, and playwrights of different nationalities and points of view. Narrated on tape by Louis Cronenberger, author, playwright, and critic. And dramatized by Henry E. Fritch, with Elspeth Eric as Joan. Saint Margaret, have pity. Pray for her, all ye saints. Oh, Lord God, deliver have mercy her. on her. Burn the witch! Death to the witch! Have pity, Saint Margaret! Warm her up, the soldier! Have her! Tie it on the Save wall! Burn her! Let's get Save it over with! Burn her to the end! A saint. This was the old market square in the French city of Rouen on the morning of the 30th of May, 1431. The occasion was the burning of a young peasant girl, not much past her 19th birthday. Her name was Jeanette. Her family name was Dark. First without an apostrophe, then with one, after Joan had got her family ennobled. We now know her as Joan d'Arc, or in the English equivalent, Joan of Arc. Joan died a fearful death on that pleasant May morning more than five centuries ago. She was tied to a wooden stake, standing on a pile of kindling and firewood, and slowly charred. She had first been excommunicated by her church. We, having seen and weighed all there is to see and weigh, 
have said and decreed that in the simulation of your revelations and apparitions you have been pernicious, seductive, presumptuous, of light belief, rash, superstitious, a witch, a blasphemer of God, a despiser of him in his sacraments, a prevaricator of the... These are actual teaching, quotations from the official record of the trial of Joan of Arc before Austin, an ecclesiastical Matthew, court at Rouen. Erring gravely at our faith, and by this means having rashly trespassed against God and the Holy Church. Therefore, we denounce you as a rotten member which must be cast out and given over to the secular power. The secular power to which Joan was given over by her own countrymen, that is, the English army of occupation, did not even take the trouble to hold a trial or to make formal charges. Her sentence took less than a minute. What now, priest? Are you going to keep us here to dinner? Take her! Take her! Jesus! Jesus! A kind English soldier broke a stick in half and tied it together in the form of a cross. Joan kissed the makeshift emblem and clutched it tightly to her body. A short time later, she was dead. Yet only 25 years later, Joan was cleared of all the accusations that had been brought against her, and she was officially declared a saint in 1920. More than 40,000 statues have been erected to her in France alone, plus many others in other lands, including our own United States. Why? Thousands of books and plays have been written about her in various languages. Why? Here is our own Samuel Clemens. Caesar carried conquest far, but he did it with the trained and confident veterans of Rome. And he was a trained soldier himself. Napoleon swept away the disciplined armies of Europe, but he also was a trained soldier, and he began his work with patriot battalions, inspired by the miracle-working new breath of liberty. Joan, a mere child in years, ignorant, unlettered, a poor village girl, unknown and without influence, found a great nation lying in chains, helpless and hopeless under an alien domination. Its king was cowed, resigned, and preparing to flee the country. And Joan laid hands upon this nation, this corpse, and it rose and followed her. But this point alone is not enough to explain the universal appeal which Joan the Maid has had for all the world. Yes, even for the Marquesas Islanders in the Pacific, who to this day are convinced that the English ate Joan, or else why would they have wanted to roast her? There is little doubt about the bare facts, since fortunately complete records of Joan's long trials have come down to us. But for the touchstones of human understanding, we have to turn to those who have tried to interpret Joan on the basis of individual insight her historians, novelists, and playwrights of different nationalities and points of view. I'll start at the beginning. It's always nicer at the beginning. I'll begin with my father's house when I was still very small. I'm in the meadow now, watching my sheep. It's the first time I hear the voices after the evening Angelus. That was the voice of Joan herself, describing her first experience with the mystic powers that controlled the rest of her short life. The scene is taken from the play The Lark, written by Jean Arnouille of France and adapted by Lillian Hellman. I still wear my hair in a thick braid. I'm not thinking of anything. I know only that God is good and that he keeps me pure and safe in this little corner of the earth near Damremy, this one little piece which has not yet been destroyed by the English invaders. I live here happy with my father, my mother, and my brothers. Then suddenly, 
Someone behind me touched my shoulder. I know very well there is no one behind me. I turn. There is a great blinding light. The voice is grave and sweet. I never heard that kind of voice before. That day the voice only said, Be a good girl, Joan, and go often to church. Well, I was good, and I did go often to church, so I didn't understand why the voice spoke that way, and I was frightened. But I didn't tell anybody. I don't know why. Then came the second time. It was the noon, Angelus. A light came over the sun and was stronger than the sun. There he was. I saw him. An angel in a beautiful white robe that must have been ironed by someone very careful. He didn't tell me his name that day, but later I found out he was Monseigneur the Blessed St. Michael. Joan, go to the aid of the King of France and give him back his kingdom. But, Monseigneur, I'm only a girl. I don't even know how to ride a horse. You will go first to Monsieur de Baudricourt. He will give you men's clothes and have you taken to the Dauphin. St. Catherine and St. Margaret will go along to help you. The Dauphin, of course, was Charles, son and presumably legal heir of the last French king, Charles VI. Charles, the father, was generally regarded as mad and had signed a treaty with England disavowing his son and recognizing Henry V of England as his heir. He had also ceded all of France north of the River Loire, which gave the English justification for their French campaigns. The Dauphin was weak, yet this was the man for whose coronation at Reims, as Charles VII of France, Joan was to give her life. Her voices had told her that. So Joan received her mission. She didn't leave her native Don Remy right away, she was 17 before she felt ready to set out into the unknown world to help rescue France. For a poetic view of Joan's farewell to her beloved countryside, there is nobody better to turn to than that German romanticist to end all romanticists, Friedrich Schiller, and his play, The Maid of Orleans. Beloved glades, ye lone and peaceful valleys, fare ye well. Through you, Johanna, nevermore may stray. Johanna goes and ne'er returns again. Such is to me the spirit's high behest. To Gaul's heroic sons, deliverance bring. Relieve beleaguered realms and crown thy king. And so, instructed by a power higher than any earthly authority, Jeanette reluctantly left her childhood home in Don Remy to become the maid. A few months later, in Reims, Joan saw her great dream come true. The Dauphin, her Dauphin, was anointed with the heaven-sent oil and formally crowned King Charles VII of France. When Joan left home, Papa Jacques and Mama Isabel knew only that their daughter was going to visit her favorite uncle in the village of Biri. But Biri was near Vaucouleur, the residence of Messire Robert de Baudricourt, whom the archangel had directed Joan to see as the first step in her mission. The actual meeting, when it took place, may well have been one of the most hilarious interviews of all time. Here is the version of Bernard Shaw, whose play St. Joan 
is generally regarded as the classic interpretation of Joan's character and behavior. The loud voice is that of the captain, Sire Robert de Baudricourt. But the first voice is that of his unhappy steward, fresh out of eggs. Sir, I tell you, there are no eggs. There will be none, not if you kill me for it as long as the maid is at the door. The maid? What maid? What are you talking about? The girl from Lorraine, sir. From Don Remy. Thirty thousand thunders I told you to throw her out. You have fifty men-at-arms and a dozen lumps of able-bodied servants to carry out my orders. Are they afraid of her? She is so positive, sir. Positive? Now, see here, I'm going to throw you downstairs. No, sir, please. Well, stop me by being positive. It's quite easy. Any slut of a girl can do it. Sir, sir, you cannot get rid of her by throwing me out. You see, sir, you are much more positive than I am. But so is she. You parcel of curs. You are afraid of her. No, sir. We are afraid of you, but she puts courage into us. She really doesn't seem afraid of anything. Perhaps you could frighten her, sir. Perhaps. Where is she now? Down in the courtyard, sir, talking to the soldiers as usual. She shall talk to me a bit. Hello. You there. Come up here. You, soldiers, show her the way. And shove her along, quick. She wants to go and be a soldier herself. She wants you to give her soldiers clothes, armor, sir, and a sword. Good morning, Captain Squire. Captain, you are to give me a horse and armor and some soldiers and send me to the Dauphin. Those are your orders from my lord. Orders from your lord? And who may your lord be? Go back to him and tell him that I am neither duke nor peer at his orders. I am squire of Vaudricourt, and I take no orders except from the king. Yes, squire, that's all right. My lord is the king of heaven. Why, the girl's mad. Uh, they all say I'm mad till I talk to them, squire. But you will see that it is the will of God that you are to do what he has put in my mind. It is the will of God that I shall send you back to your father with orders to put you under lock and key and thrash the madness out of well, you. You think you will, squire, but you'll find it all coming quite different. You said you would not see me, but here I am. Now, listen to me. I am going to assert myself. Please do, Squire. The horse will cost 16 francs. It's a good deal of money, but I can save it on the armor. I shall not want many soldiers. The Dauphin will give me all I need to raise the siege of Orléans. To raise the siege of Orléans? Yes, Squire. That is what God is sending me to do. Well, I am damned. No, Squire. God is very merciful. You will go to paradise. And your name will be remembered as my first helper. Joan got her horse, her equipment, and her escort. But when her small party arrived at Chinon after a hard ride through 350 miles of winter landscape, she still faced her main problem. How was she, a poor, illiterate country girl, going to get an audience with the Dauphin himself? News of her arrival at Chinon finally reached even the ears of the Dauphin, and Joan was in the end admitted to the court. But to make sure that she was really divinely inspired, Charles and his courtiers decided to play a trick on her. Someone else would sit on the throne and pretend to be the Dauphin, while Charles himself would hide in the crowd of attendants, making himself inconspicuous. Here are two versions of what happened when Joan entered the royal hall of the chateau at Chinon. The first is that of Schiller. As Joan enters, she surveys the resplendent hall, then looks up at the army commander, Dunois, who in this version is impersonating the Dauphin on his throne. Dunois welcomes her. Art thou the wondrous maiden? Dunois of Orléans, thou wilt tempt thy god. This place abandoned which becomes thee not. To this more mighty one the maid is sent. Joan walks firmly toward the Dauphin, who is peering from behind the back of a knight. She kneels before him. Charles is understandably surprised. Maiden, thou never hast seen my face before. Whence hast thou this knowledge? Thee I saw when none besides save God in heaven saw thee. Bethink thee, Dauphin. In the bygone night, when all around lay buried in deep sleep, Thou from thy couch didst rise and offer up an earnest prayer to God. Disclose to me my prayer, and I shall doubt no more that God inspired thee. 
Thou didst pray that if there were appended in this crown unjust possession, or if heavy guilt occasioned this most lamentable war, God would accept thee as a sacrifice, have mercy on thy people, and pour forth upon thy head the chalice of his wrath. Who art thou, mighty one? Whence comest thou? Shall I indeed withstand mine enemies? France, I will lay submissive at thy feet. And Orleans, sayest thou, will not be surrendered? The Loire shall sooner run its waters back. Shall I in triumph enter Reims? I, through ten thousand foes, will lead thee. In the modern Anui Hellman play, the Dauphin is no storybook king. As the scene opens, Charles is lolling indolently on his throne, playing with one of those cup and ball toys that still delight children today. Enter the Archbishop of Reims. Oh, Archbishop, you have arrived just in time. I am on the point of governing. There is not time for jest, Your Majesty. We are faced with the dangerous problem of this peasant girl. The people are in love with her. They are convinced that God has sent her to you and that she alone can save France. Mm. They think she works miracles. I have sympathy for them. They are as desperate as I am. As for this girl, I have no curiosity about her. I know too many people as it is. And a messenger from God doesn't sound very amusing. But I want to be a good king and please my people. Therefore, I shall see this girl. I think... I might like to play a trick on her. Let's put a page upon the throne. Let's clothe him in the royal doublet with the fewest patches. He'll look better than I do. And let us enjoy the sight of God's envoy pleading her cause to a page boy. And so, when Joan timidly enters the throne room, it's a young court attendant who is impersonating the Dauphin. She sees through the deception, however, just as quickly as she did in the case of Dunois in Schiller's play. She surveys the crowd and walks straight to Charles, who tries to run from her. What do you want? Noble Dauphin, I am Joan the Maid. The King of Heaven has sent me to tell you that you must be anointed and crowned in the city of Reims. Well, 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 that is splendid, Mademoiselle, but Reims is in the hands of the English, as far as I know. Uh, How shall we get there? We will fight our way there, Noble Dauphin. First we will take Orléans, and then we will walk to Reims. God told me, noble Dauphin. You haven't come here to kill me? No. No, of course not. You have an honest face. I've lived so long with these pirates that I've almost forgotten what an honest face looks like. Are there many people who have honest faces? Many, sire. No, I never see them. Well, all right. Start boring me. Tell me that I ought to be a great king... Yes, Charles. In the end, Joan gets what she wants. Her army, her appointment, and a dazzling white suit of armor especially made for her. Joan's effect upon the English troops, who had been just about invincible until she appeared, is described by Schiller. The voices are those of English soldiers, except for the rather heart-rending lament of their commander, Sir John Talbot. The maiden in the camp! Impossible, it cannot be. How come she in the camp? Why, through the air. The devil aided her. Why? Why? We're dead men! They heed me not. They stay not at my call. The sacred bonds of discipline are loosed. I cannot rally even the smallest troop. Who is she then? The irresistible, the dread-inspiring goddess who doth turn at once the tide of battle and transform to lion's bold a herd of timid deer. A woman snatched from me all martial fame. The maiden comes. Fly, General. Fly. Well, as we know, the army with which Joan took the field did liberate Orleans and within a few months had cleared the road to Reims so that the Dauphin could be properly consecrated King of France. Joan's army then turned to liberate Paris, but the siege of Paris was called off. Joan, wounded for the third time in a year, was captured some months later by Burgundian soldiers 
who were then allied with the English. The Burgundians sold her to the English command for 10,000 French pounds, a sum normally paid only for the highest nobles. The English, in turn, handed Joan over to a French ecclesiastical court convened in English-occupied Rouen for trial on charges of sorcery, witchcraft, or anything else that would lead to excommunication. The idea was that once Joan had been convicted on any such charge by her own countrymen, the English would be free to condemn an executor for the damage she had caused them. And that's the way it worked out. Joan, commonly called the maid, having been captured within our diocese of Beauvais and having been surrendered, dispatched, given and delivered to us as a person vehemently suspected of heresy... After weeks of badgering, Joan, exhausted and terrified of death by fire, finally put her mark to a paper, which she was unable to read, admitting all the sins charged against her and forswearing them for the future. She even resumed female clothing for a short time. But when she found out that her promised acquittal would mean only life imprisonment on a diet of bread and water, the bread of sorrow and the water of affliction, as the judges put it, she decided that she preferred a swifter death, however horrible. Bernard Shaw describes her so-called relapse like this. They told me you were fools. You promised me my life, but you lied. You think that life is nothing but not being stone dead? It is not the bread and water I fear. Bread has no sorrow for me and water no affliction. But to shut me from the light of the sky and the sight of the fields and flowers, to chain my feet, to make me breathe foul, damp darkness and keep me from everything that brings me back to the love of God, I could do without my war horse. I could drag about in a skirt. I could let the banners and the trumpets and the knights and soldiers pass me and leave me behind as they leave the other women. If only I could still hear the wind and the trees, the larks and the sunshine, the young lambs crying through the healthy frost, and the blessed church bells. But without these things, I cannot live. What I am, I will not denounce. What I have done, I will not deny. And we still have from Joan what is perhaps the most touching answer ever given to a life and death question in the history of Inquisition. Joan, do you now believe yourself to be in a state of grace? If I am not... May God put me there. If I am, may God so keep me. That was Joan of Arc. Did anyone ever understand her? Do we understand her today? Perhaps Jean Anouy said it best. You cannot explain Joan any more than you can explain the tiniest flower growing by the wayside. There's just a little living flower that has always known, ever since it was a microscopic seed, how many petals it would have and how big they would grow, exactly how blue its blue would be and how its delicate scent would be compounded. There is just the phenomenon of Joan, as there is the phenomenon of a daisy, or the sky, or a bird. What pretentious creatures men are, if that is not enough for them.
You have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and The Eternal Joan, a treatment of the Joan of Arc story. Written by Henry E. Fritsch, with Elspeth Eric as Joan and Louis Cronenberger, drama critic for Time magazine, as tape narrator. The Eternal Joan was produced and directed by Paul Roberts, music composed and conducted by Alexander Steinert. Included in tonight's cast were Alan Hewitt as Baudricourt and Jack Manning as the Dauphin. Also heard were John Gibson, Daniel Ocko, Bob Dryden, Louis Van Ruten, Roger DeCoven, Ed Prentice, Guy Rep, Ellen Muir, Gladys Holland, and Ruth Tobin. This is Bob Height inviting you to join us next week when, from Hollywood, we'll present A Portrait of Paris, a word picture of the French capital, recorded by David Schoenbrunn, chief of the Paris Bureau of CBS News. America listens most to the CBS radio network. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight's presentation, The Little Prince, by the late Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I had an accident with my airplane in the desert of Sahara. Something was broken in my engine. Being alone, I set myself to attempt the difficult repairs. It was a question of life or death. I had only enough drinking water to last about a week. The first night, I went to sleep on the sand a thousand miles from any human habitation. You can imagine my amazement when at sunrise I was awakened by an odd little voice. If you please. Draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet completely thunderstruck. I saw a most extraordinary small person who stood examining me with great seriousness. He seemed neither to be fainting from fatigue or hunger, or thirst or fear. When I was able to speak, I said, What are you doing here? If you please, draw me a sheep. I've... I don't know how to draw. That doesn't matter. Draw me a sheep. When I was only six, I had drawn a picture of a boa constrictor from the outside, digesting an elephant. The grown-ups couldn't understand it. They told me it looked like a hat. They advised me to lay aside my drawing and devote myself to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. I did because it's tiresome for children to be always and forever explaining things to them. Would you please draw me a sheep? The little fellow was so insistent I took out my pen and some paper. Since I had never drawn a sheep, I drew for him my picture of the boa constrictor that looked like a hat. No, no, no. I do not want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is very dangerous, and an elephant is cumbersome. Where I live, everything is very small. What I need is a sheep. Please draw me one. I made several attempts. Then, being in a hurry to start working on my engine, I tossed off a drawing of a box that had some air holes in it and explained that the sheep was inside. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think the sheep will require a great deal of grass? Oh, there will surely be enough. It's a very small sheep I've given you. Not so small. Look. Look through the air hole. My sheep has gone to sleep. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. It was only from words dropped by chance that little by little everything was revealed to me. I learned, for example, that the little prince came from another planet. 
and that his planet was scarcely any larger than a house. I should remind the grown-ups that in addition to the great planets, there are hundreds of others, some too small to be seen through telescopes, called asteroids, which are designated by numbers. The planet the little prince came from is asteroid B612. As each day passed, I would learn more about the little prince's planet. On the third day, I heard about the catastrophe of the baobabs. Isn't it true that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, yes, that's true. Then it follows they also eat baobabs. Baobabs? But it would take a herd of elephants to eat anything as gigantic as a baobab. Before they grow so big, don't baobabs start out by being little? Entirely correct. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? I knew a planet inhabited by a lazy man. He neglected three little bushes. What happened? A catastrophe. The baobab spread over the entire planet, bored clear through it with their roots, split it in pieces. So you must be careful. It is a question of discipline. I must attend to my planet each morning, as I do myself. It's tedious. I need the sheep. On the fifth day, thanks to the sheep, the secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. If a sheep eats little bushes, does it eat flowers? A sheep too? eats anything it finds in its reach. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. The thorns? What use are they? Don't you ever let go of a question once you've asked it. Can't you see I'm busy fixing my plane? There's so little drinking water left, I must finish the repairs. But you haven't answered my question. All right, all right. The thorns are of no use at all. Flowers have thorns just for spite. Oh, I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They are naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons. And you actually believe that the flowers... No, no, no. I don't believe anything. I answered you the first thing that came into my head. Now, don't you see? I'm very busy with matters of consequence. Matters of consequence? You talk just like the grown-ups. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. It is not a matter of consequence to try to understand why the flowers go to so much trouble to grow thorns which are never of any use to them. Now, just a moment. If I, like... I knew one flower which is unique in the universe, which grows nowhere but on my planet, which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite some morning without even noticing what he is doing... You think that is not important? I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize. Now, the flower you love is not in danger. I, I, I'll draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw you a railing to put around your flower. I didn't know what else to say to him. Night had fallen. I had let my tools drop from my hand. Of what moment now was my hammer, or thirst, or death? There was a little prince to be comforted. I felt awkward and blundering. I, I didn't know how I could reach you. It's such a secret place, the land of tears. So that's why you left your tiny home on asteroid B612. It was love. Love for a flower. A flower unique in all the universe. At first I was captivated by her beauty. Very quickly she began to torment me with her vanity. And soon I came to doubt her. Was she the only flower on your planet? Oh, no. But the others are very simple. They take up no room. Cause not one bit of trouble. Your flower was different. Very. She came from a seed blown to my planet from who knows where. From the moment she first showed herself, she became demanding. She commanded all of my time. Even that time I had always devoted to the baobabs and my volcanoes. Volcanoes? I have two active volcanoes. Very convenient for heating my breakfast. I carefully clean them out every morning. If they are well cleaned out, Volcanoes burn slowly and steadily. 
without eruption. I... I see. I also have one volcano that is extinct. I clean it out, too. One never knows. No. One never knows. You were telling me about your flower. I ought never to have run away from her. I ought to have judged her by deeds and not by words. I ought to have guessed that behind her poor little stratagems lay real affection for me. But I was too young to know how to love her. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. And so it was that the little prince fled from the proud flower he loved but could not understand. To escape from his planet, the little prince took advantage of the migration of a flock of wild birds. He found himself in the neighborhood of asteroids number 325, 326, 27, 28, and 329. He began to visit them in order to add to his knowledge. The first asteroid was inhabited by a king clad in a royal purple and ermine who was seated upon a magic throne. The king was elated when he saw the little prince coming. Ah, the subject. A proof, so I miss you better. The king felt consumingly proud of being at last king over somebody. The little prince looked everywhere for a place to sit down, but the entire planet was crammed and obstructed by the king's magnificent robe. So he remained standing. Since he was tired, he yawned. It is contrary to etiquette to yawn in the presence of a king. I forbid you to do so. I can't help it. I have come on a long journey and have had no sleep. Ah, then I order you to yawn. Come now, yawn again. That's an order. That frightens me. I cannot anymore. Well, then I... I order you sometimes to yawn and sometimes not to. Look here, I insist that my authority be respected. I tolerate no disobedience. I am an absolute monarch. However, I always make my orders reasonable. That is very wise. Oh, of course. If I offered a general to change himself into a seabird and he did not, it would be my fault, not his. May I sit down? <laughs> yeah, I order you to do so. Here, I shall move my robe. Uh, sire, I beg that you will excuse my asking a question. I order you to ask me a question. Sire, you are alone here. This planet is tiny. Over what do you rule? Over everything. Over everything? You mean the other planets and all the stars? Oh, over all that. Oh, that's marvelous. You can see a sunset whenever you wish. Oh, sire, I should like to see a sunset. Do me that kindness. Order the sun to set. If, if, if I ordered a general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, or, or write a tragic drama or change himself into a seabird, and if he did not, which of us would be wrong? You. Exactly. One must require from each one only the duty he can perform. I have the right to require obedience because my orders are reasonable. But my sunset? You shall have it. I shall command it. When, sire? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I shall consult my almanac. Uh, uh. Hmm. Uh, ah, yeah, here we are. Uh, that will be this evening, about 20 minutes to 8. And when I give the order, <laughs> you see how well I'm obeyed. I see. Oh, I have nothing more to do here, so I shall set out on my way again. Oh, do not go. Do not go. I, uh, 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 I'll make you a minister. Minister of what? Minister of Justice. Yes, yeah, that's it, Minister of Justice. But there is nobody here to judge. Hmm? Well, then you shall judge yourself. It's far more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. I can judge myself anywhere. I, uh, I have good reason to believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. You can judge this old rat. And from time to time, you will condemn him to death. You will have to pardon him on each occasion 
He must be treated thriftily. He's the only one we have. I wouldn't like that. I think I will go on my way. Oh, no. I am ready to depart. If your majesty wishes to be promptly obeyed, he should be able to give me a reasonable order. Oh, well. Very well. I order you to be gone by the end of one minute. <laughs> the conditions seem favorable. And hear this. I make you my ambassador. The grown-ups are very strange. <laughs> The second planet was inhabited by a conceited man who thought the little prince had come to admire him. Ah, oh, I am about to receive a visit from an admirer. Good morning. That is a queer hat you are wearing. It is a hat for salute. I raise it in salute when people acclaim me. Oh, unfortunately, nobody at all ever passes this way. Oh? Clap your hands one against the other. All right. You see? I now raise my hat in salute. Do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wouldn't you like to applaud me again? Well, no. <clears throat> but uh, you really do admire me. What do you mean? Well, you regard me as the handsomest, the best dressed, the richest, and most intelligent man on this planet. <laughs> but you're the only man on your planet. Uh, well, do me this kindness. Admire me just the same. Very well. I admire you. Ah, uh -huh. thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. Now, what is there in that to interest him so much? The grown-ups are certainly very odd. The third planet belonged to a businessman. This man was so much occupied that he did not even raise his head at the little prince's arrival. Three and two make five. Five and good seven. Morning. Four. Good morning. Good uh, morning. Your cigarette is gone out. 22. I haven't had time to light it again. That makes... Um, five hundred one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred and thirty-one. <laughs> five hundred million what? No, I can't stop. I've got too much to do. I'm concerned with matters of consequence. Five hundred million what? During the fifty-four years I've inhabited this planet, I've been disturbed only twice by inconsequential balded ash. This is the third time. Now, I was saying five hundred one million six hundred... Millions of what? Those little objects one sometimes sees in the sky. Fly? No, little glittering objects. The ones that set lazy men to idle dreaming. You mean the stars. That's right. And what do you do with the stars? Nothing. I own them. But I have already seen a king who told Kings me... do not own. They reign over. It's very different. And it makes me very rich. What good does it do you to be rich? Well, it makes it possible for me to buy more stars, if any are discovered. How is it possible for, for one to own the stars? To whom do they belong? To nobody. Then they belong to me, because I was the first to think of it. Uh, I suppose that is true, but what do you do with them? I administer them, count them, recount them. It's difficult, but... I am a man who is interested in matters of consequence. You cannot pluck the stars from heaven. No, but I can put them into the bank. Whatever does that mean? I write the number of my stars on a paper. I put the paper into a drawer and lock it with a key. Is that all? That is enough. That is rather poetic, but of no great consequence. Your ideas about matters of consequence are quite different from those of grown-ups. Right. I myself own a flower, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I clean out every day. It is of some use to my volcanoes and my flowers that I own them. You are of no use to the stars. Boulder Dash! Now, well, let's see, where was I? Uh, 342, 77 plus 89... The grown-ups are altogether extraordinary. <laughs> Tell me, 
How did you come to visit this planet, the Earth? It was recommended by a geographer on the fifth planet I visited. Do you like it? Do you intend to stay? It has been almost a year since I left my home, my flower, my volcanoes. I'm worried. Baobabs? I left them under control. Your flower, then? On my journey, I learned many things. I learned that flowers are in danger of speedy disappearance. Soon I must return. It had been eight days since my accident in the desert. The last drop of my water supply was gone. The little prince seemed not to guess the danger. A little sunshine was all he seemed to need. He was recounting some of his experiences after coming to our planet. I met a friend. He was a fox. My dear little man, this is no longer a matter that could have anything to do with a fox. Why not? I am about to die of thirst. I'll tell you about it as we go, then. Come, let us look for a well. It's absurd to look for a well at random in the immensity of the desert. When arrived on the earth, I was surprised not to see any people. It was explained to me that I had landed on the desert. Your friend the fox told you this? No. It was a little gold-colored snake. A funny little animal. No thicker than a finger. A little yellow snake, but they're deadly. Not deadly. But more powerful than the finger of a king. He could have struck you fatally. He told me he could help me someday. If I grew too homesick for my planet. He told me all I need do is come back to the place where I descended. He would meet me there. Are you so homesick, then? It is very close to the anniversary of my arrival. At that time, my planet will be right overhead. I... I shall be unhappy if you go. That is what the fox said. It was his fault. He wanted me to tame him. Tame him? It was when I wandered into a garden filled with flowers. There were thousands of them, precisely alike. They called themselves... Roses. I was brokenhearted. Because of the roses? They were all exactly like my flower. A flower I thought to be unique in all the universe. Oh. The fox made me understand. To have hope again. He wanted me to tame him because it would establish ties and make him different from all the other foxes. I'm beginning to understand. I looked again at the roses. They were beautiful, but... One would not die for them. My rose is more important than all the others because it is she that I have watered. It is she I have put under a glass globe, sheltered from the wind behind a screen. Listen to when she grumbled or boasted. She is my rose. And your friend the fox? When I met him, he was as yet nothing. Just a fox like thousands of other foxes. But I have made him my friend. And now he is unique in all the world. You have learned a secret. A simple secret. It's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Men have forgotten that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. I am responsible for my rules. When we had trudged along for several hours in silence, the darkness fell and the stars came out. The little prince dropped off to sleep. I took him in my arms and set out walking once more. I felt the need of protecting him as if he himself were a flame that might be extinguished by a little puff of wind. I walked on, and I found the well at daybreak. Now... You must keep your promise, you know. The muzzle for my sheep. I remember. I... I'm afraid it's not very good. This will be all right. You have plans I don't know about. Tomorrow will be the anniversary of my descent to the Earth. And your star will be just above... You must return to your work on the engine now. I will be waiting here. Come back tomorrow evening. I... I'm a little frightened. 
Remember the fox. One runs the risk of weeping a little if one lets himself be tamed. I was not reassured. I did not want to lose my little friend. I pretended to go, but returned and hid behind a rock. I could not see to whom the little prince was speaking. This is the exact spot. The right time. You have good poison. You are sure you will not make me suffer too long. My heart jumped to my throat. I looked around the rock. Before me, facing the little prince, was one of those yellow snakes that take just 30 seconds to end your life. I dug into my pocket for my gun and started to run. The snake let himself flow across the sand like the dying spray of a fountain and disappeared among the stones. What does this mean? Why are you talking with snakes? You will find out what is wrong with your engine today. And you can go back home. I, too, am going home today. It is much farther. Much more difficult. I want you to stay a while longer. I have your sheep and the sheep's box. And I have the muzzle. Little man, I want to hear you laugh again. Tell me it's only a bad dream, this affair of the snake, the meeting place the star? At night you will look up at the stars. My star will be just one of the stars for you. You will love to watch all of the stars in the heavens. They will be your friends. (laughs) I am making you a present. Little prince, dear little prince, I love to hear that laughter. That is my present. Just that. What are you trying to say? For most people, the stars are silent. You, you alone will have the stars as no one else has them. I don't understand. In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. It will be as if all the stars were laughing when you look at the night sky. Only you will have the stars that can laugh. I too shall look at the stars. They will all be wells with a rusty pulley. You will have 500 million little bills, and I shall have 500 million springs of fresh water. Now, let me go by myself. You... You're afraid, little friend? I am responsible for my flower. She is so weak, so naive... She has four thorns of no use at all. Don't go. Please. Don't go. I seemed unable to move. The little prince hesitated. Took one step. There was nothing there but a flash of yellow close to his ankle. He remained motionless for an instant. He did not cry out. He fell gently as a tree falls. There wasn't even any sound because of the sand. Now, years and years have gone by. Until now, I've never told this story. My sorrow is comforted a little. Not entirely, but I know he did go back to his planet. His body was not there at daybreak. At night, I love to listen to the stars. It's like 500 million little bells. But there is one extraordinary thing. When I drew the muzzle for the little prince, I forgot to add the leather strap to it. He will never have been able to fasten it on his sheep. So now I keep wondering what's happening on his planet. Perhaps the sheep has eaten the flower and the little bells are changed to tears. Here then is a great mystery. Nothing in the universe can be the same if somewhere a sheep that we have never seen has yes or no 
eaten a rose. And no grown-up will ever understand that this is a matter of so much importance. CBS Radio Workshop has presented The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. The script was adapted for radio by Frank Tossing. Richard Beals was heard as The Little Prince, with Raymond Burr as our narrator. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Joseph Kearns, and Hans Conrad. Music for tonight's workshop was composed by René Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when, from New York, we present H.L. Mencken, The Story of a Journalist. That's next week on the CBS Radio Workshop. tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. An ode of thanksgiving, written and directed by Norman Corwin, with an original musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. now, the living and the dead alike, sit round our votive table 
and give thanks where thanks are due. We shall give thanks tonight for song and bread and such a thing as love and dogged hope and for the guarantee of morning somewhere at some season. You must bring with you to the feast an offering. It can be little. One good grape, a grain of cinnamon, a sentiment, three bars of an old folk song, half a notion, a living thing that's glad of living, be it a mosquito fresh from lava or a floating spore. Sit where you will. There are no place cards here and no priority. The good right hand of fellowship is at your left and at your right perhaps an antique pharaoh or a medieval saint, a poet temporarily run out of couplets, or a plumber just arrived from the installing of a sink. Please note there is no head to this round table. Instead, an empty chair reserved for any perfect man, and uh, therefore fated to be empty. First now, the breaking of the bread. Who will say grace? St. Paul, will you kindly... He that eateth, eateth unto the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. There will be music such as this throughout, for song is celebration, whether it is tuned to joy or woe or to the passions in between. We who are thankful give up thanks for music and the instruments of music and the makers of the instruments of music. Yea, the sistrum and the dulcimer, the psaltery, the tabor, the cithara, the sackput and the looping horns. Listen to the big and buxom bulls. The gentle fiddles gambling across the staves. The piquant flute. The pastoral and plaintive oboe, singing of nostalgias we must always know. And the celeste, to which the planetoids prefer to dance. Also, that wondrous instrument which can speak words and give them meaning, inflect them, playing on the mind the spirit bowstring. The human voice, the various and sweet and pungent human voice. Now seraphim, now Satan. Oh, this is a hearty congregation. Great old Greeks and grocers, clerks, and young maids from Carolina looking for careers in New York City, and a shipping clerk from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, two emperors of China, and a mild professor from Ohio, and a girl named Rhoda with rheumatic fever, farm hands, and a locomotive engineer, and sailormen, and actors' agents, and a lissom tightrope walker thankful for a solid rope beneath his feet. Each is thankful in his fashion and his measure. I, for the earth and weathers, being a farmer, for the sun, which is good, and the rain, which is good, and for the rising before dawn, and the frosty air, and the placid animals, to whom I am the god of feed, the giver of the corn and grain. And I am thankful for the day, which is good, and the night, which is good. And for the hard one sleeping, which is also good. And I am thankful for the plow in my hand. And the tilling of the land in fall, for crops to be sown in winter. And the tilling of the land in spring, for the Indian corn of summer. I am not thankful for potato bugs, or the maize smut. But am, for the well-framed orchards and the grafted trees, and the gathered harvest. A 
at low tide, I guess, and the salty smell. For my clam rake and spade, I guess, and the spear I use to snag eels with, and the bellboy off by the shoals, and then the seagulls which circle overhead and glide along the beach all day looking for clams too, like me. And I like to think sometimes of the thin rim of dried salt on the spit of sand where the last wave breaks when the tide's going out, and of the bright days when the water is blue, and the gray days when the water is gray. I'm thankful to God for clams and eels and low tide, I guess. I am thankful to God for clams and eels. I am thankful to God for clams and eels and the Lord. I, being a mother several times over, am thankful for the love of it and the pain of it. For the growth up from the crib and the teething and all the trouble and the coming out of trouble. For the cured abscess of the ear which Emmy had, getting better the way it did after we were so worried and sat up all night for two nights and didn't get a wink of sleep. Yes, and for Charles getting over being tongue-tied. And Joe, the wild boy, getting married to such a fine girl as Louise and settling down. And for my husband, Donald, to have lived to see his eldest daughter, Hannah, married and bringing up a nice family. And for the letters that the children write me whenever they can. And the cards they send me on Mother's Day. And for the radio when it gets lonely. Especially in the wintertime when all the summer folk have gone away. For all these things and many others, I am thankful. What of the season? Shall we not say thanks for seasons and the zones between them, when they are neither here nor there, but surely coming? For the time in March, when the crocus goes to town, and the robin makes reconnaissance, and the icicle has given orders to relax. For the time in June, when the laziest bud, the last to leaf, says, all right, I am ready. Summer may begin. Bring on the south wind, the cicadas, and the bees that I've heard so much about. Oh, surely, sure. Let this be celebrated in our best tradition by a song. By not too young a song, since spring and summer are an ancient team. A song, let's say, of summer's coming in. It must be old, but fresh, familiar, yet a little different each time met with as summertime herself. Summer is a coming in, mother is a coming in. Blow a seed and blow a seed and spring and put a new a new. Sing for you, for you. You can do it, and 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 now, may I rise?
is to thank the master painter of the year? Well, who's that? October. No louvre in the world is big enough to hold his landscapes. He is exhibited in every tinctured leaf and hung in every meadow. Have you seen his skyscapes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. They say he mixes pigments out of elemental stuffs and ranges far afield. Did you know his greens come from a special patch of the Aegean? His reds from Yuma in the eyes of Bengal tigers and the powdered beaks of tropical toucans? His oranges are skimmed, they say, from surfaces of rising moons. Well, where do his tints of hazel come from? Well, hazelnuts. His plum color? From plums. His fawn from fawns? Precisely. Is he not a marvel then, October? Yes, he is. Not worth a canticle? Oh, worth several. Here is one for now. If you really want to know about October... Come, this is mockery, this festive hour. A mockery? How now? This breaking bread while famine grins in every land. This music while the whistling bomb sets pitch for all the sharp-tuned instruments of death. This talk of landscapes when the color of the earth is red and growing redder, and you know it. Are you proposing thanks? Yes, we are. Why, if Satan himself was sitting here among us, he could reasonably proffer thanks to all of our kind for many favors done him in continuing. His horsemen thunder down the ways. His legions multiply like festering bacteria. How can our thanksgivings be unaffected knowing this? Look, no empire built of darkness and disease of soul shall give us pause. The interlocking fury of free men will, like a blinding and a sterilizing shaft of light, nullify such decay. What comes of festering bacteria in the sunlight? It doesn't matter. While we speak, new fallen angels plummet from the skies like a malignant hail. The air is a shriek with misery. Yea, the earth is fevered. Pity and mercy both are exiled to a foreign star. And charity's aghast to see a million of our brothers writhing in the puddle of their blood. Has there ever been a tempest time did not outride? The truth that was mixed in with the molten ores when still our smoking planet sought a place among the systems, that truth awaits extraction like a rare but mighty radium deep in the bowels of the earth. Those who have held it shining in their hands, never will be countervailed. Never countervailed. Though crucifixion test it, and armies of defenders stagger backward through the night, once we understand, no weapon in the hand of any host of any hell can strike asunder man from man. Brothers are not for long divisible. Let us be thankful now for this. I verify this thing. I who have come a long distance to this table and must go far hence. I verify this thing. 
that brotherhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. It cannot be that common kindness and a working plan are more bizarre imaginings than that a man should squeeze the world into a room and speak across it casually and be heard. I am a wanderer. I was born in exile as my father was and as my children will be. I am of a race which lives in every clime and under every flag except its own. I verify this thing. Let now the ram's horn of my father's tribe resound a note of thankfulness for perseverance and for law, for strength out of adversity and order out of chaos. Listen to it. There's the shrill wind blowing down the wrinkled plains of China through the self-same wildernesses. Past the hoary head of Sinai blows the melancholy shofar. Sounds the shofar down the ages. Egypt, Jericho and Persia, Greece and Rome and the dispersion, Pogrom, ghetto, inquisition. Past the rise and fall of empires. Past the ebb and flow of eras. Through the gauntlet of affliction. Index in humanitarum. Pox and physis, plague and cannon. Still, above the blare of trumpets. Still, above the brass of hatred. Blows the horn of benediction. Men have listened. Men have listened. They will listen yet tomorrow for the horn of benediction. For the horn of benediction. May I speak for a moment, having but a moment left to speak in? I, too, am listening for a horn to blow, one which will call me from this time and place to another time and place. In this, my 92nd year, my eyes grown dim, my hearing poor, sleeping most of the time, the foothills of sleep before I reach the mountains. I am thankful for still, clear memories, both big and little, happy and sorrowful. Of the dress I wore at Lincoln's second inaugural ball. Of meeting Edward on a sleigh ride one December night when the moon was new and Mount Toby lay frozen under stars that seemed so low you could almost touch them. Of the morning Ralph was born, of how little Edwina died of the diphtheria. Of all the other memories, the many, many other things too full to hint at, too many to contain. I, I joke with my grandchildren when they come to see me now. I tell them I'm like a minute man, ready to go at a moment's notice. Would you pardon my appearance, good friends all? I am but lately risen from the grave. 
One of a hundred who were stood one morning, one bright morning, between a dozen muzzles and a wall. Tonight it rains where we were lowered in the ground. A rain of mid-November falling cold upon the countryside. Spreading its sorrows over, cautioning the earth that winter is coming. Winter in the bone, and winter in the flesh, and winter on the clean-swept hearthstone. We who are so early quiffed of this sweet place, young and unready for the quiet, loving the tug of the wind and the swaying grass, the pillowing breasts of our beloved, and the laughter of our children, loving the look of the day in the east, but seeing it no more, turned, turned away and face to face with night. We who are solemn with dust upon our lips, Whisper now our thankfulness in chorus that we have been noted, that we shall not be forgotten, that good men, good understanding men, have noted that we shall not be forgotten. For this, for this, for this much thanks. Sons of men, daughters of the mingled lovers of the many tribes who make us what we are, brothers, sisters by the millions, sitting with us at this table, and circled round us through the far, wide-spreading states, what year this is we shall not soon forget. Remark it, each of you belonging to it, this year shall skulk among the blackest annals ever, pitied wandered on and sung about as long as our posterity looks back to see the how and why of what has gone before. None of us makes pretense to himself of tranquil temper. There are no barefoot pleasures in these hobnailed times. The world is burning. It is burning. Flame is never subtle in its ways. It has a pattern all can recognize. We smell the smoke and feel the scorching air and see the embers snatched up by the winds and blown this way and that. But we are thankful, thankful in this graceless year for the strong joy of the challenge, for defiance in the nostril and the weapon in the hand. Shall we despair who've suckled freedom on the brew of vintages of wrath? Shall we be thankless for the passions stirring in our blood? The love of country, of each spine of cactus and each particle of mist? Shall we be thankless for the way we walk? Fearlessly, not stealing glances backward. For the way we talk? For scorn and laughter and the clenching of the fist? Come, come Americans, come now and praise the broken bread together and the fiddle and the tilling of the land. The bellboy by the shoals and Joe, the wild boy, getting married to Louise. Praise now October and the song of songs together. Praise the men who never shall forget. The steel mills working through the night. The rifle factory, the weapon in the hand. Arise now and give thanks where thanks are due. have been listening to Psalm for a Dark Year, 
a Thanksgiving ode written, directed, and produced by Norman Corwin as program number 26 in the Columbia Workshop special cycle, 26 by Corwin. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. The principal narration was done by Mr. Corwin. Others in the cast were Martin Gable, Parker Fenley, Anne Boley, Frank Lovejoy, Martin Wolfson, Hester Sundergaard, Sidney Smith, Jean Allen, Ian Martin, and Charles Carroll. In closing 26 by Corwin, we present Davidson Taylor, who resumes next week as producer of the Columbia Workshop. Tonight we have heard the last broadcast in what has been, even for the Columbia Workshop, a most unusual series. 26 shows written, directed, and produced by one man. The Columbia Network is proud not only of 26 by Corwin, but also of other such landmarks in radio drama, as seems radio's here to stay, they fly through the air, and the plot to overthrow Christmas, all by Corwin. Most of us remember when Norman Corwin's name was new to the workshop. It is one of the workshop's jobs to find new talents and give them proper hearings. During the coming weeks, we shall hear the work of a number of new writers. And we are excited, frankly, about the quality and variety of their scripts. We have in store for you a regional show, a satire, a farce, a document, a fantasy, an opera, and a melodrama which belong in workshop company. Every Sunday at this time, we invite you to share the pleasures of discovery with us. We'll try to go on doing what the workshop has attempted ever since the first broadcast on July 18th, 1936. We'll try to bring you every week something you could have heard nowhere else in radio. Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the CBS Radio Workshop. Blues is a woman, and a woman is the blues. Sometimes she fades like a pair of tight shoes. Cause blues is a woman And a woman is the blues Sad news and bad news But mostly bad news One ain't enough And two is too many Life is rough stuff If you ain't got any Love is a hunger that few of us can feel. True love's as rare as a three-dollar bill. Love is a heartache that you take and you choose. Sometimes you win, boy, sometimes you lose. Cause blues is a woman and a woman CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Cause blues is a woman and a woman is the blues. Tonight, transcribed, an original story ballad 
The Legend of Jimmy Blue Eyes by Edmund Brophy, with original music by Ray Noble, starring William Conrad as the narrator and Jimmy Dodd as Jimmy Blue Eyes, horn by Manny Klein. In Storyville, where blues were born, there's a legend of a golden horn and a hot-lipped kid, blue-eyed and fair, who tried for a note that wasn't there. So come along Perdido Street where the hot licks tickle dancing feet that shuffle in patent leather shoes, where Jimmy Blue Eyes blew the blues. Now, Jimmy Blue Eyes came on earth a child of hunger from his birth. He played all day around the streets of sin, and they spiked his milk with old Tom Jim. Second line to each funeral band Rushed the can when they made a stand He held their horns with love and care While his face lit up like a county fair He followed the tailgate players round When the wagons rolled through back of town And the only prayers he ever knew Were the kind of blue note trumpet blew uh, He roamed the streets from sun to moon His bare feet beat to each tonky tune As it crept through the gin mill's swinging doors And the sawdust danced on the white tile floors He stole free lunch from barrel house places And hustled a buck at the fairgrounds races He talked to dice like a lover can And he aimed for the life of a sporting man When Jimmy Blue Eyes turned 16, he joined out Jill, a blues song queen. Jill dressed him like a special prize, this Dixie kid with his soft blue eyes. I eat 20 suits and a Stetson skimmer, a box back coat and a diamond glimmer. A gold chain draped his fancy vest. Ah, oh, he went first class. He was the best. Now, Jimmy Blue Eyes loved to dally at a card room down along Pig Alley. He could riffle a deck with gambler's ease and clean a cotch game like a breeze. One night, a player met his raise with a silver horn from better days. I guess that's it, boys. I don't see no more money on the table. I'm folding up. Hold on, Jimmy Blue Eyes. I got me some grouch bag dough. Deal out one hand a stud. One hand and I quit. Win or lose. No, oh, no good, Chippy. You blowed plenty of horn on a riverboat for that. I don't want no grouch bag money. Who says you're going to win me? Deal the cards. King. Trey. King bets. Twenty. Queen. Six. King queen bets. Twenty. Ten. Eight. King's high. Twenty again. Jack. Deuce. Possible straight bets. Twenty more. I'll raise you twenty. I'm twenty shy. I'll put up my horn. Oh, that's a pretty beat-up piece, man. She blows plenty sweet. Got a tone like a silver bell. It's a go. What do you got? King high. You? Deuces. Jim showed his win to his loving Jill in her fancy flat in the morning still. Why, Jimmy, honey, you couldn't call home the cows at sundown with that old thing. Why, she's a singing dream, baby. 
I'll call a children home like Buddy Bolden used to do. <laughs> I'd try it out walking up Rampart Street. You could hear the echo down the riverside. But you never blew horn before. I was top horn in a reform school band. Well, that don't make for playing Tom Anderson's saloon. And you're not filling in alongside King Oliver in a funeral band. That's a cinch. Sweet Jill, I'm sure no fancy Dan. But I'm a dead-bang natural music man. I'll take this battered silver horn and make it talk come Mardi Gras morn. Jimmy, my love, since I was born, I've loved the music of a horn. You learn to make it weep and shout. I'll love you till the stars burn out. Why, well, me and the blues are kid and candy. Or St. Louis and Memphis and Mr. Handy. If you stuck a pin in my heart, it's true. A drop of my blood would come out pure blue. But summers came and winters went, and Jimmy's loving heart was bent as for he hit that master blow. His sweet Jill blew with Hot Lips Joe. Now, Hot Lips Joe, he had no peer. He could shave the head from a glass of beer with a wind from his educated horn, just as sure as you were born, just as sure as you were born. <laughs> The kiss-off gave poor Jim a jolt. He loaded up his blue steel coat and headed for the circus house to croak at double cross and loss. Hot Lips Joe was holding the floor when a cold spit lead type 44. The bullet sang around his head. Jim killed a tourist guy instead. In sheer disgust, a gun he slammed upon the floor, and then he lammed along the streets of jazz mad night while whistles blew to halt his flight. And back at Minnie's circus house, Hot Lips Joe, that heart thief lost, cased the sucker on the floor and smiled and whispered, Nevermore. He did? Put a mirror to his mouth, Hot Lips. Don't need no looking glass. Man got no pulse. He's a goner, dead as a mackerel. Jimmy Blue Eye's gonna get himself fitted for a hemp necktie. And the execute man gonna bag his pretty head with a little old black bag. Oh, it's curtains for Jimmy, boy. I say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> Nevermore will Jimmy Blue Eyes catch me with a lead surprise. This hog wild kid is through for fair. A cinch to dance upon the air. Before he ever got a mile, poor Jim was nailed and brought to trial. The old judge burned him with a look and up and hit him with a book. In a cell where Jimmy locked, steel secured, and granite blocked. He played a music rich apart, a gift God gives a contrite heart. Long summers came, long winters went. And all of Jimmy's time was spent to reach a chord, to cut the air and blow that note that wasn't there. The sun went down in Storyville when love went out with Jim and Jill. First war came in Prohibition, and a district went to quick perdition. A diehards died on bathtub gin. But the music lived like hidden sin to tickle toes in northern lands with the advent of the Dixie bands. But New Orleans was much alive in the year of 1935. 
Jim took the long road home at last. The dark and bitter days were past. Now, when Jimmy Blue Eyes hit the bricks, he was master of hot licks. His trumpet clawed and tore the air in search of a note that wasn't there. He played the hottest spots in town. Nearly blew the ceilings down. When his encores all were done, they said, Oh, that man is Gabriel's son. Money fell at Jimmy's feet in full blown gale, the silver sleep. He smiled and played right on until his mind ran back to his heartbeat, Jill. Now you show me an artist, fine or fair, who seeks a note that isn't there, and I'll show you a guy that most men ain't. He's alone in the clouds, an uncrowned saint. For he scatters joy to his fellow man. Though he might wind up and also ran to drive past glory, fortune, fame. It's Nirvana, sure, but a heartbreak game. And Jimmy's heart and soul sent out the soft, sweet tones of his trumpet shout. He blew it hot and low and high. He hit the fringe of heaven's sky. The multiplying strains made naught. He couldn't reach a peak he sought. He blew until the notes were pain, elastic stretches of his brain. Uh, he tried hungan and mambo pills, but they wouldn't bring the trumpet trills. He killed a quarter rye each day, and it didn't help for his high note play. Jimmy, boy, your, your case is tragic. You'd best resort to mammy magic. She cooks a pot like jungle stew. There's conjure in her devil's brew. Where's this mammy magic live? Where? Tell me where. Two miles north of nowhere. One mile south of someplace. <laughs> Look over your shoulder, man. The old hut in the wood? The old hut in the wood. Now, mammy magic was her name. A voodoo witch of power and fame whose spells were famous as the blues from New Orleans to Newport News. Monsieur Jimmy Blue Eyes. Entrez. You know me, Mammy Magic? You know my name? Few things are secret to one who has a third eye. You are troubled. Some walls and windows have ears. I read your thoughts. Well? Your desire is beyond my power. You lie, witch. I got the price, woman of darkness. I'm desperate. Do you hear me? Desperate. Level with me. I tell you, Jimmy, on the level, you got to see my boss, the devil. You're asking one thing I can't do. Despite the magic I can brew. I'll have no truck with devils. I'm selling. You are here to buy. What's he asking for price? I don't make out his bills. He keeps them plenty private. Well, get your devil man. We'll cut up a deal, me and him. So Mammy Magic cast a spell to summon up the king of hell. Dambala. Dambala. came in a flame of smoke and thunder that almost tore the town asunder. He smelled like absinthe and smoke and mud. His eyes were rubies, pigeon blood. He stood erect in a manner bold, and his tail was 80 carat gold. You're a very humble servant, sir. Yeah, I... I Speak I, up, I, sir. There is no occasion for fear. 
I pride myself on an understanding heart. Well, uh, here's the situation, Mr... Just call me Red. I'm a very democratic chap. All souls being equal before my eyes. What is your problem, Jimmy Blue Eyes? And what is your heart's desire? Okay, Mr. Red. Here's the setup. I want to blow it up. So the Red King made a deal with him. Had a secret locked inside Jim. And then with the evil lord of old Red turned that silver horn to gold. Jimmy Blue Eyes walked on feet which never touched upon the street. He wore a broad smile upon his face, for that never, never note was his. That long, elusive note was there, the most immortal anywhere. But when he blew it, come what may, he had an awful price to pay. Old Hot Lips Joe had just come down from a long run in Chicago town. He'd been the world's top trumpet king for 20 years, come one more spring. The jazz folk down in New Orleans dug folding money from their jeans to bet on Jim, or Hot Lips Joe, to contest for the master of gold. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. I got a century, says Jimmy takes it. Well, you get it off, man. It's like shooting fish in a rain barrel. Kansas City bets on Joe. <laughs> and Memphis takes your bet. Chicago goes for hot lips. That boy can really blow up a storm. His money, marbles, chalk, and beans on Jimmy. The pride of New Orleans. Who'll <laughs> cover five G's with cash, not talk? It's Jimmy Blue Eyes for old New York. Most ever perish up and down. Bet scads on Jimmy's horn renown. The high and low of fortune's birth came on from ever end of earth. The joint was jammed. And the 88 was under the dukes of a solid gate. The SRO sign hung outside. And there was Hot Lips Joe and his beauty bride, Sweet Jill. The nightingale of song. A dead wrong broad, dead wrong, dead wrong. Playing a puff at a ringside table. Sipping a amber. Draped in sable. And Joe took a stage with a master's pride and cut his trumpet open wide. He blew hot notes heard round about. He turned that trumpet inside out. He blew till all the glass was broken. He blew so hot the joint was smoking. His horn turned inside out and curled. The last note traveled round the world. When Joe sat on, the cheering sounds bust tombstones in the burial grounds. His look told Jim with unfeigned joy. Go pedal your papers, little boy. Get a hand caught, Jim. You can use that horn to pedal fish. You ain't got a prayer, Blue Eyes. It's like stacking a cellar door dance up against Bill Robinson. Jim took the stage and struck a stance bold for a guy with a Chinaman's chance. <laughs> He warmed the hot notes, let them fry to a whisper tone, like strong men cry. They felt his lonely, bitter years as the horn wept soft, metallic tears. Then quick, mad laughter with a jeer. Go cry in your beer, go cry in your beer. And now, switchblade gashes and razor slashes blend with whiskey bottle crashes, culminating in a wail from the foul, deep bowel of a tall wall jail. <laughs> He 
He ran a scale of man's emotions like changing tides upon the ocean. A harsh note cursed. Another prayed, have mercy, brother, I'm sore afraid. His horn sang smooth and educated and blue and true and dedicated. The music of that Dixie man was greater than the pipes of Pan. The high, soft sigh of a trumpet's cry can tell what magic words can't try. For the horn sings true as it only can, unmatched for nature, bird, or man. Man sings his heart with tongue or pen. Words give and live through time again. But his very heart and soul ring clear when a true horn speaks for all to hear. And the crowd sat frozen round a gaff. Jim split the ceiling right in half. He blew the walls down and the doors. He raised the carpets off the floors. Cotton, this disinherited, misbegotten son of a slum and sin and gin blew that scatter outside in. And yet, he seemed like a tired life going home from a weary earth and a heartbreak room to that promised land of a fairer climb out there on the other side of time. So Jimmy Blue Eyes hit some bars that blew out half a million stars. And then that never, never note went clear ten jillion miles to heaven's ear. And when it faded, died and broke, that blue-eyed kid went up in smoke. Now, some rounders claim they're in the know that Jimmy Blue Eyes fries below. But in New Orleans, they'll lay your odds. He's playing trumpet with the gods. For a deacon man was there who preached that before the last note cut and reached the edges of eternity and died. Father, forgive me, his trumpet cried. No matter where, when hot music blows, if you're not here past dad, he knows. Jim's golden horn, the love of faithless Jill, when blues and we were young. In Storyville. Now, Jimmy Blue Eyes came on earth, a child of hunger from his birth. They spiked his milk with old Tom Gin, and he played all day around the streets of sin. So come along, Perdido Street, where the hot licks tickle dancing feet that shuffle in patent leather shoes. But Jimmy Blue Eyes blew the blues. In Storyville, where jazz was born, there's a legend of the golden horn and a hot-lipped kid, blue-eyed and fair, who hit that note that wasn't there. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood... 
The CBS Radio Workshop has presented The Legend of Jimmy Blue Eyes, an original story ballad by Edmund Brophy, with original music by Ray Noble, and starring William Conrad as narrator, with trumpet by Manny Klein. Adapted and directed by Sam Pierce. Jimmy Dodd, in the part of Jimmy Blue Eyes, appeared by arrangement with Walt Disney, producer of the full-length motion picture in Technicolor, Song of the South, starring Uncle Remus and the Critters. Song of the South will be released nationally Easter week. Also featured in the cast were Roy Glenn, Georgia Ellis, Sam Edwards, Lou Merrill, Nan Boardman, Jack Moyles, and Tony Barrett. Featured in the all-star band were Tom Peterson on trombone, Matty Matlock on clarinet, Sammy Weiss drums, Nat Farber piano, and Larry Breen bass. The workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frew. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lorene Tuttle and I have been having a little argument as to the relative merits... Having a little discussion regarding two different schools of literary thought. I've been maintaining to Mr. Price... You may call me Vincent. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Vincent. I've been maintaining that our whole lives are enriched by the warmth and beauty of romanticism. Romanticism, my dear Lorene, is for those weak, lily-livered individuals who haven't the courage to face the realities of life. Realism is life. Now, I'll take Eugene O'Neill any day in preference to Winnie the Pooh. And I'll take Cinderella any day rather than Hedda Gabler. Cinderella. Now, she's exactly what I mean. A smudge-faced juvenile delinquent, if you ask me. It's only one of the most beautiful fairy tales ever told. I defy any realist to tell such a moving story. Oh, you would, eh? Well, very well. To prove my point, I'll tell the real story of Cinderella. Very well. But ladies first. Please. To prove my point, I'll tell the romantic story of Cinderella. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System, and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop. Dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, Ed Verdier and Don Clark's dramatic excursion into the realm of realism versus romance. As the workshop presents Speaking of Cinderella, or If the Shoe Fits. Starring Vincent Price and Lorene Tuttle. Special music composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. Once upon a time in a faraway country, 
there lived a lovely young girl named Cinderella. Unfortunately, she had a cruel stepmother and two stepsisters who were hard-hearted and ill-tempered. Poor Cinderella worked like a slave during the day. And in the evening, she would sit alone in the chimney corner among the ashes. Now, it happened that the king of the land was giving a ball. And all the people of rank and fashion were invited. Among these were Cinderella's two stepsisters. I'm really very well pleased that my two daughters have been invited to attend the king's ball. Oh, so, so are, are we, Mama. Mama. It had been rumored that the king's eldest son, the prince, is to choose his bride from among the young ladies who will be present. Oh! The prince is so tall and handsome. So gallant and rich. And don't forget, one day his bride will become queen of the kingdom and will rule over all the subjects in the domain. Dear stepmother. What? Oh, it's you, Cinderella. What do you want? Dear stepmother, could I too go to the ball? What? You? Have you taken leave of your senses, girl? You have no clothes. Only those tattered old rags you're wearing. There are ashes in your hair. Your shoes are broken and scuffed. With very little trouble, I believe I could make myself quite presentable. You, a scullery maid. Presentable. Well, I've never heard of such conceit. I beg of you, stepmother. A simple little dress. I could wear a flower in my hair. That would be all from you, you impertinent ragamuffin. Back to the kitchen. Do you hear me? Back to the kitchen this instant. <laughs> And so poor Cinderella went back to the chimney corner and with bitter tears. She knew wait the... a minute, wait a minute. Now there's as fine an example of flapdoodle as I've been exposed to in my whole life. What do you mean, flapdoodle? This Cinderella character. Why, the way you romanticists picture her, the poor girl needs an analyst. Oh. What on earth is she doing groveling around in the fireplace getting ashes in her hair? Nobody could ever be like that. Now, do you want to know what really happened? Well, I don't think so. It would do you good, Louise. Facing reality, you understand. Well, this gal, Cindy, wasn't getting much of a break, but she didn't take it sitting down. She knew she had to play it smart. So when a rich man in town sent out bids for a big wing ding he was throwing, Cindy was all ears. I'm certainly glad you girls have been invited to Mr. King's party. It should be real nervous. Yeah, when he throws one, it's really a rocket. And you can say that again. The last one we went to, I was hung over for three days. I read in somebody's column, Winchell's, I think, that the old man has given his son the word to get married and settle down. Get the possibility? I understand the guy's quite a wolf. So what? And don't forget that someday he'll be a vice president of King Betancourt Bagby and wins one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. Well, no wonder they call him the prince. So, if one of you girls latch on to him, you'll have it made, but good. Hey, how about me crashing this bra? You, Cinderella? You must be blowing your stack. <laughs> now I've heard everything. <laughs> Go up on the roof and feed your pigeons. Knock it off, you two, or I'll belt you one in the teeth. Don't pull any of your lady wrestler stuff on my gals. I would have been a champ by this time if you hadn't made me throw those last two matches. I had gorgeous, glorious shoulders pinned to the canvas when you... What are you beefing about? You got your cut. Yeah, then you took me for the whole bundle shooting craps. Look, do I make this party or don't I? You don't. Besides, you haven't got a thing to wear. You're loaded. You might part with a little grab. I can pick up a nifty little number at Orbach's for a few bucks. That's enough out of you, Cinderella. Get back to the kitchen and wash the dishes. And get the dried egg yolk off the plate for a change. Nah, don't give me that lift, that load, tote, that bail routine. I got other plans. Cinderella, where are you going? Down to Baby Joe's bottom. <laughs> Vincent, you, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Distorting that lovely story and making Cinderella such a horrible character. Well, at least she has spirit. She isn't the namby-pamby little goop you'd want the public to accept. My Cinderella is a charming child, unspoiled, sweet, and naive. Oh, she's naive, all right. She's so naive, she's simple in the head. She ought to be in an institution. That isn't true. She has all the personality of an oyster. Why doesn't she stand up for her rights? Because she's a dear, obedient child. Well, a good psychiatrist might help her, but I doubt it. <laughs> Your Cinderella was trying to escape reality by indulging in daydreams about a fairy godmother. Fairy godmother? <laughs> it wasn't that way at all. 
to see there really was a fairy godmother. You don't say. Yes. So, when her two stepsisters had left for the ball, dressed in their beautiful gowns, Cinderella went sorrowfully to the kitchen, sat down in the chimney corner, and broke into sobs of unhappiness. At this moment, a beautiful fairy appeared. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Stop your crying, my child. I am your fairy godmother, Cinderella. If you wish to go to the king's ball, you shall. But you must do everything I say. Yes. Oh, yes, of course. First, bring that pumpkin out into the garden. Where shall I put it? Oh, right there. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'll touch it with my magic wand like this. And... Now, bring me those six mice in yonder trap. Yes. All right. What shall I do with them? Just put them there, in front of the carriage. Yes, that's it. So, a touch of my wand and... Six strong horses with golden harness and red and blue ribbons in their manes. Fairy Godmother, it's wonderful. Oh, well, my dear, is this not a fit equipage to take you to the king's ball? Indeed. Indeed it is, but... But... I have no suitable gown. All I have are these tattered rags. Oh, yes. We'll soon take care of that. Oh, a white satin gown. Covered with pearls and diamonds. And tiny slippers of glass. Spun as fine as gossamer. How can I ever thank you, dear, dear fairy godmother? By being happy. But hear me. There is one condition. You must not remain at the ball after the clock strikes twelve. If you do, your coach and horses will all return to their natural forms. And your fine gown will again turn to rags. Oh, I promise I'll leave the ball at the very first stroke of twelve. <laughs> then off with you, my darling, and have a merry time. You've been so good to me. So very, very good. And so, in all her finery, Cinderella started off for the king's ball, looking more like a princess than anyone would be there. Cinderella was very happy. Oh, what stuff and nonsense. Really, in all my born days, it I wasn't have that never... enchanting, my dear. Enchanting? It was appalling. Appalling? Moreover, it doesn't make any sense. Cinderella's stepmother obviously has money. She thinks nothing of getting Dior and Adrian gowns for her daughters. But still, her place is overrun with mice and rats. Why, if the Board of Health... You ever... are getting more odious by the minute. Odious, schmodious. Let's get back to reality. And the way the story really happened. Now, this Cinderella kid wants to go to the ball, all right. But instead of falling back on her schizophrenic escape pattern, why doesn't she do something constructive? Now, actually, she does. Such as what? Such as this. When Cinderella left her mother's house, she was pretty steamed up about the treatment she'd got. So, as she said, she went to Dirty Joe's down on the waterfront, where she could get a short beer and think things out. <laughs> Hi, Daddy Joe. Hiya, Cindy. How are your pigeons? Joe, you know Crummy. Crummy? Yeah. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Crummy who? You know, Crummy McRodder. Oh, him. He comes in here all the time, doesn't he? Yep. See him tonight? Yep. You mean he's been in? Sure. When did he come in? About an hour ago. Did he say where he was going when he left? Nope. How long ago did he leave? He didn't. Huh? You mean he's still here? Yeah. Over there, in the last booth. Oh, thanks. I mean, thanks. Hi, Crummy. Hi, Bright Girl. How's the pigeons? Mind if I sit down? What's to stop you? That sawed off shotgun. Oh. I'm moving over here. Why the artillery? Things are tough on the water for right now, Bright Girl. The boss wants us band boys to play soft, sad music as a warning to the dock wallopers who ain't kicking in. Yeah. Who's the target for tonight? Guy by the name of Gus Guggenheimer plays a glockenspiel. He run out on us. 
And what's on your mind, bright girl? Oh, look, Crummy, I- I'm going to put it right on the line with you. I need some dough. Oh, sure. Who don't? I need a slick drape and I'm a... sorry, Bright Girl. You can't put the bite on me for nothing like that. I don't need much, Crummy. Just a couple of sea notes. Hey, uh, what do you think I am? Your fairy godmother or something? If you need some scratch, get it from your old lady. Ah, uh, she wouldn't give me a dime. That's too bad. Now, uh, the way I hear it, she keeps plenty of ice around the place. Hey! The wall safe. Crummy, you've got something there. You know how to crack a safe. You ain't just beating your gums, baby. I got ten years in Alcatraz to prove it. All right, then. Now, here's what we'll do. Listen. You getting it, Crummy? Will you shut up and leave me listen? One thing I've got to remember. Yeah, what's that? Except for the bracelet I'm going to give you for this caper. I've got to put back all the rest of the jewels before midnight. There's a time lock on this safe, and it's set for 12 o'clock. I got it open. <laughs> hey, there's plenty of loot in here. Wait a minute. Get your cotton picking hands off that stuff. Mm. Oh, no. Here's a bracelet. Must be worth a grand at least. Uh, give me two C notes, and it's yours. Then you'd better add an extra sawbuck for cab fare. Well, here's a 200, but not another cent. I made a sucker deal, if you ask me. All right, all right. Don't give me the extra 10. I'll just have to heist a car to get to the party. That's all. Code 3, 768-4379-8, HF22. Be on the lookout for a pumpkin yellow Cadillac convertible just stolen from the corner of 4th and Spruce Street. Repeating, code 3, 768-4379-8, HF22. You see what I mean? My Cinderella is a realist. She has spirit. Oh, really, Vincent? You know this whole thing is impossible. I don't quite agree with you. Your version of the Cinderella story is impossible. Mine is possible. But uh, continue, my dear. I'm not sure that I want to, but I suppose I must if any semblance of dignity and decorum is to remain in this lovely story. (laughs) Well... When Cinderella arrived at the king's palace, she was surrounded by courtiers who led her into the ballroom eyes were directed toward her, for everyone was struck by her grace and beauty. No one knew who she was. Even her cruel stepsisters did not recognize her. So rich and splendid was her dress. All the king's courtiers, one after another, asked Cinderella to dance, and they were all highly pleased with her grace and elegance, as well as enchanted by the wit and brilliance of her conversation. The prince himself arrived quite late. Seeing Cinderella... He so admired her appearance and manner, he immediately offered her his hand to the dance. What a charming creature you are. Tell me your name, I pray. That I cannot do, sir. And please do not press me to tell it. I am sure you must be a princess from a distant kingdom. Prithee, what makes you say such a thing as that? No one but a princess could wear as magnificent a gown as yours encrusted with precious gems and jewels. And no one but a princess could be so beautiful and so beguiling. You will turn my head with the sweetness of your words, my prince. And indeed... What is that? It is the tolling of the curfew bell. What a plot is it? Tell me quickly. It is midnight. I must go. I must leave at once. I beg you to stay yet a while, for you dance with the likeness of a butterfly on the soft summer breeze. I cannot stay. I cannot. My heart prompts me to tell you that I love you, for I have never seen a maid so fair. No. No, please let me go. Good night, my prince. My prince charming. Good night. In her haste to leave, my beautiful princess has left her slipper behind. A slipper of glass spun as fine as gossamer. I vow I shall find my lovely princess if I must search all the kingdoms of the world. For I would make her my wife. Now there's a real basis for a successful marriage. The prince has one dance with Cinderella. One dance, mind you, and he wants to marry her. Well, why not? I wonder what a marriage counselor would say about that. 
must you be so literal? And she is such a bird brain, she runs off leaving one of her shoes behind. It was a slipper of glass, spun as fine as gossip. And those two stepsisters of Cinderella's, they can't be very bright. They're right there at the ball, and they don't recognize her just because she's wearing a new dress. Now, I ask you, what sort of an IQ would those two have? Now, you take my Cinderella. You take her, and you can have her. My Cinderella has moxie. She goes after what she wants. No fairy godmother nonsense about her. When she arrived at Mr. King's party, the place was really jumping. The minute she wiggle walked into the joint, all the cats began to yowl. It's a doll, a real living, breathing doll. Hey, looky, looky, hiya, Cookie. Ah, get away from me, short, fat, and repulsive. Come on, sweet mama. How about fitting on a cheek? Let's live it up for real. Stop that, cornball. What's with you, beautiful? You mad in this mad, mad world? Mister, I'm just not playing the field, that's all. What I'm looking for is the favorite. Where's the prince? In the rumpus room, lapping up some corn squeezes, I suppose. Thanks, chum. See you around the bowling alley sometime. Dig that crazy, crazy walk. Real cool, man. Cool. Yeah. Well, hiya, babe. Are you the character they call the prince? That's right. My old man is J. Walter King, a King, Betancourt, Bagby, and Wince. Sure, I know. You're in the advertising record. Big deal. Hmm. You know something? You're okay. Sounds as if this advertising dodge pays off in blue chips. You mind if I park the bustle? My dogs are killing me. Yeah, sit right here next to me, doll. That's it. Would you like a slug gun? Yeah, I don't mind if I do. Uh, double bourbon on the rocks with a twist of lemon to you. There you are. I like you, sweetie. You're a real dish of stuff. Oh, that's the spot. Pull her up again, Buster. <laughs> You and your old men are on quite a bash tonight. Uh, entertaining the sponsors is what they call an occupational headache. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. I met a couple of the jokers when I came in. Well, here's mud in your eye, Prince. Cheers. It's a real sharp bunch of threads you're filling. Mm, it's just a little something I picked up. And diamonds and pearls. Yeah, I picked them up, too. So you're the original man in the gray flannel suit, huh, kiddo? Ah, oh, I suppose one of these days I'll make vice president. How come you haven't pressured your old man before this? He's just made me an account executive for Bimbo's No Bunyan Shoes, but I think he's throwing me a curve. The radio and TV ratings are doing a nosedive. What you need is a gimmick, Brindley. Ah, you can say that again. Come on, they're playing a rock and roll, and that's for me, sugar. Okay, honey. Right. A gimmick. Let me think. No giveaway, no panel. These kind of notes really send me. Give me the... Oh, dog, Connor. What's the matter, baby? I'm losing my slipper. Hey, wait a minute, Princey. Wait a minute. I think I got your gimmick. What's with you? You're flipping your lid or something? Now, listen. I leave my slipper behind when I leave here tonight. Nobody knows who I am, so you put big ads in the newspapers and buy spots on radio and television. A coast-to-coast campaign, a big build-up in Valley to find the bimbo no bunion shoe girl. You got it, Princey? Hey, I really think you got something there. Jumping catfish, is that 12 o'clock? Sure is. The time lock on the wall safe. The stuff's got to be back there before midnight. I got to scram out of here. What are you yakking about? If I don't get going right now, I'm a dead pigeon. Uh, here's my slipper. You take it from there. So long, Chrissy. Do you see how competent and constructive my realistic Cinderella has turned out to be? She's scheming and conniving and actually dishonest. Oh. She stole her stepmother's jewelry. Oh, nonsense. She only borrowed it for a little while. She's hurrying home right now to put it back in the wall safe. How about the bracelet she gave to Connie? Don't you worry about my girl. She's ingenious. She'll find some way of getting around that. She's an uncouth, unprincipled creature. Well, at least she isn't inane and innocuous like your girl. But please, go on with your story. Thank you. The prince searched everywhere for Cinderella. But alas, he could not find her. And when his search had quite failed, he grew ill with disappointment and vexation. Then the king, who dearly loved his son, called a privy council and asked his ministers what was to be done. 
they decided to send out heralds throughout the kingdom, proclaiming that the prince would marry the lady who could wear the tiny slippers spun of glass as fine as gossamer. <laughs> The slipper does not fit you, my lady. Dear, I'm so disappointed, Prince. Let me try, sister. <laughs> I'm sorry. It does not fit you either. I felt so certain it would. Let the modest little girl who is standing back there come forward. Why, why it is you, my princess. Despite your modest garments, you cannot conceal your identity from me. For I see you through the eyes of love. Now, we'll try on the slipper. Yes, my prince. It fits. The slipper fits. Come to my arms, my darling. My own true princess. My prince. My prince charming. And so they were married and lived happily ever afterwards. Now, wasn't that a sweet and lovely story? To be perfectly frank with you, Lorena, I found it rather dull and pedestrian. Oh, Vincent. Well, in my version, there is action and excitement. My Cinderella is real and colorful. I suppose your story has a sordid ending like so many realistic stories. She probably went to the penitentiary and the advertising man was sent to the Chicago office. No, Lorena, not at all, not at all. Listen. This is your newscaster, Thomas Lowell. The search for the bimbo and old onion shoe girl continues. She has been reported seen in St. Louis, Altoona, and Tibet. Cinderella, turn off that radio. There are rumors that... I'm sick to death of hearing about that bimbo, no bunion shoe girl. That's all you read about in the newspapers, all you hear on the radio, all you see on the television. And that singing commercial... Where is the bimbo girl and who is she with the no bunion shoe? Bunion shoe. Driving me nuts. Ah, keep your hair on, kids. It'll be all over tomorrow. It's been the greatest search since Bridie Murphy. And, Dad, the ratings are neat, 43. The bimbo shoe sales are up 72.9. A terrific campaign. This makes you a vice president, my boy. I owe it all to you, Cinderella. Ah, it's okay, Princey. But when do we get hitched? Whenever you say, baby. We better see how soon we can line up the network so we can get full coverage. We want this wedding to be a real doozy. Bimbo's no bunion shoes will sponsor the whole works. I'd better let the press and photographers in. They're getting impatient. You're smooth, Cinderella. Real frantic. Smoke. Oh, and Princey, you're the most. Well, Vincent, at least you had a happy ending. Of course. You see, Lorene, there are all sorts of Cinderella stories. They happen every day, but they all end in exactly the same way. Even today, the beautiful girl can marry the handsome prince. And, of course, they'll live happily ever after. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop has presented Speaking of Cinderella, starring Vincent Price and Lorene Tuttle and directed by Don Clark. Original script by Ed Verdier and Don Clark. The cast included Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Louise Arthur, Jean Bates, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedrow, Harry Bartell, Sam Edwards, Peter Leeds, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. Original music for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Jeff Alexander. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William Frug. <laughs> This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when we present Jacob's Hands, an original new story by Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood. And we are proud to welcome as our narrator the distinguished author, Mr. Isherwood, presented on the CBS Radio Workshop.
Sunday over most of these same stations, the New York Philharmonic Symphony will be heard playing the Brahms Piano Concerto No. 1 in D minor, with Guido Cantelli conducting and Rudolf Hirschny as soloist. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these stations by my son, G. America listens most to the CBS radio network. Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Transcribed. Cops and Robbers is a game played by children, and it's a game actors play on the radio for a living. Tonight, the actors, as usual, will be playing make-believe robbers, but the cops will be real. The CBS Radio Workshop presents Cops and Robbers. My name is Stanley Ness. I'm a writer, mostly of crime, criminals, and what police do about them. For a long time, I've wondered what real detectives would do when confronted with a fictitious crime. And tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop is giving me a chance to find out. First, so you, the actors, and I can start off knowing what the detectives will try to find out, I've written a short dramatic sketch which we have recorded while our detectives, all retired members of the police department, city of New York, are across the street having coffee. The scene, a one-room flat on the Upper East Side of New York. <laughs> What? Who is it? It's me, Duncan. Well, come on in. It's open. It's not open. Oh. Honest. Goodness. Hi, baby. Oh, take care of My fingernails are wet. Oh. Well, where is it? Well, uh, where's what? The chow mein. You were going to stop at the Chinese restaurant and bring back chow mein. Where you been? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was. I, I forgot... You forgot. How could you forget what you went out for? Ellie, baby, listen. You, you got to stand by me. I'm in a jam. You went out to get chow mein. How could you get in a jam? I did. That's, that's all there is to it. What kind of a jam? I can't tell you right now. You expect me to stand by you? You can't tell me? Why don't you get the chow mein? Forget about the chow mein, will you? Listen, you got the telephone number that bar and grill with Joe hangs out at Glenham's? What's Joe got to do with this? Have you got the telephone number? Yeah, I got it. It's in the drawer there. One of that cards. I'll get it for me, will you, baby? Get it yourself. My fingernails are all wet. What's this all about, anyway? I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. Well, where is it, anyway? It's there. Look. It's been look, not tear apart. Oh, here it is. Look, I got to go out in the hall and phone him. John? Yeah? Oh, you sit down and relax and tell me what this is all about? I don't have to sit down. I can tell you standing up. I shot a guy. You what? I shot a guy. You went out to get a container of chow mein. How could you shoot a guy? I don't know how I could, but I did. So we know what our detectives will try to find out. The crime referred to was of such a serious nature that the precinct detective squad commander was called from his home to supervise the investigation. Our squad commander tonight is Lieutenant Dan Campion, who retired from the police department a little over a year ago after 25 years in the job. The detectives working under him will be Howard C. Clancy, Jerry Heaney, and Richard Jacobson. Approximately an hour and ten minutes after the crime occurs, Detective Jacobson, who is carrying the squeal, which means it is his case, has returned to the station house and is typing up a report on the progress of the investigation so far. Remember, the detectives have no script. They are playing themselves, doing a job just like they've done every day. What's up, Jake? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. We had a tough stick up in the precinct tonight. 
Oh, another one? Yeah, I'll lick a store over on 72nd Street. What time did it happen, Jack? Oh, about 9.50. It's that Fairland liquor store over oh, on 280, yeah. 82nd. Yeah. And uh, a fellow stuck a gun into the clerk who was in front of the store, and the owner was in back doing a little bookkeeping. When uh, he stepped out, he had a pistol. So you got a permit for it? Oh, yes, he had that. We checked on that. But anyway, he, poor fellow, got shot. Is he seriously hurt? Oh, yes, He's uh, alive yet, though. Oh, yes. Oh. He's over at Metropolitan Hospital. He fired a shot at the stick-up man. Stick-up man fired two at him and hit him. And he went down. He Where was he four. shot, uh, Dick? Under the chin that hit him. Deflected into his jaw, just below his lips. Oh. Anything else to it? He got a little more than $800. He grabbed a uh, money in a paper bag and uh, ran out the front door in the street. Anybody see him? Any good identification? Well, him? pretty fair identification. The, uh, the fellow had a car. We found it out later. He uh, ran around the corner on 3rd Avenue. He hit some old woman, knocked it down. Anybody see him? There was a sanitation man trying to help the old woman up. But he saw this fellow continue to run. He went around 3rd Avenue and looked him over, and he was getting into a car and got away. You got the on... sanitation man oh, name definitely. and all yes, like that? Yes, we have Good. that. Good. But on the back of his car, he had some of that red tape, that fluorescent tape they're using. Oh, yes. yes. And uh, that was all over the back bumper. And he got the last three numbers of the plate. Okay. I sent out an alarm for the car over the teletype with the three numbers, and uh, all the boys in the neighboring precincts have been notified. Now, Lieutenant Campion, Sergeant Klein on TSS rang upstairs, and he says Dowd over on post 11 thinks he's got that car spotted that was oh, on that stick up and fine. shooting. It's over there at 2nd Avenue, 77th Street. It's a two door Plymouth sedan. It's 3T-152. Oh, we got the full license. Huh? Yeah, and I verified it. And it's registered under a Joseph E. McCondy. It's 761 East 76th Street. Hey, Clancy, did you check Lost Property on that? Okay. Yeah, see if you can get the description of the car and get the owner's name and address. Yeah, Dowd is guarding the car over there. He's not letting anybody go near it. Say, sure. Jake. Okay. You go over with Howie after he makes that call and see if we can get that owner in here and we'll talk to him. Very good, we'll do that. Okay, get right on it. Now we see the detectives are off on the right track. But what about the characters played by our actors? Let's get back to them. The following scene was written, rehearsed, and recorded in advance. And of course, Lieutenant Campion and his men are unaware of what is going on in the scene, just as they would be in the job. All right, Joe. I'm coming. Oh, right, Joe. I'm telling you, Dunk, you got a friend to me. That was the best fight all season, and I got a miss to finish. I appreciate it, Joe. Hello, Ellie. Hi. Well, what's the big jam you're in? You sure it's not the car? No, it's not the car. It only should be. Where's the keys? Here. Here you are, Joe. Mm. Where'd you leave the car? In the same place, right where you always leave it. All right. Now, what's this big jam you're in? He went out to get some chow mein to bring back. Let me tell it, will you? Well, who's stopping you? I went out, and I, I started to the Chinese restaurant, all right. But then I figured it's Friday. It's going to be a long weekend, and... I don't have much money in my pocket. So? So I, I figured I ought to do a little work. Then I ran into you on the corner, and I said, Joe, can I borrow your car? You said, sure, why not if you fill it up with gas? So you gave me the keys, and that was that. Not yet that wasn't that. You let me tell it my own way. So I lent you the car. Yeah, that's right. And I drove around scouting for a good place to make. I parked it on 72nd Street where I could get away easy. I walked around the corner, and there was this liquor store just right for picking. Using my car for the get? It was all perfectly simple, Joe. Wait, wait, there's more to come. What's to come, Dunk? Well, it, it was a good touch, and I cleaned out the register, and I'm heading for the door, and all of a sudden, another clerk comes out from the back with a gun. Uh-oh. So what could I do? I blast away. He drops, and I take out around the corner for the car. And to, to make a long story short, I'm in the car, and I'm away. Is the guy dead? He didn't wait around to find out. My car you gotta borrow to go heist the joint and shoot up a guy. That's a fine thing. I'm sure, I'm sure I got away okay. I don't think anybody made the license number. There were some people looking at me as I came around the corner, but I don't think they made the number on the car. But supposing somebody did. That's what I want to talk to you about, Joe. Look, if by any chance somebody did and the cops come talking to you, don't tell them you let me the car. What do you mean, don't tell him I lent you the car? What am I going to tell him? Well, you know what to say, Joe. You'll think of something. There ain't a chance in a thousand anybody made the car, but I just want to cover every step of ground. Look, look, I'm an innocent bystander. I was in a bar and grill watching the fight. You didn't tell me what you were going to do. Why should I cover for you? Joe, I've known you a long time. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Oh, tell, tell me, tell me something, Dunk. 
Huh? What? Uh, uh, how much did you get out of the liquor store? Money, you mean? Yeah, money. Over 500. How much over 500? 812 dollars. That wasn't bad. Was it worth shooting a man for? Joe, you gotta help me. I help you plenty. Give me 400. What do you mean, give you 400? You want me to help you, don't you? But that's half. It ain't half. You got 812. All I'm asking is 400. But there's not a chance in a thousand. There'll be a kickback. All right, then what are you worried about? Now, let's forget the whole thing. I'll go home and go to sleep. And if the cops talk to me, all I can tell them is the truth. Oh, you got me in a box, Joe. Oh, it's your box. Give him the 400, Doug. What are you taking chances? Well, what are you uh, going to tell them if they talk to you? I don't know yet. I'll think of something. Yeah, but why? Well, you give me a chance. The deal was just sprung on me. I got to work it out. All right, Joe. You cover me now. Don't forget. Yeah, I'll cover you if they talk to me. Thanks, Joe. I knew I could count on you. Oh, boy, this is a load off my mind. What a relief. Now that it's such a relief, please go down and get the child name. Now, with sufficient information on which to act, Lieutenant Campion has instructed his men on their next step in the investigation. Detectives Clancy and Jacobson, for instance, go to 761 East 76th Street. The address listed for Joseph P. McCondy, in whose name the car is registered. Remember, from now on, there is no script. The actors are on their own. So are the detectives. Let's see what happens. Hey, Mike. McCondy. Mike. Is there something I could do for you, gentlemen? What's your name, Chief? Joseph P. McCondy. We're detectives. Oh, oh. do you own an automobile? Yes, I do. What kind of a car do you have? I have a 1950 Plymouth two-door. Did you have a little accident tonight with it? No, sir. Do you have a license? Yes, sir. I have it right here. Can you see it? Sure. Is there something wrong, gentlemen? Well, uh, you were just trying to a little accident something. tonight, I'm sure, someplace, didn't you? No, sir. You sure of that? Absolutely. You loan the car to anybody? No, sir. Where is the car now? Well, I left it on 2nd Avenue between 77th and 78th Street. Why did you leave it around there for? Well, I was at a bar all night. I was watching the fights. Right. Anybody with you? No, sir. Well, in By the bar, I, I, a couple of boys I see every once in a while in there. What's some of their names? Give me one name. Well, there was, I, I'd give you a couple. It was Bud and Tommy. Uh-huh. But you didn't lend Bud or Tommy your car tonight, No, did no, you? no. We were all there. I'd like to talk to you. I'll hold on. You don't mind, do you? Just... No, sure. Do you have all anything right. on you before no, you... Sir. Huh? No, sir. No, sir. Absolutely not. You sure of that? I'm clean. Ever I'm been clean. arrested? No, I've never been arrested. You sure of that? Absolutely. Look, anything that you say, we're going to check. Don't forget that. Right, sir. So you might just as well tell us the truth right now. Yeah, I've never been arrested. Never been arrested. Oh, I've been down at the house. Okay, okay. let's go. Okay. With Joe McCondy in custody, the detectives returned to the station house. They walked them upstairs to the squad room and into Lieutenant Campion's office. Son, if this is a McCondy, fellow on that car. Oh, hello, Mr. McCondy. How do you do, sir? Sit down there a minute. Yes, thank you. Can I yeah. see you outside a minute, Lieutenant? Yeah, you stay in here with him, Howard. Yeah, okay. I'll be right back, Mr. McCondy. We have some other business to take care of. Could I smoke in here, sir? All right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but don't throw the butts on the floor. Oh, no, yeah. I wouldn't do that. You want any coffee? Yeah, I wouldn't mind a little okay. black. Huh? Stand up. Yeah, sure. Everything you have in your pockets, take them out and put it on the desk here. All Everything, right. no matter what it is. Okay. If it's money, count it. All right. In front of me. Yeah. This is embarrassing because I'm not too well healed. I, I only got uh, five, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen dollars. Thirteen, okay. Put it back. Okay. Okay. Hey, Howie, the I have a wallet here, Howie. Okay. Yeah, let's look at that, will you? All right. Uh, my wallet. Another wallet. I got to keep. <clears throat> Who do you live with at this address? Nobody. I see. All right. What do you work at, Mr. McCondy? Well, I I kind of dapple in the. Uh, Sports, equestrian. Uh, what do you mean, dapple? Well, you know, I hang around uh, the racetracks a little bit. You're a bookmaker? Well, a little bit. You just... take numbers? No, I don't take no numbers. You ever fingerprinted for anything? No, I was never fingerprinted. Never fingerprinted? No. Because oh. we're going to fingerprint you. Well, that's all right. It's your privilege, I guess. Excuse me a minute. Spot tonight. Lieutenant, he was in the spot yeah. up on the avenue tonight. Yeah, we'll come to that. Plan. Say, uh, Jerry, check the BCI on this fellow's name and address and 
You got a pretty good description of him. Okay. And uh, then I want you to check uh, the information bureau and see if he's been... Do you ever get a summons for anything? No. Never had a summons no. in your life? No. Well, yeah. you mean with parking summons and yeah. stuff like that? Well, I got, I got a ticket for speeding there once or twice. How long ago was summons, that? isn't it? Yeah, I... Why don't you answer the question? Well, I, I call those tickets, you know. <laughs> you were convicted, so it's, then? It's polite. Is that right? You were fined? Yeah, I was fined. I was, well, that's a I conviction. Oh, oh I... now, uh, where were you uh, at 9.20? I was at Glennon's Bar and Grill on, on 2nd Avenue between uh, about 75th and 76th Street. I got there about, uh, oh, about 9 o'clock. I had some uh, real rotten chow there, and then I uh, had a few beers with uh, Spud and Tommy, what I told you about. And we were chewing the rag there for about an hour. The fight went on at about 10 o'clock. And uh, we made a couple of bets, me, me and this Bud and Tommy, and... Uh, you didn't leave the premises no, between no. 9 and, and 10 no, no. o'clock? No, no. Did you see the whole fight? Yeah, I went 10 rounds. Who won the fight? I'm Merrill. I won the, I won the fight. What, what odds did you get? Two to one. I gave the oh, odds. Oh, you gave the yeah. odds, huh? What did you get on that, Jerry? Anything? Hey, McCondy, what are you handing out here? You did a bit in 1952 for Pettit Larceny. What kind of a Pettit Larceny was it? You went to the island for it. Oh. What kind of a Pettit Larceny was that? Was that Grand Larceny and reduced to Pettit Larceny? You took a plea on it, didn't you? Yes, yes. It was well, grand larceny then, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I don't... Listen, I don't know the technical words for these things. Oh, you know it's just as much about it as we do. Well, you arrest You know me. more law about now, that. Now, hold it, fellas. Listen, who used your car tonight? We haven't got all night. There's a man dying. Right. I told you when we picked you up at your house that we were going to verify everything that you told us. Remember me saying yeah, that? Yeah, I know that. Listen, Mac, why don't you stop kidding? We're bringing the bartender over here. And you well, you can bring him in. Well, he's coming in. That's okay with me. Sure Howie, take this yeah. guy over and fingerprint him and let him think this thing over. And if he don't come up with something different, boy, you're in. It's after one in the morning. A detective has gone to Glenham's Bar and Grill on 2nd Avenue to get the bartender Whitey. He brings him into Lieutenant Campion's office. Hi, Lou. Hello. Uh, this, uh, this is Harry White, and they call him Whitey. He's the bartender. This is Lieutenant Campion, charge of the squad here. Hello, Hello, Whitey. How are you? Lieutenant. This is Detective Heaney and Detective Jacobs. Hi, Whitey. Hi, Whitey. How do you do? So long have you been in our precinct, Whitey? Oh, I've been working on a joint up there about eight years now. Eight years, huh? Yeah. All, All right, right, if I sit down? Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Sit down. You can smoke. Do what you want. <laughs> you know Joe McCondy, Whitey? Yeah, I know Joe a long you time. You see him tonight? Yeah, yeah. He was in tonight. Was he in the general tonight? Yeah, yeah. Was he there all night? Uh, well, wait a minute, now, he, pretty busy night. He came in, uh, came in a little after nine o'clock, I think it was, about nine o'clock, yeah. He was there all night then? Yeah, he was there, uh, well, let's see, now, the fights, he was watching the fights. He was there till about, uh, quarter of eleven, I think. Anyway. Who was he with, Whitey? Uh, I have a couple of pals of his, uh, who are they? Oh, I don't know. The last name's Tom and Bud something. He's, he's always with them. What time did Joe come in there, did you say? Well, I think it was around 9 o'clock. It was before. 10 o'clock? Oh, no, no. He was, no, he was in at 10 o'clock. Was, was he there at 7.30? No, no, he wasn't there at 7.30. Did you miss him any time at all between 9 and 10 o'clock? Between 9 and 10? Yeah. Did you miss him? No. You he took a bed off. No, he was there. He was drinking all the time. He... Well, he said he was there since about 7.30. All evening and all night. No, Somebody's lying that. here, Whitey. Either you or him now. No, come on. I remember. Listen, I know. I know Joe very well. We're what about his two pals, Whitey? Did they leave the place at all tonight? No, the two pals were there. They were there all the time. They come in with hey, Wait a minute. I tell you one thing. The phone rang. And uh, I picked it up. And the call was for Joe. But this was uh, this about 10.30, I think. So uh, I called Joe, and Joe went up the phone. I forgot about it. I, I was busy, like I said, you know. And uh, suddenly Joe comes running up the bar. He says, I got to go. What time was that? Well, this was, uh, well, this was about right after the fight. Was this male uh, or female voice? Uh, uh, you mean, you mean the guy that called? Call. It, was, it was a male voice. Male, voice. male voice. Yeah, yeah. And he called, and then Joe said he had to leave right away. Yeah, he said something about uh, uh, 
He says, uh, I got to go up to Ellie's, I think it was. What Ellie. time was that about? I think it was about quarter of 11. It was right after the fights were over. Yeah. Oh, we don't need a lineup for this. Bring Joe in and make sure he identifies him. Uh, Dick, okay. go out and bring Joe in. Is this the fella here? Yeah. Hi, hey, hey, Whitey. Hi, Joe. Hey, right. Joe. Yeah. You said that you were in the bar all night. Yeah. Until the time you come home, the detectives met you at the door. Yeah. Well, what are you lying about? Well, I was there. Well, 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 well. now stop. Why? He said you weren't there. He said you left there. What? Who's Ellie? I don't know no Ellie. When you got a phone call and you left the place all excited. Well, I wasn't excited. I yeah, it's oh, cool. Cool. I, I got a phone call at at Whitey's place. You see, now here's the way it works. <laughs> And like I told you before, I... All right, I take a little book in there, see? Listen, Joe. No, that's the truth. Book. That's true. You want to tell you, you want to hold a bag for everybody, hold it. Because you're going to you're gonna hold it unless you tell us who you loan your car to or if somebody else uses your Maybe car. Joe would rather talk to us with Whitey outside. You wait outside a while, Whitey. Yeah, okay. Go on out with him, Dick. Huh? Very good. Good luck, Joe. All right, Whitey, thanks. Are you going to tell us who you loan your car to or not? I didn't lend it to nobody. Right, nobody had your car tonight. No. You, you had it all night. It was, on the, it was on the street. Hold it, fellas. Does the car belong to you? Is sure. there, there's no mortgage on it or no, anything else? No. It all belongs to yeah, you. Yeah. Does everything in the car belong to you? That stuff in the back, uh, on the trunk and all like everything, that? Everything. So everything belongs yeah, to you, huh? Yeah. Is that right? That's right. All right, well, how about the gun under the seat? I don't know nothing about no gun. Now, you fellas heard him say everything belongs to him. And do you know with a previous misdemeanor, boy, this is a felony. You're not kidding anybody. You're in. Well, I, there's a man dying over there. All I know is you could check with the uh, with the Whitey and with Bud. Bud works in the garage on First Avenue. We'll have somebody check. McCandy, I want to tell you something. Yeah. Now, we found this gun in your car. And what we're going to do, we're going to send this gun down to the Ballistic Bureau to have a test made and to see if it conforms with the bullets that were shot into that man tonight. So, so we're just going to hold you. You are now arrested. You're arrested for 1897 of the penal law, which happens to be a felony. So I want to tell you right now, you're permitted to call somebody or write a letter. You to get small yourself and kick in. You haven't got a chance. I tell you, I, well, everything uh, I told you is true. We've been babying you all day oh. and all night. I, I don't we're not going to baby you anymore. I, I don't want to take no raps for nobody, so... Uh, You're not going to take any raps? No. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Is. Why don't you tell the lieutenant just what okay. happened? Okay, All right, let's go. I got a phone call Let him at White's, you see, from, uh, from Dunk. Dunk. Oh, uh, what's Dunk's name? Dunk, Dunk Rui. Dunk Rui? Yeah, it's like Dewey with an R. Where does he live? He lives on uh, 398 East 71st Street. That's Ellie's. Uh, that's his girlfriend. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's what he called me from Ellie's house. Let's take this name and address sure, for sure. a while. Check that at the BCI. Okay. See if we get anything uh, on him. Go ahead now. Well, he called me up and uh, he said uh, he had to see me, you see. Yeah. So I told him to come down because I wanted to watch the fight. I didn't want to miss the last round. So he said it was very important I should come to Ellie's house as fast as I could get there. So he, was, he was the one who was excited. I wasn't excited. You're the calm type. Yeah, you know. I, so anyway, uh, I went over to Ellie's house and I loaned, I loaned Dunk my car. I didn't. He didn't tell me what he was going to do. It was no, he twisted car. your arm for you to get it from. Him. Well, I, I lend him the car. I paid Where's a Dunk now? Bucks. I don't know where he is now. Maybe he's at Ellie's. At Ellie's house. Yeah. What time okay. you lend him the car? I don't know when he took it. I gave him the keys. Where do you generally meet him? At Whitey's. At Whitey's. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But he goes steady with Ellie, huh? Yeah, I've been up there for a bit. Does he live with her? Well, he's there most of the time. Let's just a friend. Just be discreet, you know. What's that location again? 398 East 71st. What a problem. It's, uh, 3E, I think it is. It's on the third floor. They got a phone over there? Yeah. Okay. Say, Dick, yes, Jerry, uh -huh. get right over to this Ellie's house. You may nail this guy right there. In fact, I think we'd better put him in the boob downstairs and we'll all go over. Now, 20 minutes later, the detectives are in the hall on the third floor outside of Ellie's flat. Here, as they hope to make the final arrest in the case, Good. Lieutenant Campion gives his instructions. Yeah, that's right. Can everybody get your guns out right now? We don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah. Special delivery. Okay. Oh. Where's Doc? What? What do you mean? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute, don't hide her. There's no sense of hiding her. She's not. She's going to be a nice little girl. Listen, Ellie, where's Dunk? Where's Dunk? Dunk, who, who 
Oh, you know, don't who? Now, don't give us that line. Well, what you talking about, really? You don't, oh, huh? Get place over, Lieutenant. Yeah, look this joint over. Give us a good sergeant. Yeah, give us a good There's nothing here. We'll find out. We'll find out. Well, We're the best moving men in the world. We're going to scream, too, so just keep it nice and Go over there and sit really? down. Hey. Oh. It's my money. Your How money much is there? A couple hundred dollars. What is a couple of hundred? It's my money. It's all I got. It's all How my much? money. It's How much? Uh, I don't know. About two or three hundred dollars or something like that. Count that out, I saved Jake. it. Billy, where's Dunk? I don't... Come on, we know he was up here. Jerry, let her watch him counting this dough, will you? How much is there? There's $815 here. Well, $815 is not a couple. I don't take it out and count it all the time. I don't keep my money in the bank. I keep it under there. There's oh, the difference wait. between a couple of hundred dollars and $800. Look, look, I'm going to cover the door in case this bum comes in. Oh, do that yes. by all means. And yell if you need some help there. Oh, Let's well, get back to the money. this money? It's my money. It's my money. It's oh. all the money I have. Don't be screaming. I ask you that again. Mm -hmm. What do you do for a living? I don't know anything right now. Where I, did you get this money? I saved it. I've, I've, I've worked other times. I've been on the stage. What kind of work do you do? Well, I've been on the stage. How long ago? Oh, several years ago. I just uh, for a little while, and then I've, I've had other jobs. I've, well, how do you maintain yourself right now? Right now, I'm, I'm unemployed. For how long? Oh... But six months or something like that. Six months and you got 815 fish under the cover there? Well, you live here alone, Ellie? Yes, sir, I do. What's men's clothes doing in the closet? Some, that's, uh... Your father's. No, not my father's. There's somebody left in here. No, she'll it's... She'll explain. A... Come on, she'll explain. You've been arrested before, Ellie? No. Never been arrested? No. Hold on. Ellie, stop. Yeah, man. Take him up, Take him up. Give him a quick fan. Take him up, Fred. What's this, Ellie? Give him a fresh. Who are you? I don't know. Sit down. Sit down. Sit, down. Sit down there. You didn't know Dunk, huh? I didn't say I didn't know him. I said I hadn't seen him in a long time, and I hadn't. Dunk, you better get that new suit out of the closet. Who You're going to need it. Where are cops? I don't know your cops. Oh, do you want to be shown? Well, sure, I want to be shown. Shut what do you up, work you at? Bum, you weird show you. What, what do you work at? I don't work. I'm sick. Are you? You'll be sicker when this is over. How long do you know the Jane here? How long do I know you? A couple, uh, couple years. Yeah, a couple of years. Do you want to live here? Well, I don't know what you want. What do you want with me? I know uh, your clothes in the closet. They're his clothes. Yeah, Did you right. leave any money with her? You left, a, you left an envelope with her, didn't you? Some dough? She said you How much did. Was it, it? Shut uh, up. You'll keep quiet. How much did you leave with her? Well, look, I, look, I want a lawyer. I mean, I want a lawyer. I don't get a lawyer. You get a lawyer. How much did you with her? How much money? She said no, you no, left the money. I, 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 I left this some money. She I said you left 800 no. bucks. Is that right? I didn't leave. No. How much did you leave? No, no, no. You didn't, you didn't count leave. it. I didn't leave any 800 dollars. Sell me. What are you going to charge or something? What am I charging? You'll tell them. We're going to give you a 48. Did you ever hear about a 48? I don't know what it is, no. Well, we make out a short affidavit down in court, see? And it's a 48. And if we can't find anything on you in 48 hours, we give you another 48. And we keep giving you 48. Until you get wise to yourself. Come on, come on. 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 All right, get them up. We'll take them down the house. You know, I see that Joe. I'll tell him. Come on, keep going, Dunk. Next time, I'll borrow somebody else's car. And that was cops and robbers. With real cops and not-so-real robbers. They were actors, and I'm sure you will agree, very good actors, playing for the most part without a script, knowing only the backgrounds and motivations of their characters. John Sylvester was Dunk, Elspeth Eric was Ellie, Larry Haynes played Joe, and Ken Lynch was the bartender. The CBS Radio Workshop is grateful to Lieutenant Dan Campion and Detectives Richard Jacobson, Howard Clancy, and Jerry Heaney for helping us try to prove a point. I hope we did. You have been listening to Cops and Robbers on the CBS Radio Workshop. Cops and Robbers was conceived and directed by Stanley Niffs, who also acted as your narrator. All names were fictitious, except those of our detectives, who are all retired members of the Detective Division, Police Department, City of New York. This is Art Hannis inviting you to listen next week when the CBS Radio Workshop will present The Legend of Jimmy Blue Eyes, a narrative poem set to music by Ray Noble. 
the story of a jazz trumpeter who sells his soul to the devil. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in New York by Paul Roberts. Another brilliant concert by the New York Philharmonic Symphony comes to you over most of these same stations on Sunday as Guido Cantelli returns to conduct an exciting program featuring the Beethoven Concerto No. 4 in G major with the distinguished German pianist William Bachhaus as soloist. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by the Jack Carson Show. Tonight, the CBS Radio Workshop was transcribed. This is the CBS Radio Network. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, for the first time on the air, a treatment of A.C. Spatorsky's current and sensational bestseller. A factual yet incredible report of those New Yorkers who try to mix work in the city with country living, and who almost invariably end up behind the eight ball. Narrated by Eric Severide, the CBS Radio Workshop presents The Ex-Urbanites. This is Eric Severide. Since the ex-urbanites became a bestseller, it has been called terrifying, hilarious, penetrating, savage. What you will call it depends entirely on you. But you can be sure of this. Whoever you are, wherever you live, the ex-urbanites will strike home to you. Because it's the account of the men who publish your magazines, who hold sway over your radio and television programs, who shape your buying habits in their advertising agencies. Every day of your life, They encourage you to tremendous dreams because they themselves earn their rich living by dreaming tremendously. That sunshine. Man, where did you find sunshine like that? You like it, friend? Well, this is the greatest you've ever painted, Pruitt. The way that sunlight streams through the window, the way it lights the herbs in the window box, the way it touches the girl's hair the way it dramatizes the can opener. Call me Van Gogh. <laughs> no, I mean it, Pruitt. This is the best artwork I've seen as art director of this agency. It'll sell a million can openers or I go down with the Titanic. Who's the model? Well, who needs a model for the typical American housewife? Now, she's dream stuff, Fred, just like the sunshine. I painted this on a rainy day that would float the Titanic. Now, are you ready for the power lawnmower layout? Let's have her. Well, here she is. Call me Rembrandt. This hits me right here. This fellow. The way you've got his teeth clenched on that pipe. The way you've got him bending lovingly over those roses. The age of those gloves on his hands. The beat-up trowel he holds. Oh, that takes me back. Back to what? Park Avenue? To my father out in Michigan. That's the way he used to bend over his roses in the twilight. That same twilight that you've caught right here. He had roots, my old man had. Sometimes I wonder why I ever left Michigan. Well, for the same reasons I left Kansas. $25,000 a year and a choice of the best analysts? <laughs> Maybe. But you still couldn't paint like this if you hadn't gone back to the soil. I beg your pardon. That place that you got in Connecticut. Trees, grass, land, roots. You've left New York and got yourself some new roots, Pruitt. Yeah, I sure have. Setting me back five hundred to have him removed from my driveway. Okay, okay, laugh it up. But I envy you that place, man. Every time I see you lucky fellas head for the country at the end of the day, I remember my father and his roses. Some ex-urbanites have a highly developed talent for remembering events that have never occurred. 
But Fred Northshield had had a father in Michigan who gardened at twilight. Now, as an advertising agency art director, his dreams were of a vice presidency. But that night, in his spacious, comfortable, beautifully decorated Manhattan apartment, the dreams he had helped to dream for millions of American consumers suddenly took over. He was on the verge of becoming an exurbanite. Liz, where's the bottle opener? Right here, on the wall. That thing is a bottle opener? The magic handy open all. Your agency ran a campaign that sold two million in three weeks. Well, how could I see it? There's no sunlight falling on it. Not right now. No, it's a cloudy night. Well, this kitchen has no sunlight even when there is sunlight. Every kitchen ought to have sunlight. Sunlight and herbs. Herbs? There's not a single darned herb in the window box. Well, actually, there isn't a window box. Every kitchen needs a window box with herbs. Just the most important ones, of course. But what you really need is a whole herb garden. You put them just this side of the roses. I go a little easy on the highballs, dear. It's only 8 o'clock and the bakers are coming over for bridge in a few minutes. The bakers? Not a root between them. I beg your pardon? They've got no roots. We've got no roots. I see. Well, if it's roots you want and roses, I guess that means we'll have to move to the suburbs. Not them, Liz. Not the suburbs, house after house, just alike. I mean, the real country. Out beyond the suburbs, an, an hour from town by train. Grass, lots of it, trees, all you want. Air, all you want of that. How about it, Liz? Well, I suppose we could look at Liz. I knew you'd be for it. Liz, it'll be the greatest thing we ever did. <laughs> Thus, to the New Yorker, the country is that land that lies beyond the crowded suburb, yet remains within 60 minutes' train time of his office. This is a land of exurbia, ex meaning from, and urbia meaning the crowded city and its suburbs. In going to exurbia, he will find it already filled with men like himself, who are gainfully employed in the field of communications, radio, television, commercial art, magazine publishing, public relations, and the theater. In no other field is there more fantastic competition. They deal in ideas, and ideas alone. Tomorrow, someone may have a better idea. Tomorrow, they may suddenly find they are barren of ideas. They will be without a job. The escape to Exurbia, then, is their attempt to realize a secret dream, that once they are away from the rat race at nightfall, they will ride the superhighway to happiness. And so they begin to look for a place in the country. Try Bucks County. It's the only real country, Fred. Take a fast train from Penn Station, one hour to read a couple of chapters of a good book, and you're in Trenton, ready for real country living across the river in Bucks County. Bucks. Lousy with beautiful old stone houses ready for a right guy like you to take over. Oscar Hammerstein, Dorothy Parker, Moss Hart, Bud Schulberg. They went to Bucks. You can raise black Angus, hens, pigs, pheasant. Or let one of the local men do it for you while you live off the fat of the land. Sleep all night with cows mooing in your ears. Real music. <laughs> Bucks County. One hour by train and another hour's drive to any kind of land you can buy if your name isn't Rockefeller. Did they tell you about those new steel mills in Bucks? The new Levitt Town? Thousands of homes just like on Long Island? That's country living? <laughs> It'll be worse than Jersey five years from now. If you want old homes, people who really belong to the land, ever been in Rockland County? Quaint, charming, quiet. Try Sneedon's Landing, New City. Look around there. The real artists, the real writers, the real theater people. They're all in Rockland, and they leave you alone. Alone? Oh, don't be dreary, Fred. Rockland County? Haven't you heard of the Thruway? The new Thruway bridge across the Hudson? 
It puts the Bronx minutes from Sneedon's Landing. Look, why don't you and Liz spend a weekend with Jerry and me in Chappaqua and take a look around Westchester County? Meet the Reader's Digest crowd. Talk with the writers and the artists around Pound Ridge. Your children will love Westchester. Wonderful schools. Maybe you and Liz should come out some night and go to the PTA with me. PTA? What are you bucking for, Fred? The job of running their ice cream social? Look, if you want real rich He-Man country living, come on out to Long Island's North Shore. Oyster Bay, Manhasset, Sands Point, riding to hounds, yachts lying at anchor, the kind of things F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about. Ever see that $15 million chateau Marshall Field built there? Vacation place. When they have a wedding, they hire the New York Philharmonic and hide them in the shrubbery to play the wedding march. Wonderful crowd out there in the North Shore. Wonderful, I'll bet, if you have a chauffeur. But we're not in that class, Fred. You'll have to ride the Long Island Railroad. Yeah. I say that's a fate worse than death. Well, I guess we've covered everything but Fairfield County so far, Liz. Well, Connecticut, here we come. In considering a move to the exurbs, it is inevitable that the departing New Yorker gives strong consideration to Fairfield County, Connecticut. To use a speech habit of its inhabitants, A, it is the most famous, B, it is the fastest growing, C, it is the richest in exurban manifestations. I suppose you already know a lot of people already live in here in Fairfield, Mr. Norshield. Oh, yes, Mr. Barnum. Several men in our agency live out here. Now, I'm going to show you folks a beautiful house just put on the market. Nine rooms, three baths, and 12 coach lamps. Coach lamps? Oh, everybody in Fairfield County has coach lamps, Mrs. Norshield. This place even has two besides the outdoor barbecue. You realize what that means, Liz? We can cook our steaks outdoors every evening. What kind of heat does this place have, Mr. Barnum? Heat? Four fireplaces, four beautiful fireplaces, and a whole acre of old trees you can cut up for firewood. (laughs) What about a furnace or something? A furnace? I never thought to ask about that. (laughs) We're busy out here in Fairfield. I suppose you know we've just about trebled our population the last few years. We're also the richest county in the nation. Even beats Amarillo, Texas. You mean something's richer than something in Texas? That's right, Mrs. North Hill. Why... Advertising agency presidents and board chairmen are a dime a dozen. Mere vice presidents and account executives are just uh, foot soldiers. Out here in Fairfield, you'll find the publishers of Life, Woman's Home Companion, Seventeen, Look, Harper's Bazaar, American Weekly, and the president of Time Incorporated. And you'll find Uh, that... Did you say something, Mrs. Nosher? Uh, but before we, uh, drive much farther, Mr. Barnum, I'd like to ask one thing. Oh, yes, ma'am. How much is this house? Fifty or five. Well, what is that in English? Fifty thousand five hundred. For nine rooms? Well, that includes the coach lamps, the barbecue, and a beautiful blue stone terrace. But no furnace. Well, now, don't you worry about that furnace until you see the place, Mrs. Norseal. Oh, and I've got to tell you, there's two cobbler's benches go with the place. <laughs> they say everybody in Fairfield County has a jaguar, a barbecue, coach lamps, and a cobbler's bench. <laughs> Fred, listen, it's ours. The old lady met our counter offer at 49, and Barnum wants to see us about arranging the mortgage tomorrow. <laughs> Which house is this? The first one we looked at. Oh, yes, the one that needs a furnace and a new leg on the second cobbler's bench. Oh, come off of it. Aren't you excited? Of course, dear. By the way, do we get a free timetable with a mortgage? What about the timetable? Well, Marge Holt used to live in that section, and she says that you'll have to rise and shine at 7 a.m. to dress, have breakfast, and drive to the 15 miles to the station to catch the 8.15. <laughs> I, uh, share this seat with you? Why, sure, of course. Thank you. 
Pruitt! My gosh, I didn't even look up when you asked if you could sit down. One never asks if one can sit down, Fred. One asks if one may share one seat. That's the officer's club code of our army. Hmm? What army? Well, the army you've just joined. The most highly paid, most thoroughly disciplined army in the world. The commuting army. 360,000 commuters descend on New York every working day. Their reveille, the alarm clock. It wakes them at dawn, sends them out into rain, sleet, snow, and the fogs of hangover in their second car. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, we hadn't counted on buying a second car, but Liz had to use one car to take the kids to school and back and to do her shopping. Well, and... What did you get for parking at the station? Jeep? Jaguar? Station wagon? What difference does it make? Well, Fred, it's very important for a man who wants to become a vice president. Are you kidding? Well, the men in your position, the car you drive to the station testifies to your sensitivity to what is expected of you. Well, Jaguar denotes class, yes, but a Jeep presumes that your wife is using the Cadillac to take the kids to school in. That car and your associates on the train can make or break you. Pruitt, are you drunk this morning? You're talking like a crazy man. Well, you'll see about the associates. For example, Fred, those two presidents of big agencies who get on at your station... You speak to them, of course. Well, I nod. Well, you're learning. I nod, but never speak unless spoken to. You uh, haven't jostled them getting onto the train. No. Well, you are learning. Well, one of them may need a vice president six months from now. He may start speaking to you on the station platform, if you haven't jostled. Until then, merely nod, never speak. An agency president is one of the brass. You're not even a VP yet. You're still one of the foot soldiers. Now, listen, Paul, you know... Grand Central! Grand Central! Well, goodbye, Fred. No, say, wait, I'll walk through the station with you. I better not. The candidate for vice president is known by the company he keeps. I'm a mere freelance artist dependent on you for work. I could be court-martialed for justice. Grand Central! Grand Central! Fred is a new ex-urbanite, of course, but already he had learned that the rat race from which he has tried to escape now begins the moment his car appears at the station in the morning. It continues as he boards the train, nodding to lesser foot soldiers and to higher brass. It continues as he rides to his working day, and soon it is with him as he starts to leave the office. On your way home, Fred? Uh, something you wanted, J.P.? Oh, no, 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 nothing very much. I, I've been trying to get to you all day, but I got tied in with the brass at BBD and and couldn't make it. No, I, uh, I just want to talk to you about Hubble, that young assistant of yours. What's wrong, J.P.? Wrong? <laughs> Nothing's wrong. You ought to be congratulated for picking such a bright young guy. He was around last night after most of the shop had gone home, and uh, he and Dorfmeyer and I got to polishing some ideas. Well, why didn't you call me in? Well, we looked for you, but you'd gone and catch the train already. Well, I'd be glad to stay. Well, don't worry about it, Fred. I can give you all that in a memo, but... You know, it seems to me we need a fresh slant on things. A couple of times recently, with one client or another, I've been left standing with egg on my face. I wonder if we don't have an awful lot of fat around here. We've got spear holders that haven't had their tails kicked in years. You know, if we're going places with the Chief's new program for increased billings, we've got to get some new blood, like Hubble. Real hot guys. Young, aggressive. Fact is, I've been thinking of one young fellow who's over at McCann right now. He, uh... <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll uh, sum this up in a memo, and we'll wax our skis together some morning. Now, you better hurry and catch your train. Hello? Uh, Liz, I won't be home for dinner tonight. Something wrong, Fred? We've, um, we've got to wax our skis. What are you having, an office party? Party? If it happened to so nice a guy. Uh, I'll make the 837. Uh... Yes? Liz, I'm in Bridgeport. Bridgeport? I fell asleep on the 837. Now, look, Liz, don't be sore. I'll catch the 1003 back from Bridgeport, and I'll drive home at once. Hello. Liz, please, understand, will you? I got the 1003 from Bridgeport, honest. You fell asleep again. I slept all the way back to New York. I'm going to put up at a hotel for the night. Say goodnight to the kids for me. Oh, sure. They'll be up for school in a minute or two.
If Liz seems something less than the sweetheart of Sigma Chi, <clears throat> consider the case for her and her sisters of Exurbia. Before marriage, the exurbanite wife may have been a Smith graduate clad in the Smith uniform of cashmere sweater and single strand of pearls. She may have been a member of the Dirty Neck and Durndal set in Greenwich Village. She may have been an actress, a model, or a secretary. But whatever she has been, the exurban wife is trying desperately to reestablish a common bond with her husband. She has moved from a small, easily maintained city apartment near stores and people to the exurbs where she has eight rooms as a half mile distant from the nearest adult during the daylight hours and must drive five to ten miles to the nearest store. It is she who first realizes how tenuous, how limited his dream has become, even when he earns 25000 a year. How does it happen that they spend at least $2,000 more than they receive? Federal and New York state income taxes, $5,000 this year, please. New York state tax? We live in Connecticut. Well, your husband earns his salary in New York state, ma'am. Doesn't matter where you live. $5,000, please. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Just be glad New York City doesn't tax you commuters. They're considering it, you know. $2,500 a year, Miss Nostield. And Saturday's all day off. Sunday's all day off, and Thursday afternoon's off. Well, that's a lot of money, Hilda. The Fanny Moors, they offer me 3000 to come be their maid. Well, they have three children. We have only two. Oh, well, pay her, Liz. I'm not going to have my wife doing all the housework alone. <laughs> you got to keep up appearances, too. Yeah, Mr. Northfield. That is 2500 please. Thank you. Summer camp for me and Penny. 500 apiece, please. Dancing lessons, me and Penny... Two hundred apiece, please. Sailing lessons, me, one hundred. Tennis lessons, penny, one hundred and fifty. Total, fourteen hundred and fifty, please. Thank you, Ma. Tickets, please. Tickets, please. One year's commuting, one hundred and fifty dollars, sir. Thank you. Food, thirty-five hundred. Insurance, one thousand. Not enough. Clothes for wife, self, and family. Twenty-one hundred and fifty, including one sheared beaver. I hadn't had a new coat in two years, and I could ask for me. New York expenses, lunches, cigarettes, taxis, two thousand. Plumbing repairs, window repairs, roof repairs, heat, light, all the things our rent used to pay the landlord for doing. Christmas presents, upkeep on two cars, upkeep on grounds around the house. Hey, Mr. Northfield, you interested in them roses now? Roses? What roses? Well, first day you and the missus moved in, you was talking about coming home and working with your roses. You, know, you, you bought a trowel. How can I take care of roses with my front yard solid with crabgrass? How can I think about trowels when you're charging me 200 bucks after that last hurricane washed my driveway a quarter mile down the highway? Oh, all right. Fred, no. You can't spend any more. You've already spent a total of 27500 in a year. I don't know, Liz. I don't know. Maybe I'll get a vice presidency and a fat increase. Maybe your mother will die and leave us something. We're bound to break even sometime. Fred's plight is a deplorable, comical, tragic, incredible. It depends on the state of your own bank account and on your own morality. But in Exerbia, it is not an isolated case. As a general rule, whether he lives in Bucks, Rockland, Westchester, or Fairfield County, or on Long Island, the exurbanite consumer indomitably spends far more than he can earn. An exurban lawyer, himself a counselor on tax and investment matters to other exurbanites, estimates that around the time the high-spending exurbanite makes $60,000 a year, he is beginning to make ends meet. Until then, it's murder. Why doesn't he get out, quit, move to another place, give up the rat race? I'll tell you why. Anywhere else you live in these United States, it's a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. Where we live, you've got to keep ahead of the Joneses. It's we who set the styles, mold the fashions, dream the dreams for the rest of the country. What we do this week will be done a few months from now in Lake Forest, in Santa Barbara, and on Philadelphia's main line. What we decree and talk about in our magazines will be picked up and talked about in Gross Point and Sea Wickley and Beverly Hills. A month from now, a million matrons will be trying the eight-day wonder diet dreamed up by an ex-urbanite woman on the 815. An ex-urbanite woman with a natural size 10 waist. 
Several millions more will be quoting the editorial in life. Teenagers from coast to coast will try to look like the girl on the cover of Mademoiselle. The man in the Hathaway shirt. The man from Schweppes. The jingle that put the words, don't be half safe, to the tune of the vulgar boatman. They all were dreamed up on the 815 and its counterparts. There isn't an advertising man, a writer, an artist, an actor, photographer. There isn't anybody in the United States with ideas who wouldn't give his shirt to crack New York. And so it goes. These ex-urbanites come from all over the United States to New York with dreams of writing that great book, painting those great pictures, staging that great play. They find the world of the mass magazine of radio, television, advertising needs fresh creative talent for its own ends. The lure of the big money is irresistible. The money increases, the dream changes. Caught in the mesh of symbols which they purvey to the rest of the nation, the country home, the foreign car, the neatly tailored lawn, the power lawnmower, they become ex-urbanites seeking to escape from one rat race only to find themselves in another. A few give up and paint those pictures or write that novel. Some even return to Manhattan where the landlord fixes the leak on the roof. The rest remain, their dreams limited by money, train schedules, and sheer physical fatigue. Yet through all this, as you see him at home with his family, at the office, with his companions on the train, the ex-urbanite is witty, amusing, clever, entertaining. A man who is fun to be with and rewarding to talk to. Never vanquished, he now has a new secret dream of giving it all up to run a health resort for other broken-down ex-urbanites. To own a country hotel or an antique business. Or actually to farm his land and make it pay. Exurbia is full of these secret dreams. Meanwhile, he does the best he can at the difficult and exciting job of living. And the job he does is, under the circumstances, often remarkably good. You have been listening to The Exurbanites a special treatment of A.C. Spektorsky's report on New Yorkers in the communications field. Prepared by Charles S. Monroe, narrated by Eric Severide, and directed by Paul Roberts. The music was composed by Ben Ludlow and conducted by Alfredo Antonini. Featured in the cast were John Larkin as Fred, Jan Minor as Liz, and Joe Helgeson as Pruitt. This is Bob Height inviting you to listen to the CBS Radio Workshop next Friday for The Enormous Radio by John Cheever. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in New York by Paul Roberts. minutes of the latest CBS News. And remember, America listens most to the CBS Radio Workshop.